Introduction to Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. Introduction by George L. Ruffin. Just what this country has in store to benefit or to startle the world in the future, no tongue can tell. We know full well the wonderful things which have occurred or have been accomplished here in the past, but the still more wonderful things which we may well say will happen in the centuries of development which lie before us is vain conjecture. It lies in the domain of speculation. America will be the field for the demonstration of truths not now accepted, and the establishment of a new and higher civilization. Horace Walpole's prophecy will be verified when there shall be a Xenophon at New York and a Thucydides at Boston. Up to this time, the most remarkable contribution this country has given to the world is the author and the subject of this book, now being introduced to the public, Frederick Douglass. The contribution comes naturally and legitimately, and to some not unexpectedly, Nevertheless, it is altogether unique and must be regarded as truly remarkable. Our pantheon contains many that are illustrious and worthy, but Douglas is unlike all others. He is sui generis. For every other character we can bring forward, Europe can produce another equally as great. When we bring forward Douglas, he cannot be matched. Douglas was born a slave. He won his liberty. He is of Negro extraction, and consequently was despised and outraged. He has, by his own energy and force of character, commanded the respect of the nation. He was ignorant. He has, against law and by stealth, and entirely unaided, educated himself. He was poor. He has, by honest toil and industry, become rich and independent, so to speak. He, a chattel slave of a hated and cruelly wronged race, in the teeth of American prejudice, and in face of nearly every kind of hindrance and drawback, has come to be one of the foremost orators of the age, with a reputation established on both sides of the Atlantic, a writer of power and elegance of expression, a thinker whose views are potent in controlling and shaping public opinion, a high officer in the national government, a cultivated gentleman whose virtues as a husband, father, and citizen are the highest honor a man can have. Frederick Douglass stands upon a pedestal. He has reached this lofty height through years of toil and strife, but it has been the strife of moral ideas, strife in the battle for human rights. No bitter memories come from this strife. No feelings of remorse can rise to cast their gloomy shadows over his soul. Douglas has now reached and passed the meridian of life. His co-laborers in the strife have now nearly all passed away. Garrison is gone. Garrett Smith is gone. Giddings and Sumner have gone. Nearly all the abolitionists are gone to their reward. The culmination of his life work has been reached. The object dear to his heart, the emancipation of the slaves, has been accomplished through the blessings of God. He stands facing the goal, already reached by his co-laborers, with a halo of peace about him, and nothing but serenity and gratitude must fill his breast. To those who in the past, in antebellum days, in any degree shared with Douglas his hopes and feelings on the slavery question, this serenity of mind, this gratitude, can be understood and felt. All Americans, no matter what may have been their views on slavery, now that freedom has come and slavery is ended, must have a restful feeling, and be glad that the source of bitterness and trouble is removed. The man who is sorry because of the abolition of slavery has outlived his day and generation. He should have insisted upon being buried with the lost cause at Appomattox. We rejoice that Douglas has attained unto this exalted position, this pedestal. It has been honorably reached. It is a just recognition of talent and effort. It is another proof that success attends high and noble aim. With this example, the black boy as well as the white boy can take hope and courage in the race of life. Douglas's life has been a romance and a fragrance to the age. There has been just enough mystery about his origin and escape from slavery to throw a charm about them. 
the odd proceedings in the purchase of his freedom after his escape from slavery, his movements in connection with the John Brown raid at Harper's Ferry, and his subsequent flight across the ocean, are romantic as anything which took place among the crags and the cliffs, the Roderick Dews and Douglases of the Lady of the Lake. While the pure life he has led and his spotless character are sweet by contrast with the lives of mere politicians and time-serving statesmen, it is well to contemplate one like him, who has had hairbreadth escapes. It is inspiring to know that the day of self-sacrifice and self-development are not past. To say that his life has been eventful is hardly the word. From the time when he first saw the light on the Tuckahoe Plantation, up to the time he was called to fill a high official position, his life has been crowded with events which in some sense may be called miracles, and now, since his autobiography has come to be written, we must understand the hour of retrospect has come, for casting up and balancing accounts as to work done or left undone. It is more than forty years now that he has been before the world as a writer and speaker, busy, active, wonderful years to him, and we are called upon to pass judgment upon his labors. What can we say? Can he claim the well done good and faithful? The record shows this, and we must state it. Generally speaking, his life had been devoted to his race and the cause of his race. The freedom and elevation of his people has been his life work and it has been done well and faithfully. That is the record, and that is sufficient. No higher eulogium can be pronounced than that Longfellow says of the village blacksmith, Something attempted, something done, has earned a night's repose. Douglas found his people enslaved and oppressed. He has given the best years of his life to the improvement of their condition. And, now that he looks back upon his labors, may he not say he has attempted and done something? And may he not claim the repose which ought to come in the evening of a well-spent life? The first twenty-three years of Douglas's life were twenty-three years of slavery, obscurity, and degradation, yet doubtless in time to come these years will be regarded by the student of history the most interesting portion of his life. To those who in the future would know the inside history of American slavery, this part of his life will be specially instructive. Plantation life at Tuckahoe, as related by him, is not fiction. It is fact. It is not the historian's dissertation on slavery. It is slavery itself, the slave's life, acts, and thoughts, and the life, acts, and thoughts of those around him. It is Macaulay, I think, who says that a copy of a daily newspaper if there were such, published at Rome, would give more information and be of more value than any history we have. So, too, this photographic view of slave life, as given to us in the autobiography of an ex-slave, will give to the reader a clearer insight of the system of slavery than can be gained from the examination of general history. Colonel Lloyd's plantation, where Douglas belonged, was very much like other plantations of the South. Here was the great house and the cabins, the old aunties and patriarchal uncles, little piccaninnies and piccaninnies not so little, of every shade and complexion, from ebony black to whiteness of the master race, mules, overseers, and broken-down fences. Here was the negro doctor, learned in the science of roots and herbs, also the black conjurer with his divination. Here was the slave-breeding and slave-selling, whipping, torturing and beating to death. All this came under the observation of Douglas and is a part of the education he received while under the yoke of bondage. He was there in the midst of this confusion, ignorance, and brutality. Little did the overseer on this plantation think that he had in his gang a man of superior order and undaunted spirit, whose mind, far above the minds of the groveling creatures about him, was at that very time plotting schemes for his liberty. Nor did the thought ever enter the mind of Colonel Lloyd, the rich slaveholder, that he had upon his estate one who was destined to assail the system of slavery with more power and effect than any other person. Douglas's fame will rest mainly, no doubt, upon his oratory. His powers in this direction are very great, and in some respects unparalleled by our living speakers. His oratory is his own and apparently formed after the model of no single person. 
It is not after the Edmund Burke style, which has been so closely followed by Everett, Sumner, and others, and which has resulted in giving us splendid and highly embellished essays rather than natural and not overwrought speeches. If his oratory must be classified, it should be placed somewhere between the Fox and Henry Clay schools. Like Clay, Douglass's greatest effect is upon his immediate hearers, those who see him and feel his presence, and, like Clay, a good part of his oratorical fame will be tradition. The most striking feature of Douglass's oratory is his fire, not the quick and flashy kind, but the steady and intense kind. Years ago, on the anti-slavery platform, in some sudden and unbidden outburst of passion and indignation, he has been known to awe-inspire his listeners as though Etna were there. If oratory consists of the power to move men by spoken words, Douglas is a complete orator. He can make men laugh or cry at his will. He has power of statement, logic, withering denunciation, pathos, humor, and inimitable wit. Daniel Webster, with his immense intellectuality, had no humor, not a particle. It does not appear that he could even see the point of a joke. Douglas is brimful of humor, at times of the driest kind. It is of a quiet kind. You can see it coming a long way off in a peculiar twitch of his mouth. It increases and broadens gradually until it becomes irresistible and all-pervading with his audience. Douglas's rank as a writer is high, and justly so. His writings, if anything, are more meritorious than his speaking. For many years he was the editor of newspapers, doing all of the editorial work. He has contributed largely to magazines. He is a forcible and thoughtful writer. His style is pure and graceful, and he has great felicity of expression. His written productions, in Finnish, compare favorably with the written productions of our most cultivated writers. His style comes partly, no doubt, from his long and constant practice, but the true source is his clear mind, which is well stored by a close acquaintance with the best authors. His range of reading has been wide and extensive. He has been a hard student. In every sense of the word, he is a self-made man. By dint of hard study he has educated himself, and today it may be said he has a well-trained intellect. He has surmounted the disadvantage of not having a university education by application and well-directed effort. He seems to have realized the fact that to one who is anxious to become educated and is really in earnest, it is not positively necessary to go to college, and that information may be had outside of college walks. Books may be obtained and read elsewhere. They are not chained to desks in college libraries, as they were in early times at Oxford. Professors' lectures may be bought already printed. Learned doctors may be listened to in the Lyceum, and the printing press has made it easy and cheap to get information on every subject and topic that is discussed and taught in the university. Douglas never made the mistake, a common one, of considering that his education was finished. He has continued to study. He studies now, and is a growing man, and at this present moment he is a stronger man intellectually than ever before. Soon after Douglas's escape from Maryland to the northern states, he commenced his public career. It was at New Bedford, as a local Methodist preacher, and by taking part in small public meetings held by colored people, wherein anti-slavery and other matters were discussed. There he laid the foundation of the splendid career which is now about drawing to a close. In these meetings, Douglas gave evidence that he possessed uncommon powers, and it was plainly to be seen that he needed only a field and opportunity to display them. That field and opportunity soon came, as it always does to possessors of genius. He became a member and agent of the American Anti-Slavery Society then commenced his great crusade against slavery in behalf of his oppressed brethren at the South. He waged violent and unceasing war against slavery. He went through every town and hamlet in the free states, raising his voice against the iniquitous system. Just escaped from the prison house himself, to tear down the walls of the same and to let the oppressed go free was the mission which engaged the powers of his soul and body. North, east, and west, all through the land went this escaped slave, 
delivering his warning message against the doomed cities of the South. The ocean did not stop nor hinder him. Across the Atlantic he went, through England, Ireland, and Scotland. Wherever people could be found to listen to his story, he pleaded the cause of his enslaved and downtrodden brethren with vehemence and great power. From 1840 to 1861, the time of the commencement of the Civil War, which extirpated slavery in this country, Douglas was continually speaking on the platform, writing for his newspaper and for magazines, or working in conventions for the abolition of slavery. The life and work of Douglas has been a complete vindication of the colored people in this respect. It has refuted and overthrown the position taken by some writers that colored people were deficient in mental qualifications and were incapable of attaining high intellectual position. We may reasonably expect to hear no more of this now. The argument is exploded. Douglas has settled the fact the right way, and it is something to settle a fact. That Douglas is a brave man there can be little doubt. He has physical as well as moral courage. His encounter with the overseer of the Eastern Shore Plantation attests his pluck. There the odds were against him. Everything was against him. There the unwritten rule of law was that the Negro who dared to strike a white man must be killed. But Douglas fought the overseer and whipped him. His plotting with other slaves to escape, writing and giving them passes, and the unequal and desperate fight maintained by him in the Baltimore shipyard, where law and public sentiment were against him, also showed that he has courage. But since the day of his slavery, while living here at the North, many instances have happened which show very plainly that he is a man of courage and determination. If he had not been, he would have long since succumbed to the brutality and violence of the low and mean-spirited people found in the free states. Up to a very recent date, it has been deemed quite safe, even here in the North, to insult and impose on inoffensive colored people, to elbow a colored man from the sidewalk, to jeer at him and apply vile epithets to him. In some localities, this has been the rule and not the exception and to put him out of public conveyances and public places by force was of common occurrence. It made little difference that the colored man was decent, civil, and respectably clad, and had paid his fare. If the proprietor of the place or his patrons took the notion that the presence of the colored man was an affront to their dignity, or inconsistent with their notions of self-respect, out he must go nor must he stand upon the order of his going, but go at once. It was against this feeling that Douglas had to contend. He met it often. He was a prominent colored man, traveling from place to place. A good part of the time he was in strange cities, stopping at strange taverns, that is, when he was allowed to stop. Time and again has he been refused accommodation in hotels. Time and again has he been in a strange place, with nowhere to lay his head until some kind anti-slavery person would come forward and give him shelter. The writer of this remembers well, because he was present and saw the transaction, the John Brown meeting in Tremont Temple in 1860, when a violent mob, composed of the rough element from the slums of the city, led and encouraged by bankers and brokers, came into the hall to break up the meeting. Douglas was presiding. The mob was armed. The police were powerless. The mayor could not or would not do anything. On came the mob, surging through the aisles, over benches and upon the platform. The women in the audience became alarmed and fled. The hirelings were prepared to do anything. They had the power and could with impunity. Douglas sat upon the platform with a few chosen spirits, cool and undaunted. The mob had got about and around him. He did not heed their howling, nor was he moved by their threats. It was not until their leader, a rich banker with his followers, had mounted the platform and wrenched the chair from under him that he was dispossessed. By main force and personal violence, Douglas resisting all the time, they removed him from the platform. It affords me great pleasure to introduce to the public this book, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. I am glad of the opportunity to present a work which tells the story of the rise and progress of our most celebrated colored man. To the names of Toussaint L'Ouverture and Alexander Dumas, 
is to be added that of Frederick Douglass. We point with pride to this trio of illustrious names. I bid my fellow countrymen take new hope and courage. The near future will bring us other men of worth and genius, and our list of illustrious names will become lengthened. Until that time, the duty is to work and wait. Respectfully, George L. Ruffin End of Introduction Part 1, Chapter 1 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley Part 1, Life as a Slave Chapter 1, Author's Birth in Talbot County, Eastern Shore, State of Maryland, near Easton, the county town, there is a small district of country, thinly populated and remarkable for nothing that I know of more than for the worn-out, sandy, desert-like appearance of its soil, the general dilapidation of its farms and fences, the indigent and spiritless character of its inhabitants, and the prevalence of ague and fever. It was in this dull, flat, and unthrifty district or neighborhood bordered by the Choptank River, among the laziest and muddiest of streams, surrounded by a white population of the lowest order, indolent and drunken to a proverb, and among slaves who, in point of ignorance and indolence, were fully in accord with their surroundings, that I, without any fault of my own, was born and spent the first years of my childhood. The reader must not expect me to say much of my family. Genealogical trees did not flourish among slaves. A person of some consequence in civilized society, sometimes designated as father, was literally unknown to slave law and to slave practice. I never met with a slave in that part of the country who could tell me with any certainty how old he was. Few at that time knew anything of the months of the year or the days of the month. They measured the ages of their children by springtime, wintertime, harvest time, planting time, and the like. Masters allowed no questions concerning their ages to be put to them by slaves. Such questions were regarded by the masters as evidence of an impudent curiosity. From certain events, however, the dates of which I have since learned, I suppose myself to have been born in February 1817. My first experience of life, as I now remember it, and I remember it but hazily, began in the family of my grandmother and grandfather, Betsy and Isaac Bailey. They were considered old settlers in the neighborhood, and from certain circumstances I infer that my grandmother especially was held in high esteem, far higher than was the lot of most colored persons in that region. She was a good nurse, and a capable hand at making nets used for catching shad and herring, and was, withal, somewhat famous as a fisherwoman. I have known her to be in the water waist-deep for hours, seine hauling. She was a gardener as well as a fisherwoman, and remarkable for her success in keeping her seedling sweet potatoes through the months of winter, and easily got the reputation of being born to good luck. In planting time, Grandmother Betsy was sent for in all directions simply to place the seedling potatoes in the hills or drills, for superstition had it that her touch was needed to make them grow. This reputation was full of advantage to her and her grandchildren, for a good crop, after her planting for the neighbors, brought her a share of the harvest. Whether because she was too old for field service, or because she had so faithfully discharged the duties of her station in early life, I know not, but she enjoyed the high privilege of living in a cabin separate from the quarters, having imposed upon her only the charge of the young children and the burden of her own support. She esteemed it great good fortune to live so, and took much comfort in having the children. The practice of separating mothers from their children and hiring them out at distances too great to admit of their meeting, save at long intervals, was a marked feature of the cruelty and barbarity of the slave system. But it was in harmony with the grand aim of that system, which always and everywhere sought to reduce man to the level with the brute. It had no interest in recognizing or preserving any of the ties that bind families together or to their homes. My grandmother's five daughters were hired out in this way, and my only recollections of my own mother are of a few hasty visits made in the night on foot, after the daily tasks were over. 
and when she was under the necessity of returning in time to respond to the driver's call to the field in the early morning. These little glimpses of my mother, obtained under such circumstances and against such odds, meager as they were, are ineffaceably stamped upon my memory. She was tall and finely proportioned, of dark, glossy complexion, with regular features, and amongst the slaves was remarkably sedate and dignified. There is, in Pritchard's Natural History of Man, the head of a figure, on page 157, the features of which so resemble my mother that I often recur to it with something of the feelings which I suppose others experience when looking upon the likenesses of their own dear departed ones. Of my father I know nothing. Slavery had no recognition of fathers, as none of families. That the mother was a slave was enough for its deadly purpose. By its law, the child followed the condition of its mother. The father might be a free man and the child a slave. The father might be a white man, glorying in the purity of his Anglo-Saxon blood, and the child ranked with the blackest slaves. Father he might be, and not be husband, and could sell his own child without incurring reproach, if in its veins coursed one drop of African blood. End of chapter 1「Part One, Chapter Two of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Two: Removal from Grandmothers. Living thus with my grandmother, whose kindness and love stood in place of my mother's, it was some time before I knew myself to be a slave. I knew many other things before I knew that. Her little cabin had to me the attractions of a palace. Its fence-railed floor, which was equally floor and bedstead, upstairs, and its clay floor downstairs, its dirt and straw chimney, and windowless sides, and that most curious piece of workmanship, the ladder stairway, and the hole so strangely dug in front of the fireplace, beneath which Grandmamma placed her sweet potatoes to keep them from frost in winter, were full of interest to my childish observation. The squirrels, as they skipped the fences, climbed the trees, or gathered their nuts, were an unceasing delight to me. There, too, right at the side of the hut, stood the old well, with its stately and skyward pointing beam, so aptly placed between the limbs of what had once been a tree, and so nicely balanced, that I could move it up and down with only one hand, and could get a drink myself without calling for help. Nor were these all the attractions of the place. At a little distance stood Mr. Lee's mill, where the people came in large numbers to get their corn ground. I can never tell the many things thought and felt as I sat on the bank and watched that mill, and the turning of its ponderous wheel. The mill pond, too, had its charms, and with my pin hook and thread line I could get amusing nibbles if I could catch no fish. It was not long, however, before I began to learn the sad fact that this house of my childhood belonged not to my dear old grandmother, but to some one I had never seen, and who lived a great distance off. I learned, too, the sadder fact that not only the home and lot, but that grandmother herself and all the little children around her belonged to a mysterious personage called by grandmother with every mark of reverence, Old Master. Thus early did clouds and shadows begin to fall upon my path. I learned that this old master, whose name seemed ever to be mentioned with fear and shuddering, only allowed the little children to live with grandmother for a limited time, and that as soon as they were big enough they were promptly taken away to live with the said old master. These were distressing revelations indeed. My grandmother was all the world to me, and the thought of being separated from her was a most unwelcome suggestion to my affections and hopes. This mysterious old master was really a man of some consequence. He owned several farms in Tuckahoe, was the chief clerk and butler on the home plantation of Colonel Lloyd, had overseers as well as slaves on his own farms, and gave directions to the overseers on the farms owned by Colonel Lloyd. Captain Aaron Anthony, for such is the name and title of my old master, lived on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, which was situated on the Wye River, and which was one of the largest, most fertile, and best appointed in the state. About this plantation and this old master I was most eager to know everything which could be known. 
and unhappily for me all the information I could get concerning him increased my dread of being separated from my grandmother and grandfather. I wished that it was possible for me to remain small all my life, knowing that the sooner I grew large, the shorter would be my time to remain with them. Everything about the cabin became doubly dear, and I was sure that there could be no other spot on earth equal to it. But the time came when I must go, and my grandmother, knowing my fears and in pity for them, kindly kept me ignorant of the dreaded moment up to the morning, a beautiful summer morning, when we were to start. And indeed, during the whole journey, which, child as I was, I remember as well as if it were yesterday, she kept the unwelcome truth hidden from me. The distance from Tuckahoe to Colonel Lloyd's, where my old master lived, was full twelve miles, and the walk was quite a severe test of the endurance of my young legs. The journey would have proved too severe for me, but that my dear old grandmother, blessings on her memory, afforded occasional relief by toting me on her shoulder. Advanced in years as she was, as was evident from the more than one gray hair which peeped from between the ample and graceful folds of her newly and smoothly ironed bandana turban, grandmother was yet a woman of power and spirit. She was remarkably straight in figure and elastic and muscular in movement. I seemed hardly to be a burden to her. She would have toted me farther, but I felt myself too much of a man to allow it. Yet while I walked I was not independent of her. She often found me holding her skirts lest something should come out of the woods and eat me up. Several old logs and stumps imposed upon me, and got themselves taken for enormous animals. I could plainly see their legs, eyes, ears, and teeth, till I got close enough to see that the eyes were knots, washed white with rain, and the legs were broken limbs, and the ears and teeth only such because of the point from which they were seen. As the day advanced, the heat increased, and it was not until the afternoon that we reached the much-dreaded end of the journey. Here I found myself in the midst of a group of children of all sizes and of many colors, black, brown, copper-colored, and nearly white. I had not before seen so many children. As a newcomer I was an object of special interest. After laughing and yelling around me and playing all sorts of wild tricks, they asked me to go out and play with them. This I refused to do. Grandmama looked sad, and I could not help feeling that our being there boded no good to me. She was soon to lose another object of affection, as she had lost many before. Affectionately patting me on the head, she told me to be a good boy and go out to play with the children. They are kin to you, she said. Go and play with them. She pointed out to me my brother Perry and my sisters Sarah and Eliza. I had never seen them before, and though I had sometimes heard of them and felt a curious interest in them, I really did not understand what they were to me or I to them. Brothers and sisters we were by blood, but slavery had made us strangers. They were already initiated into the mysteries of old master's domicile, and they seemed to look upon me with a certain degree of compassion. I really wanted to play with them, but they were strangers to me, and I was full of fear that my grandmother might leave for home without taking me with her. Entreated to do so, however, and that too by my dear grandmother, I went to the back of the house to play with them and the other children. Play, however, I did not, but stood with my back against the wall, witnessing the playing of the others. At last, while standing there, one of the children, who had been in the kitchen, ran up to me in a sort of roguish glee, exclaiming, Fed! Fed! Grandmama gone! I could not believe it. Yet, fearing the worst, I ran into the kitchen to see for myself, and, lo, she was indeed gone and was now far away, and clean out of sight. I need not tell all that happened now. Almost heartbroken at the discovery, I fell upon the ground and wept a boy's bitter tears, refusing to be comforted. My brother gave me peaches and pears to quiet me, but I promptly threw them on the ground. I had never been deceived before, and something of resentment mingled with my grief at parting with my grandmother. It was now late in the afternoon. The day had been an exciting and wearisome one, and I know not where, but I suppose I sobbed myself to sleep, and its balm was never more welcome to any wounded soul than to mine. The reader may be surprised that I relate so minutely an incident apparently so trivial, and which must have occurred when I was less than seven years old. 
but as I wish to give a faithful history of my experience in slavery, I cannot withhold a circumstance which at the time affected me so deeply, and which I still remember so vividly. Besides, this was my first introduction to the realities of the slave system. End of chapter 2 Part 1, Chapter 3 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 3, Troubles of Childhood. Once established on the home plantation of Colonel Lloyd, I was with the children there, left to the tender mercies of Aunt Katie, a slave woman, who was to my master what he was to Colonel Lloyd. Disposing of us in classes or sizes, he left to Aunt Katie all the minor details concerning our management. She was a woman who never allowed herself to act greatly within the limits of delegated power, no matter how broad that authority might be. Ambitious of old master's favor, ill-tempered and cruel by nature, she found in her present position an ample field for the exercise of her ill-omened qualities. She had a strong hold upon old master, for she was a first-rate cook and very industrious. She was therefore greatly favored by him, and as one mark of his favor she was the only mother who was permitted to retain her children around her, and even to these, her own children, she was often fiendish in her brutality. Cruel, however, as she sometimes was to her own children, she was not destitute of maternal feeling, and in her instinct to satisfy their demands for food, she was often guilty of starving me and the other children. Want of food was my chief trouble during my first summer here. Captain Anthony, instead of allowing a given quantity of food to each slave, committed the allowance for all to Aunt Katie to be divided by her after cooking amongst us. The allowance consisted of coarse cornmeal, not very abundant, and which, by passing through Aunt Katie's hands, became more slender still for some of us. I have often been so pinched with hunger as to dispute with old Nep, the dog, for the crumbs which fell from the kitchen table. Many times have I followed with eager step the waiting girl when she shook the tablecloth to get the crumbs and small bones flung out for the dogs and cats. It was a great thing to have the privilege of dipping a piece of bread into the water in which meat had been boiled, and the skin taken from the rusty bacon was a positive luxury. With this description of the domestic arrangements of my new home, I may here recount a circumstance which is deeply impressed on my memory, as affording a bright gleam of a slave mother's love, and the earnestness of a mother's care. I had offended Aunt Katie. I do not remember in what way, for my offenses were numerous in that quarter, greatly depending upon her moods as to their heinousness, and she had adopted her usual mode of punishing me, namely, making me go all day without food. For the first hour or two after dinner time, I succeeded pretty well in keeping up my spirits, but as the day wore away, I found it quite impossible to do so any longer. Sundown came, but no bread, and in its stead came the threat from Aunt Katie, with a scowl well suited to its terrible import, that she would starve the life out of me. Brandishing her knife, she chopped off the heavy slices of bread for the other children, and put the loaf away muttering all the while her savage designs upon myself. Against this disappointment, for I was expecting that her heart would relent at last, I made an extra effort to maintain my dignity. But when I saw the other children around me with satisfied faces, I could stand it no longer. I went out behind the kitchen wall and cried like a fine fellow. When wearied with this, I returned to the kitchen, sat by the fire and brooded over my hard lot. I was too hungry to sleep. While I sat in the corner, I caught sight of an ear of Indian corn upon an upper shelf. I watched my chance and got it. Then shelling off a few grains, I put it back again. These grains I quickly put into the hot ashes to roast. I did this at the risk of getting a brutal thumping, for Aunt Katie could beat as well as starve me. My corn was not long in roasting, and I eagerly pulled it from the ashes, and placed it upon a stool in a clever little pile. I began to help myself when who but my own dear mother should come in. The scene which followed is beyond my power to describe. The friendless and hungry boy, in his extremest need, found himself in the strong, protecting arms of his mother. 
I have before spoken of my mother's dignified and impressive manner. I shall never forget the indescribable expression of her countenance when I told her that Aunt Katie had said she would starve the life out of me. There was deep and tender pity in her glance at me, and at the same time a fiery indignation at Aunt Katie, and while she took the corn from me and gave in its stead a large ginger cake, she read Aunt Katie a lecture which was never forgotten. That night I learned, as I had never learned before, that I was not only a child, but somebody's child. I was grander upon my mother's knee than a king upon his throne. But my triumph was short. I dropped off to sleep and waked in the morning to find my mother gone and myself at the mercy again of the virago in my master's kitchen, whose fiery wrath was my constant dread. My mother had walked twelve miles to see me and had the same distance to travel over again before the morning sunrise. I do not remember ever seeing her again. Her death soon ended the little communication that had existed between us, and with it, I believe, a life full of weariness and heartfelt sorrow. To me it has ever been a grief that I knew my mother so little, and have so few of her words treasured in my remembrance. I have since learned that she was the only one of all the colored people of Tuckahoe who could read. How she acquired this knowledge I know not for Tuckahoe was the last place in the world where she would have been likely to find facilities for learning. I can therefore fondly and proudly ascribe to her an earnest love of knowledge. That in any slave state a field hand should learn to read is remarkable, but the achievement of my mother, considering the place and circumstances, was very extraordinary. In view of this fact, I am happy to attribute any love of letters I may have, not to my presumed Anglo-Saxon paternity, but to the native genius of my sable, unprotected, and uncultivated mother, a woman who belonged to a race whose mental endowments are still disparaged and despised. End of chapter 3 Part 1, Chapter 4 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 4, A General Survey of the Slave Plantation It was generally supposed that slavery in the state of Maryland existed in its mildest form, and that it was totally divested of those harsh and terrible peculiarities which characterized the slave system in the southern and southwestern states of the American Union. The ground of this opinion was the contiguity of the free states, and the influence of their moral, religious, and humane sentiments. Public opinion was, indeed, a measurable restraint upon the cruelty and barbarity of masters, overseers, and slave drivers, whenever and wherever it could reach them. But there were certain secluded and out-of-the-way places, even in the state of Maryland, fifty years ago, seldom visited by a single ray of healthy public sentiment, where slavery, wrapped in its own congenial darkness, could and did develop all its malign and shocking characteristics where it could be indecent without shame, cruel without shuddering, and murderous without apprehension or fear of exposure or punishment. Just such a secluded, dark, and out-of-the-way place was the home plantation of Colonel Edward Lloyd in Talbot County, eastern shore of Maryland. It was far away from all the great thoroughfares of travel and commerce, and proximate to no town or village. There was neither schoolhouse nor townhouse in its neighborhood, the schoolhouse was unnecessary, for there were no children to go to school. The children and grandchildren of Colonel Lloyd were taught in the house by a private tutor, a Mr. Page from Greenfield, Massachusetts, a tall, gaunt sapling of a man, remarkably dignified, thoughtful, and reticent, and who did not speak a dozen words to a slave in a whole year. The overseer's children went off somewhere in the state to school, and therefore could bring no foreign or dangerous influence from abroad to embarrass the natural operation of the slave system of the place. Here, not even the commonest mechanics, from whom there might have been an occasional outburst of honest and telling indignation at cruelty and wrong on other plantations, were white men. Its whole public was made up of and divided into three classes, slaveholders, slaves, and overseers. Its blacksmiths, wheelwrights, shoemakers, weavers, and coopers were slaves. Not even commerce, selfish and indifferent to moral considerations as it usually is, 
was permitted within its secluded precincts. Whether with a view of guarding against the escape of its secrets I know not, but it is a fact that every leaf and grain of the products of this plantation and those of the neighboring farms belonging to Colonel Lloyd were transported to Baltimore in his own vessels, every man and boy on board of which, except the captain, were owned by him as his property. In return, everything brought to the plantation came through the same channel. To make this isolation more apparent, it may be stated that the estates adjoining Colonel Lloyd's were owned and occupied by friends of his, who were as deeply interested as himself in maintaining the slave system in all its rigor. These were the Tilgmans, the Goldboroughs, the Lockermans, the Pacas, the Skinners, Gibsons, and others of lesser affluence and standing. Public opinion in such a quarter, the reader must see, was not likely to be very efficient in protecting the slave from cruelty. To be a restraint upon abuses of this nature, opinion must emanate from humane and virtuous communities, and to no such opinion or influence was Colonel Lloyd's plantation exposed. It was a little nation by itself, having its own language, its own rules, regulations, and customs. The troubles and controversies arising here were not settled by the civil power of the state. The overseer was the important dignitary. He was generally accuser, judge, jury, advocate, and executioner. The criminal was always dumb, and no slave was allowed to testify other than against his brother's slave. There were, of course, no conflicting rights of property, for all the people were the property of one man, and they could themselves own no property. Religion and politics were largely excluded. One class of the population was too high to be reached by the common creature, and the other class was too low in condition and ignorance to be much cared for by religious teachers, and yet some religious ideas did enter this dark corner. This, however, is not the only view which the place presented. Though civilization was in many respects shut out, nature could not be. Though separated from the rest of the world, though public opinion, as I have said, could seldom penetrate its dark domain, though the whole place was stamped with its own peculiar iron-like individuality, and though crimes, high-handed and atrocious, could be committed there with strange and shocking impunity, it was, to outward seeming, a most strikingly interesting place, full of life, activity, and spirit, and presenting a very favorable contrast to the indolent monotony and languor of Tuckahoe. It resembled in some respects descriptions I have since read of the old baronial domains of Europe. Keen as was my regret, and great as was my sorrow at leaving my old home, I was not long in adapting myself to this, my new one. A man's troubles are always half disposed of when he finds endurance the only alternative. I found myself here, there was no getting away, and naught remained for me but to make the best of it. Here were plenty of children to play with, and plenty of pleasant resorts for boys of my age and older. The little tendrils of affection, so rudely broken from the darling objects in and around my grandmother's home, gradually began to extend and twine themselves around the new surroundings. Here, for the first time, I saw a large windmill, with its wide sweeping white wings, a commanding object to a child's eye. This was situated on what was called Long Point a tract of land dividing Miles River from the Wye. I spent many hours here watching the wings of this wondrous mill. In the river, or what was called the Swash, at a short distance from the shore, quietly lying at anchor, with her small rowboat dancing at her stern, was a large sloop, the Sally Lloyd, called by that name in honor of the favorite daughter of the colonel. These two objects, the sloop and the mill, awakened, as I remember, thoughts, ideas, and wondering. Then here were a great many houses, human habitations full of the mysteries of life at every stage of it. There was the little red house up the road, occupied by Mr. Severe, the overseer. A little nearer to my old master's stood a long, low, rough building, literally alive with slaves of all ages, sexes, conditions, sizes, and colors. This was called the Long Quarter. Perched upon a hill east of our house, was a tall, dilapidated old brick building, the architectural dimensions of which proclaimed its creation for a different purpose, now occupied by slaves, in a similar manner to the long quarters. Besides these, 
There were numerous other slave houses and huts scattered around in the neighborhood, every nook and corner of which were completely occupied. Old Master's House, a long brick building, plain but substantial, was centrally located and was an independent establishment. Besides these houses there were barns, stables, storehouses, tobacco houses, blacksmith shops, wheelwright shops, cooper shops, but above all there stood the grandest building my young eyes had ever beheld, called by everyone on the plantation the Great House. This was occupied by Colonel Lloyd and his family. It was surrounded by numerous and various shaped outbuildings. There were kitchens, wash houses, dairies, summer houses, green houses, hen houses, turkey houses, pigeon houses, and arbors of many sizes and devices, all neatly painted or whitewashed, interspersed with grand old trees, ornamental and primitive, which afforded delightful shade in summer, and imparted to the scene a high degree of stately beauty. The great house itself was a large white wooden building, with wings on three sides of it, in front extending the entire length of the building, and supported by a long range of columns, was a broad portico, which gave to the colonel's home an air of great dignity and grandeur. It was a treat to my young and gradually opening mind to behold this elaborate exhibition of wealth, power, and beauty. The carriage entrance to the house was by a large gate, more than a quarter of a mile distant. The intermediate space was a beautiful lawn, very neatly kept and tended. It was dotted thickly over with trees and flowers. The road or lane from the gate to the great house was richly paved with white pebbles from the beach and in its course formed a complete circle around the lawn. Outside this select enclosure were parks, as about the residences of the English nobility, where rabbits, deer, and other wild game might be seen peering and playing about, with none to molest them or make them afraid. The tops of the stately poplars were often covered with red-winged blackbirds, making all nature vocal with the joyous life and beauty of their wild, warbling notes. These all belonged to me as well as to Colonel Edward Lloyd, and whether they did or not, I greatly enjoyed them. Not far from the great house were the stately mansions of the dead Lloyds, a place of somber aspect. Vast tombs embowered beneath the weeping willow and fir tree told of the generations of the family, as well as of their wealth. Superstition was rife among the slaves about this family burying ground. Strange sights had been seen there by some of the older slaves, and I was often compelled to hear stories of shrouded ghosts riding on great black horses, and of walls of fire which had been seen to fly there at midnight, and of startling and dreadful sounds that had been repeatedly heard. Slaves knew enough of the orthodox theology of the time to consign all bad slaveholders to hell, and they often fancied such persons wishing themselves back again to wield the lash. Tales of sights and sounds strange and terrible connected with the huge black tombs were a great security to the grounds about them, for few of the slaves had the courage to approach them during the daytime. It was a dark, gloomy, and forbidding place, and it was difficult to feel that the spirits of the sleeping dust there deposited reigned with the blessed in the realms of eternal peace. At Lloyd's was transacted the business of twenty or thirty different farms, which, with the slaves upon them, numbering in all not less than a thousand, all belonged to Colonel Lloyd. Each farm was under the management of an overseer, whose word was law. Mr. Lloyd was at this time very rich. His slaves alone, numbering, as I have said, not less than a thousand, were an immense fortune, and though scarcely a month passed without the sale to the Georgia traders of one or more lots, there was no apparent diminution in the number of his human stock. The selling of any to the state of Georgia was a sore and mournful event to those left behind, as well as to the victims themselves. The reader has already been informed of the handicrafts carried on here by the slaves. Uncle Tony was the blacksmith, Uncle Harry the cartwright, and Uncle Abel was the shoemaker, and these had assistance in their several departments. These mechanics were called uncles by all the younger slaves, not because they really sustained that relationship to any, but according to plantation etiquette, as a mark of respect due from the younger to the older slaves. Strange and even ridiculous as it may seem, among a people so uncultivated and with so many stern trials to look in the face, 
there is not to be found among any people a more rigid enforcement of the law of respect to elders than is maintained among them. I set this down as partly constitutional with the colored race and partly conventional. There is no better material in the world for making a gentleman than is furnished in the African. Among other slave notabilities, I found here one called by everybody, white and colored, Uncle Isaac Copper. It was seldom that a slave, however venerable, was honored with a surname in Maryland, and so completely has the South shaped the manners of the North in this respect, that their right to such honor is tardily admitted even now. It goes sadly against the grain to address and treat a Negro as one would address and treat a white man. But once in a while, even in a slave state, a Negro had a surname fastened to him by common consent. This was the case with Uncle Isaac Copper. When the uncle was dropped, he was called Dr. Copper. He was both our doctor of medicine and our doctor of divinity. Where he took his degree I am unable to say, but he was too well established in his profession to permit question as to his native skill or attainments. One qualification he certainly had. He was a confirmed cripple, wholly unable to work, and was worth nothing for sale in the market. Though lame, he was no sluggard. He made his crutches do him good service, and was always on the alert looking up the sick, and such as were supposed to need his aid and counsel. His remedial prescriptions embraced four articles, for diseases of the body, Epsom salts and castor oil, for those of the soul, the Lord's Prayer, and a few stout hickory switches. I was, with twenty or thirty other children, early sent to Dr. Isaac Copper to learn the Lord's Prayer. The old man was seated on a huge three-legged oaken stool, armed with several large hickory switches, and from the point where he sat, lame as he was, he could reach every boy in the room. After our standing a while to learn what was expected of us, he commanded us to kneel down. This done, he told us to say everything he said. Our Father, this we repeated after him with promptness and uniformity, who art in heaven, was less promptly and uniformly repeated, and the old gentleman paused in the prayer to give us a short lecture and to use his switches on our backs. Everybody in the South seemed to want the privilege of whipping somebody else. Uncle Isaac, though a good old man, shared the common passion of his time and country. I cannot say I was much edified by attendance upon his ministry. There was in my mind, even at that time, something a little inconsistent and laughable in the blending of prayer with punishment. I was not long in my new home before I found that the dread I had conceived of Captain Anthony was in a measure groundless. Instead of leaping out from some hiding place and destroying me, he hardly seemed to notice my presence. He probably thought as little of my arrival there as of an additional pig to his stock. He was the chief agent of his employer. The overseers of all the farms composing the Lloyd estate were in some sort under him. The colonel himself seldom addressed an overseer, or allowed himself to be addressed by one. To Captain Anthony, therefore, was committed the headship of all the farms. He carried the keys of all the storehouses, weighed and measured the allowances of each slave at the end of each month, superintended the storing of all goods brought to the storehouse, dealt out the raw material to the different handicraftsmen, shipped the grain, tobacco, and all other saleable produce of the numerous farms to Baltimore, and had a general oversight of all the workshops of the place. In addition to all this, he was frequently called abroad to Easton, and elsewhere in the discharge of his numerous duties as chief agent of the estate. The family of Captain Anthony consisted of two sons, Andrew and Richard, and his daughter Lucretia, and her newly married husband, Captain Thomas Auld. In the kitchen were Aunt Katie, Aunt Esther, and ten or a dozen children, most of them older than myself. Captain Anthony was not considered a rich slaveholder, though he was pretty well off in the world. He owned about thirty slaves and three farms in the Tuckahoe district. The more valuable part of his property was in slaves, of whom he sold one every year, which brought him in seven or eight hundred dollars, besides his yearly salary and other revenue from his lands. I have been often asked, during the earlier part of my free life at the North, how I happened to have so little of the slave accent in my speech. The mystery is in some measure explained by my association with Daniel Lloyd, the youngest son of Colonel Edward Lloyd. 
The law of compensation holds here as well as elsewhere. While this lad could not associate with ignorance without sharing its shade, he could not give his black playmates his company without giving them his superior intelligence as well. Without knowing this, or caring about it at the time, I, for some cause or other, was attracted to him, and was much his companion. I had little to do with the older brothers of Daniel, Edward and Murray. They were grown up and were fine-looking men. Edward was especially esteemed by the slave children, and by me among the rest, not that he ever said anything to us, or for us, which could be called particularly kind. It was enough for us that he never looked or acted scornfully toward us. The idea of rank and station was rigidly maintained on this estate. The family of Captain Anthony never visited the great house, and the Lloyds never came to our house. Equal non-intercourse was observed between Captain Anthony's family and the family of Mr. Severe, the overseer. Such, kind readers, was the community, and such the place in which my earliest and most lasting impressions of the workings of slavery were received, of which impressions you will learn more in the after-coming chapters of this book. End of chapter 4「Part One, Chapter Five of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Five: A Slaveholder's Character. Although my old master, Captain Anthony, gave me at the first of my coming to him for my grandmother's very little attention, and although that little was of a remarkably mild and gentle description, a few months only were sufficient to convince me that mildness and gentleness were not the prevailing or governing traits of his character. These excellent qualities were displayed only occasionally. He could, when it suited him, appear to be literally insensible to the claims of humanity. He could not only be deaf to the appeals of the helpless against the aggressor, but he could himself commit outrages deep, dark, and nameless. He was not by nature worse than other men. Had he been brought up in a free state, surrounded by the full restraints of civilized society, restraints which are necessary to the freedom of all its members, alike and equally, Captain Anthony might have been as humane a man as are members of such society generally. A man's character always takes its hue, more or less, from the form and color of things about him. The slaveholder, as well as the slave, was the victim of the slave system. Under the whole heavens there could be no relation more unfavorable to the development of honorable character than that sustained by the slaveholder to the slave. Reason is imprisoned here, and passions run wild. Could the reader have seen Captain Anthony gently leading me by the hand, as he sometimes did, patting me on the head, speaking to me in soft, caressing tones, and calling me his little Indian boy, he would have deemed him a kind-hearted old man and really almost fatherly to the slave boy. But the pleasant moods of a slaveholder are transient and fitful. They neither come often nor remain long. The temper of the old man was subject to special trials, but since these trials were never borne patiently, they added little to his natural stock of patience. Aside from his troubles with his slaves and those of Mr. Lloyd, he made the impression upon me of being an unhappy man. Even to my child's eye he wore a troubled and at times a haggard aspect. His strange movements excited my curiosity and awakened my compassion. He seldom walked alone without muttering to himself, and he occasionally stormed about, as if defying an army of invisible foes. Most of his leisure was spent in walking around, cursing and gesticulating, as if possessed by a demon. He was evidently a wretched man, at war with his own soul and all the world around him. To be overheard by the children disturbed him very little. He made no more of our presence than that of the ducks and geese he met on the green. But when his gestures were most violent, ending with a threatening shake of the head and a sharp snap of his middle finger and thumb, I deemed it wise to keep at a safe distance from him. One of the first circumstances that opened my eyes to the cruelties and wickedness of slavery and its hardening influences upon my old master was his refusal to interpose his authority to protect and shield a young woman, a cousin of mine, who had been most cruelly abused and beaten by his overseer in Tuckahoe. 
This overseer, a Mr. Plummer, was, like most of his class, little less than a human brute, and in addition to his general profligacy and repulsive coarseness, he was a miserable drunkard, a man not fit to have the management of a drove of mules. In one of his moments of drunken madness, he committed the outrage which brought the young woman in question down to my old masters for protection. The poor girl, on her arrival at our house, presented a most pitiable appearance. She had left in haste and without preparation, and probably without the knowledge of Mr. Plummer. She had traveled twelve miles, barefooted, bare-necked, and bareheaded. Her neck and shoulders were covered with scars newly made, and, not content with marring her neck and shoulders with the cowhide, the cowardly wretch had dealt her a blow on the head with a hickory club, which cut a horrible gash, and left her face literally covered with blood. In this condition the poor young woman came down to implore protection at the hands of my old master. I expected to see him boil over with rage at the revolting deed, and to hear him fill the air with curses upon the brutal plumber. But I was disappointed. He sternly told her, in an angry tone, she deserved every bit of it, and if she did not go home instantly, he would take the remaining skin from her neck and back. Thus the poor girl was compelled to return without redress, and perhaps to receive an additional flogging for daring to appeal to authority higher than that of the overseer. I did not at that time understand the philosophy of this treatment of my cousin. I think I now understand it. This treatment was a part of the system, rather than a part of the man. To have encouraged appeals of this kind would have occasioned much loss of time, and would have left the overseer powerless to enforce obedience. Nevertheless, when a slave had nerve enough to go straight to his master, with a well-founded complaint against an overseer, though he might be repelled, and have even that of which he at the time complained repeated, and though he might be beaten by his master, as well as by the overseer, for his temerity, the policy of complaining was, in the end, generally vindicated by the relaxed rigor of the overseer's treatment. The latter became more careful and less disposed to use the lash upon such slaves thereafter. The overseer very naturally disliked to have the ear of the master disturbed by complaints and either for this reason or because of advice privately given him by his employer, he generally modified the rigor of his rule after complaints of this kind had been made against him. For some cause or other, the slaves, no matter how often they were repulsed by their masters, were ever disposed to regard them with less abhorrence than the overseer. And yet these masters would often go beyond their overseers in wanton cruelty. They wielded the lash without any sense of responsibility. They could cripple or kill without fear of consequences. I have seen my old master when in a tempest of wrath and full of pride, hatred, jealousy, and revenge, seem a very fiend. The circumstances which I am about to narrate, and which gave rise to this fearful tempest of passion, were not singular, but very common in our slave-holding community. The reader will have noticed that among the names of slaves that of Esther is mentioned. This was the name of a young woman who possessed that which was ever a curse to the slave girl, namely, personal beauty. She was tall, light-colored, well-formed, and made of fine appearance. Esther was courted by Ned Roberts, the son of a favorite slave of Colonel Lloyd, and who was as fine-looking a young man as Esther was a woman. Some slaveholders would have been glad to have promoted the marriage of two such persons, but for some reason Captain Anthony disapproved of their courtship. He strictly ordered her to quit the society of young Roberts, telling her that he would punish her severely if he ever found her again in his company. But it was impossible to keep this couple apart. Meet they would, and meet they did. Had Mr. Anthony himself been a man of honor, his motives in this matter might have appeared more favorably. As it was, they appeared as abhorrent as they were contemptible. It was one of the damning characteristics of slavery, that it robbed its victims of every earthly incentive to a holy life. The fear of God and the hope of heaven were sufficient to sustain many slave women amidst the snares and dangers of their strange lot, but they were ever at the mercy of the power, passion, and caprice of their owners. Slavery provided no means for the honorable perpetuation of the race. Yet, despite of this destitution, there were many men and women among the slaves who were true and faithful to each other through life. But to the case in hand. 
Abhorred and circumvented as he was, Captain Anthony, having the power, was determined on revenge. I happened to see its shocking execution, and shall never forget the scene. It was early in the morning, when all was still, and before any of the family in the house or kitchen had risen. I was, in fact, awakened by the heart-rending shrieks and piteous cries of poor Esther. My sleeping place was on the dirt floor of a little rough closet which opened into the kitchen, and through the cracks in its unplaned boards I could distinctly see and hear what was going on, without being seen. Esther's wrists were firmly tied, and the twisted rope was fastened to a strong iron staple in a heavy wooden beam above, near the fireplace. Here she stood on a bench, her arms tightly drawn above her head. Her back and shoulders were perfectly bare. Behind her stood old master, cowhide in hand, pursuing his barbarous work with all manner of harsh, coarse, and tantalizing epithets. He was cruelly deliberate, and protracted the torture as one who was delighted with the agony of his victim. Again and again he drew the hateful scourge through his hand, adjusting it with a view of dealing the most pain-giving blow his strength and skill could inflict. Poor Esther had never before been severely whipped. Her shoulders were plump and tender. Each blow, vigorously laid on, brought screams from her as well as blood. "'Have mercy, oh, mercy!' she cried. "'I won't do so no more!' But her piercing cries seemed only to increase his fury. The whole scene, with all its attendant circumstances, was revolting and shocking to the last degree, and when the motives for the brutal castigation are known, language has no power to convey a just sense of its dreadful criminality. After laying on, I dare not say how many stripes, old master untied his suffering victim. When let down, she could scarcely stand. From my heart I pitied her, and child as I was, and new to such scenes, the shock was tremendous. I was terrified, hushed, stunned, and bewildered. The scene here described was often repeated, for Edward and Esther continued to meet, notwithstanding all efforts to prevent their meeting. End of chapter 5part 1 chapter 6 of life and times of frederick douglass by frederick douglass this librivox recording is in the public domain part 1 chapter 6 a child's reasoning the incidents related in the foregoing chapter led me thus early to inquire into the origin and nature of slavery why am i a slave why are some people slaves and others masters these were perplexing questions, and very troublesome to my childhood. I was very early told by someone that God up in the sky had made all things, and had made black people to be slaves, and white people to be masters. I was told, too, that God was good, and that he knew what was best for everybody. This was, however, less satisfactory than the first statement. It came point-blank against all my notions of goodness. The case of Aunt Esther was in my mind. Besides, I could not tell how anybody could know that God made black people to be slaves. Then I found, too, that there were puzzling exceptions to this theory of slavery, in the fact that all black people were not slaves, and all white people were not masters. An incident occurred about this time that made a deep impression on my mind. My Aunt Jenny and one of the men slaves of Captain Anthony ran away. A great noise was made about it. Old Master was furious. He said he would follow them and catch them and bring them back. But he never did. And somebody told me that Uncle Noah and Aunt Jenny had gone to the free states and were free. Besides this occurrence, which brought much light to my mind on the subject, there were several slaves on Mr. Lloyd's place who remembered being brought from Africa. There were others who told me that their fathers and mothers were stolen from Africa. This to me was important knowledge, but not such as to make me feel very easy in my slave condition. The success of Aunt Jenny and Uncle Noah in getting away from slavery was, I think, the first fact that made me seriously think of escape for myself. I could not have been more than seven or eight years old at the time of this occurrence, but young as I was, I was already in spirit and purpose a fugitive from slavery. Up to the time of the brutal treatment of my Aunt Esther, 
already narrated, and the shocking plight in which I had seen my cousin from Tuckahoe, my attention had not been especially directed to the grosser and more revolting features of slavery. I had, of course, heard of whippings and savage mutilations of slaves by brutal overseers, but happily for me I had always been out of the way of such occurrences. My playtime was spent outside of the corn and tobacco fields, where the overseers and slaves were brought together and in conflict. But after the case of my Aunt Esther, I saw others of the same disgusting and shocking nature. The one of these which agitated and distressed me most was the whipping of a woman, not belonging to my old master, but to Colonel Lloyd. The charge against her was very common and very indefinite, namely, impudence. This crime could be committed by a slave in a hundred different ways, and depended much upon the temper and caprice of the overseer as to whether it was committed at all. He could create the offense whenever it pleased him. A look, a word, a gesture, accidental or intentional, never failed to be taken as impudence when he was in the right mood for such an offense. In this case, there were all the necessary conditions for the commission of the crime charged. The offender was nearly white to begin with. She was the wife of a favorite hand on board of Mr. Lloyd's sloop, and was besides the mother of five sprightly children. Vigorous and spirited woman that she was, a wife and a mother, with a predominating share of the blood of the master running in her veins. Nellie, for that was her name, had all the qualities essential to impudence to a slave overseer. My attention was called to the scene of the castigation by the loud screams and curses that proceeded from the direction of it. When I came near the parties engaged in the struggle, the overseer had hold of Nellie, endeavoring with his whole strength to drag her to a tree against her resistance. Both his and her faces were bleeding, for the woman was doing her best. Three of her children were present, and though quite small, from seven to ten years old, I should think, they gallantly took the side of their mother against the overseer, and pelted him well with stones and epithets. Amid the screams of the children, Let my mammy go! Let my mammy go! The hoarse voice of the maddened overseer was heard in terrible oaths that he would teach her how to give a white man impudence. The blood on his face and on hers attested her skill in the use of her nails, and his dogged determination to conquer. His purpose was to tie her up to a tree and give her, in slave-holding parlance, a genteel flogging, and he evidently had not expected the stern and protracted resistance he was meeting, or the strength and skill needed to its execution. There were times when she seemed likely to get the better of the brute, but he finally overpowered her, and succeeded in getting her arms firmly tied to the tree towards which he had been dragging her. The victim was now at the mercy of his merciless lash. What followed I need not here describe. The cries of the now helpless woman, while undergoing the terrible infliction, were mingled with the hoarse curses of the overseer and the wild cries of her distracted children. When the poor woman was untied, her back was covered with blood. She was whipped, terribly whipped, but she was not subdued and continued to denounce the overseer, and to pour upon him every vile epithet of which she could think. Such floggings are seldom repeated on the same persons by overseers. They prefer to whip those who are the most easily whipped. The doctrine that submission to violence is the best cure for violence did not hold good as between slaves and overseers. He was whipped oftener who was whipped easiest. That slave who had the courage to stand up for himself against the overseer, although he might have many hard stripes at first, became, while legally a slave, virtually a free man. You can shoot me, said a slave to Rigby Hopkins, but you can't whip me. And the result was he was neither whipped nor shot. I do not know that Mr. Sevier ever attempted to whip Nellie again. He probably never did, for he was taken sick not long after and died. It was commonly said that his deathbed was a wretched one, and that, the ruling passion being strong in death, he died flourishing the slave whip and with horrid oaths upon his lips. This deathbed scene may only be the imagining of the slaves. One thing is certain, that when he was in health his profanity was enough to chill the blood of an ordinary man. Nature, or habit, had given to his face an expression of uncommon savageness tobacco and rage had ground his teeth short, 
and nearly every sentence that he uttered was commenced or completed with an oath. Hated for his cruelty, despised for his cowardice, he went to his grave lamented by nobody on the place outside of his own house, if indeed he was even lamented there. In Mr. James Hopkins, the succeeding overseer, we had a different and a better man, as good perhaps as any man could be in the position of a slave overseer. Though he sometimes wielded the lash, it was evident that he took no pleasure in it and did it with much reluctance. He stayed but a short time here, and his removal from the position was much regretted by the slaves generally. Of the successor of Mr. Hopkins, I shall have something to say at another time and in another place. For the present, we will attend to a further description of the business-like aspect of Colonel Lloyd's Great House Farm. There was always much bustle and noise here on the two days at the end of each month, for then the slaves belonging to the different branches of this great estate assembled here by their representatives to obtain their monthly allowances of cornmeal and pork. These were gala days for the slaves of the outlying farms, and there was much rivalry among them as to who should be elected to go up to the great house farm for the allowances, and indeed to attend to any other business at this great place, to them the capital of a little nation. Its beauty and grandeur, its immense wealth, its numerous population, and the fact that uncles Harry, Peter, and Jake, the sailors on board the sloop, usually kept on sale trinkets which they bought in Baltimore to sell to their less fortunate fellow servants, made a visit to the great house farm a high privilege and eagerly sought. It was valued, too, as a mark of distinction and confidence, but probably the chief motive among the competitors for the office was the opportunity it afforded to shake off the monotony of the field and to get beyond the overseer's eye and lash. Once on the road with an ox team, and seated on the tongue of the cart with no overseer to look after him, one felt comparatively free. Slaves were expected to sing as well as to work. A silent slave was not liked, either by masters or overseers. Make a noise there, make a noise there, and bear a hand, were words usually addressed to slaves when they were silent. This and the natural disposition of the negro to make a noise in the world may account for the almost constant singing among them when at their work. There was generally more or less singing among the teamsters at all times. It was a means of telling the overseer, in the distance, where they were and what they were about. But on the allowance days, those commissioned to the great house farm were peculiarly vocal. While on the way they would make the grand old woods for miles around reverberate with their wild and plaintive notes. They were indeed both merry and sad. Child as I was, these wild songs greatly depressed my spirits. Nowhere outside of dear old Ireland in the days of want and famine have I heard sounds so mournful. In all these slave songs there was ever some expression of praise of the great house farm, something that would please the pride of the Lloyds. I am going away to the great house farm, oh yea, oh yea, oh yea. My old master is a good old master, oh yea, oh yea, oh yea. These words would be sung over and over again, with others improvised as they went along, jargon, perhaps, to the reader, but full of meaning to the singers. I have sometimes thought that the mere hearing of these songs would have done more to impress the good people of the North with the soul-crushing character of slavery than whole volumes exposing the physical cruelties of the slave system. For the heart has no language like song. Many years ago, when recollecting my experience in this respect, I wrote of these slave songs in the following strain. I did not, when a slave, fully understand the deep meaning of those rude and apparently incoherent songs. I was myself within the circle, so that I could then neither hear nor see as those without might see and hear. They breathed the prayer and complaint of souls overflowing with the bitterest anguish. They depressed my spirits and filled my heart with ineffable sadness. The remark in the olden time was not unfrequently made that slaves were the most contented and happy laborers in the world, and their dancing and singing were referred to in proof of this alleged fact, but it was a great mistake to suppose them happy because they sometimes made those joyful noises. The songs of the slaves represented their sorrows rather than their joys. Like tears, they were a relief to aching hearts. 
It is not inconsistent with the constitution of the human mind that it avails itself of one and the same method for expressing opposite emotions. Sorrow and desolation have their songs, as well as joy and peace. It was the boast of slaveholders that their slaves enjoyed more of the physical comforts of life than the pleasantry of any country in the world. My experience contradicts this. The men and the women slaves on Colonel Lloyd's farm received as their monthly allowance of food eight pounds of pickled pork, or its equivalent in fish. The pork was often tainted, and the fish were of the poorest quality. With their pork or fish, they had given them one bushel of Indian meal, unbolted, of which quite fifteen per cent was more fit for pigs than for men. With this one pint of salt was given, and this was the entire monthly allowance of a full-grown slave, working constantly in the open field from morning till night, every day in the month except Sunday. There is no kind of work which really requires a better supply of food to prevent physical exhaustion than the field work of a slave. The yearly allowance of clothing was not more ample than the supply of food. It consisted of two tow linen shirts, one pair of trousers of the same coarse material for summer, and a woolen pair of trousers and a woolen jacket for winter, with one pair of yarn stockings and a pair of shoes of the coarsest description. Children under ten years old had neither shoes, stockings, jackets, nor trousers. They had two coarse tow linen shirts per year, and when these were worn out, they went naked till the next allowance day, and this was the condition of the little girls as well as of the boys. As to beds, they had none. One coarse blanket was given them, and this only to the men and women. The children stuck themselves in holes and corners about the quarters, often in the corners of huge chimneys, with their feet in the ashes to keep them warm. The want of beds, however, was not considered a great privation by the field hands. Time to sleep was of far greater importance, for when the day's work was done, most of these had their washing, mending, and cooking to do, and having few or no facilities for doing such things, very many of their needed sleeping hours were consumed in necessary preparations for the labors of the coming day. The sleeping apartments, if they could have been properly called such, had little regard to comfort or decency. Old and young, male and female, married and single, dropped down upon the common clay floor, each covering up with his or her blanket, their only protection from cold or exposure. The night, however, was shortened at both ends. The slaves worked often as long as they could see, and were late in cooking and mending for the coming day, and at the first gray streak of the morning they were summoned to the field by the overseer's horn. They were whipped for oversleeping more than for any other fault. Neither age nor sex found any favor. The overseer stood at the quarter door, armed with stick and whip, ready to deal heavy blows upon any who might be a little behind time. When the horn was blown there was a rush for the door, for the hindermost one was sure to get a blow from the overseer. Young mothers who worked in the field were allowed an hour about ten o'clock in the morning to go home to nurse their children. This was when they were not required to take them to the field with them and leave them upon turning row or in the corner of the fences. As a general rule, the slaves did not come to their quarters to take their meals, but took their ash cake, called thus because baked in the ashes, and piece of pork or their salt herrings when they were at work. But let us now leave the rough usage of the field, where vulgar coarseness and brutal cruelty flourished as rank as weeds in the tropics, and where a vile wretch, in the shape of a man, rides, walks, and struts about, with whip in hand, dealing heavy blows and leaving deep gashes on the flesh of men and women, and turn our attention to the less repulsive slave life as it existed in the home of my childhood. Some idea of the splendor of that place sixty years ago has already been given. The contrast between the condition of the slaves and that of their masters was marvelously sharp and striking. There were pride, pomp, and luxury on the one hand, Servility, dejection, and misery on the other. End of chapter 6 Part 1, Chapter 7 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 7 Luxuries at the Great House 
The close-fisted stinginess that fed the poor slave on coarse cornmeal and tainted meat, that clothed him in crashy tow linen and hurried him on to toil through the field in all weathers, with wind and rain beating through his tattered garments, and that scarcely gave even the young slave mother time to nurse her infant in the fence corner, wholly vanished on approaching the sacred precincts of the great house itself. There, the scriptural phrase descriptive of the wealthy found exact illustration. The highly favored inmates of this mansion were literally arrayed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. The table of this house groaned under the blood-bought luxuries gathered with pains taking care at home and abroad. Fields, forests, rivers, and seas were made tributary. Immense wealth and its lavish expenditures filled the great house with all that could please the eye or tempt the taste. Fish, flesh, and fowl were here in profusion. Chickens of all breeds, ducks of all kinds, wild and tame, the common and the huge muscovite, guinea fowls, turkeys, geese, and pea fowls, all were fat and fattening for the destined vortex. Here the graceful swan, the mongrel, the black-necked wild goose, partridges, quails, pheasants, pigeons, and choice waterfowl, with all their strange varieties, were caught in this huge net. Beef, veal, mutton, and venison, of the most select kinds and quality, rolled in bounteous profusion to this grand consumer. The teeming riches of the Chesapeake Bay, its rock perch, drums, crocus, trout, oysters, crabs, and terrapin, were drawn hither to adorn the glittering table. The dairy, too, the finest then on the eastern shore of Maryland, supplied by cattle of the best English stock, imported for the express purpose, poured its rich donations of fragrant cheese, golden butter, and delicious cream to heighten the attractions of the gorgeous, unending round of feasting. Nor were the fruits of the earth overlooked. The fertile garden, many acres in size, constituting a separate establishment distinct from the common farm, with its scientific gardener direct from Scotland, a Mr. McDermott, and four men under his direction, was not behind, either in the abundance or in the delicacy of its contributions. The tender asparagus, the crispy celery, and the delicate cauliflower, eggplants, beets, lettuce, parsnips, peas, and French beans, early and late, radishes, cantaloupes, melons of all kinds, and the fruits of all climes and of every description, from the hardy apples of the north to the lemon and orange of the south, culminated at this point. Here were gathered figs, raisins, almonds, and grapes from Spain, wines and brandies from France, teas and various flavor from China, and rich aromatic coffee from Java, all conspiring to swell the tide of high life, where pride and indolence lounged in magnificence and satiety. Behind the tall-backed and elaborately wrought chairs stood the servants, fifteen in number, carefully selected, not only with a view to their capacity and adeptness, but with a special regard to their personal appearance, their graceful agility, and pleasing address. Some of these servants, armed with fans, wafted reviving breezes to the overheated brows of the alabaster ladies, whilst others watched with eager eye and fawn-like step, anticipating and supplying wants before they were sufficiently formed to be announced by word or sign. These servants constituted a sort of black aristocracy. They resembled the field hands in nothing except their color, and in this they held the advantage of a velvet-like glossiness, rich and beautiful. The hair, too, showed the same advantage. The delicately formed colored maid rustled in the scarcely worn silk of her young mistress, while the servant men were equally well attired from the overflowing wardrobe of their young masters, so that in dress, as well as in form and feature, in manner and speech, in tastes and habits, the distance between these favored few and the sorrow and hunger-smitten multitudes of the quarter and the field was immense. In the stables and carriage-houses were to be found the same evidences of pride and luxurious extravagance. Here were three splendid coaches, soft within and lustrous without. Here, too, were gigs, phaetons, barouches, sulkies, and sleighs. Here were saddles and harnesses, beautifully wrought and richly mounted. Not less than thirty-five horses of the best approved blood, both for speed and beauty, were kept only for pleasure. 
The care of these horses constituted the entire occupation of two men, one or the other of them being always in the stable to answer any call which might be made from the great house. Over the way from the stable was a house built expressly for the hounds, a pack of twenty-five or thirty, the fare for which would have made glad the hearts of a dozen slaves. Horses and hounds, however, were not the only consumers of the slaves' toil. The hospitality practiced at the Lloyd's would have astonished and charmed many a health-seeking divine or merchant from the north. Viewed from his table, and not from the field, Colonel Lloyd was, indeed, a model of generous hospitality. His house was literally a hotel for weeks during the summer months. At these times, especially, the air was freighted with the rich fumes of baking, boiling, roasting, and broiling. It was something to me that I could share these odors with the winds, even if the meats themselves were under a more stringent monopoly. In Master Daniel I had a friend at court, who would sometimes give me a cake, and who kept me well informed as to their guests and their entertainments. Viewed from Colonel Lloyd's table, who could have said that his slaves were not well clad and well cared for? Who would have said that they did not glory in being the slaves of such a master? Who but a fanatic could have seen any cause for sympathy for either master or slave? Alas, this immense wealth, this gilded splendor, this profusion of luxury, this exemption from toil, this life of ease, this sea of plenty, were not the pearly gates they seemed to a world of happiness and sweet content to be. The poor slave, on his hard pine plank, scantily covered with his thin blanket, slept more soundly than the feverish voluptuary who reclined upon his downy pillow. Food to the indolent is poison, not sustenance. Lurking beneath the rich and tempting viands were invisible spirits of evil, which filled the self-deluded gormandizer with aches and pains, passions uncontrollable, fierce tempers, dyspepsia, rheumatism, lumbago, and gout, and of these the Lloyds had a full share. I had many opportunities of witnessing the restless discontent and capricious irritation of the Lloyds. My fondness for horses attracted me to the stable much of the time. The two men in charge of this establishment were old and young Barney, father and son. Old Barney was a fine-looking, portly old man of a brownish complexion, and a respectful and dignified bearing. He was much devoted to his profession, and held his office as an honorable one. He was a farrier as well as an ostler, and could bleed horses, remove lampers from their mouths, and administer medicine to them. No one on the farm knew so well as old Barney what to do with a sick horse, but his office was not an enviable one, and his gifts and acquirements were of little advantage to him. In nothing was Colonel Lloyd more unreasonable and exacting than in respect to the management of his horses. Any supposed inattention to these animals was sure to be visited with degrading punishment. His horses and dogs fared better than his men. Their beds were far softer and cleaner than those of his human cattle. No excuse could shield old Barney if the colonel only suspected something wrong about his horses, and consequently he was often punished when faultless. It was painful to hear the unreasonable and fretful scoldings administered by Colonel Lloyd, his son Murray, and his sons-in-law to this poor man. Three of the daughters of Colonel Lloyd were married, and they, with their husbands, remained at the great house a portion of the year, and enjoyed the luxury of whipping the servants when they pleased. A horse was seldom brought out of the stable, to which no objection could be raised. There was dust in his hair. There was a twist in his reins. His foretop was not combed. His mane did not lie straight. His head did not look well. His fetlocks had not been properly trimmed. Something was always wrong. However groundless the complaint, Barney must stand, hat in hand, lips sealed, never answering a word in explanation or excuse. In a free state, a master thus complaining without cause might be told by his ostler, Sir, I am sorry I cannot please you, but since I have done the best I can and fail to do so, your remedy is to dismiss me. But here the ostler must listen and tremblingly abide his master's behest. One of the most heart-suddening and humiliating scenes I ever witnessed was the whipping of old Barney by Colonel Lloyd. These two men were both advanced in years. There were the silver locks of the master, and the bald and toil-worn brow of the slave, superior and inferior here, powerful and weak here, but equals before God. 
Uncover your head, said the imperious master. He was obeyed. Take off your jacket, you old rascal. And off came Barney's jacket. Down on your knees. Down knelt the old man, his shoulders bare, his bald head glistening in the sunshine, and his aged knees on the cold, damp ground. In this humble and debasing attitude, that master, to whom he had devoted the best years and the best strength of his life, came forward and laid on thirty lashes with his horsewhip. The old man made no resistance, but bore it patiently, answering each blow only with a shrug of the shoulders and a groan. I do not think that the physical suffering from this infliction was severe, for the whip was a light riding whip, but the spectacle of an aged man, a husband and a father, humbly kneeling before his fellow man, shocked me at the time. And since I have grown older, few of the features of slavery have impressed me with a deeper sense of its injustice and barbarity than did this existing scene. I owe it to the truth, however, to say that this was the first and last time I ever saw a slave compelled to kneel to receive a whipping. Another incident, illustrating a phase of slavery to which I have referred in another connection, I may here mention. Besides two other coachmen, Colonel Lloyd owned one named William Wilkes, and his was one of the exceptional cases where a slave possessed a surname, and was recognized by it, by both colored and white people. Wilkes was a very fine-looking man. He was about as white as any one on the plantation, and in form and feature bore a very striking resemblance to Murray Lloyd. It was whispered and generally believed that William Wilkes was a son of Colonel Lloyd by a highly favored slave woman who was still on the plantation. There were many reasons for believing this whisper, not only from his personal appearance, but from the undeniable freedom which he enjoyed over all others, and his apparent consciousness of being something more than a slave to his master. It was notorious, too, that William had a deadly enemy in Murray Lloyd, whom he so much resembled, and that the latter greatly worried his father with importunities to sell William. Indeed, he gave his father no rest until he did sell him to Austin Waldfolk, the great slave trader at that time. Before selling him, however, he tried to make things smooth by giving William a whipping, but it proved a failure. It was a compromise, and like most such, defeated itself, for Colonel Lloyd soon after atoned to William for the abuse by giving him a gold watch and chain. Another fact somewhat curious was that though sold to the remorseless wold folk, taken in irons to Baltimore and cast into prison, with a view to being sent to the South, William outbid all his purchasers, paid for himself, and afterwards resided in Baltimore. How this was accomplished was a great mystery at the time, explained only on the supposition that the hand which had bestowed the gold watch and chain had also supplied the purchase money. But I have since learned that this was not the true explanation. Wilkes had many friends in Baltimore and Annapolis, and they united to save him from a fate which was one of all others most dreaded by the slaves. Practical amalgamation was, however, so common at the South, and so many circumstances pointed in that direction, that there was little reason to doubt that William Wilkes was the son of Edward Lloyd. The real feelings and opinions of the slaves were not much known or respected by their masters. The distance between the two was too great to admit of such knowledge, and in this respect Colonel Lloyd was no exception to the rule. His slaves were so numerous that he did not know them when he saw them. Nor, indeed, did all his slaves know him. It is reported of him that riding along the road one day he met a colored man, and addressed him in what was the usual way of speaking to colored people on the public highways of the South. "'Well, boy, who do you belong to?' "'To Colonel Lloyd,' replied the slave. "'Well, does the Colonel treat you well?' "'No, sir,' was the ready reply. "'What, does he work you hard?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Well, don't he give you enough to eat?' Yes, sir, he gives me enough to eat, such as it is. The colonel rode on. The slave also went on about his business, not dreaming that he had been conversing with his master. He thought and said nothing of the matter, until, two or three weeks afterwards, he was informed by his overseer that, for having found fault with his master, he was now to be sold to a Georgia trader. He was immediately chained and handcuffed, and thus... Without a moment's warning, he was snatched away, and forever sundered from his family and friends by a hand as unrelenting as that of death. 
This was the penalty of telling the simple truth in answer to a series of plain questions. It was partly in consequence of such facts that slaves, when inquired of as to their condition and the character of their masters, would almost invariably say that they were contented and their masters kind. Slaveholders are known to have sent spies among their slaves to ascertain, if possible, their views and feelings in regard to their condition. Hence the maxim established among them that a still tongue makes a wise head. They would suppress the truth rather than take the consequences of telling it, and in so doing they prove themselves a part of the human family. I was frequently asked if I had a kind master, and I do not remember ever to have given a negative reply. I did not consider myself as uttering that which was strictly untrue, for I always measured the kindness of my master by the standard of kindness set up by the slaveholders around us. End of chapter 7 Part 1, Chapter 8 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 8 Characteristics of Overseers the comparatively moderate rule of Mr. Hopkins as overseer on Colonel Lloyd's plantation was succeeded by that of another, whose name was Austin Gore. I hardly know how to bring this man fitly before the reader, for under him there was more suffering from violence and bloodshed than had, according to the older slaves, ever been experienced before at this place. He was an overseer, and possessed the peculiar characteristics of his class, yet to call him merely an overseer would not give one a fair conception of the man. I speak of overseers as a class, for they were such. They were as distinct from the slave-holding gentry of the South as are the fishwomen of Paris and the coal-heavers of London distinct from other grades of society. They constituted at the South a separate fraternity. They were arranged and classified by that great law of attraction which determines the sphere and affinities of men, and which ordains that men whose malign and brutal propensities preponderate over their moral and intellectual endowments shall naturally fall into the employments which promise the largest gratification to their predominating instincts or propensities. The office of overseer took this raw material of vulgarity and brutality and stamped it as a distinct class in Southern life. But in this class, as in all other classes, there were sometimes persons of marked individuality, yet with a general resemblance to the mass. Mr. Gore was one of those to whom a general characterization would do no manner of justice. He was an overseer, but he was something more. With the malign and tyrannical qualities of an overseer, he combined something of the lawful master, he had the artfulness and mean ambition of his class, without its disgusting swagger and noisy bravado. There was an easy air of independence about him, a calm self-possession, and at the same time a sternness of glance, which well might daunt less timid hearts than those of poor slaves accustomed from childhood to cower before a driver's lash. He was one of those overseers who could torture the slightest word or look into impudence, and he had the nerve not only to resent, but to punish promptly and severely. There could be no answering back, guilty or not guilty, to be accused was to be sure of a flogging. His very presence was fearful, and I shunned him as I would have shunned a rattlesnake. His piercing black eyes and sharp, shrill voice ever awakened sensations of dread. Other overseers, how brutal soever they might be, would sometimes seek to gain favor with the slaves by indulging in a little pleasantry, but Gore never said a funny thing or perpetrated a joke. He was always cold, distant, and unapproachable, the overseer on Colonel Edward Lloyd's plantation, and needed no higher pleasure than the performance of the duties of his office. When he used the lash, it was from a sense of duty, without fear of consequences. There was a stern will, an iron-like reality about him, which would easily have made him chief of a band of pirates, had his environments been favorable to such a sphere. Among many other deeds of shocking cruelty committed by him was the murder of a young colored man named Bill Denby. He was a powerful fellow, full of animal spirits, and one of the most valuable of Colonel Lloyd's slaves. In some way, I know not what, 
He offended this Mr. Austin Gore, and in accordance with the usual custom, the latter undertook to flog him. He had given him but a few stripes when Denby broke away from him, plunged into the creek, and standing there with the water up to his neck, refused to come out. Whereupon, for this refusal, Gore shot him dead. It was said that Gore gave Denby three calls to come out, telling him that if he did not obey the last call he would shoot him. When the last call was given, Denby still stood his ground, and Gore, without further parley or make any further effort to induce obedience, raised his gun deliberately to his face, took deadly aim at his standing victim, and with one click of the gun the mangled body sank out of sight, and only his warm red blood marked the place where he had stood. This fiendish murder produced, as it could not help doing, a tremendous sensation. The slaves were panic-stricken, and howled with alarm. The atrocity roused my old master, and he spoke out in reprobation of it. Both he and Colonel Lloyd arraigned Gore for his cruelty, but the latter, calm and collected as though nothing unusual had happened, declared that Denby had become unmanageable, that he set a dangerous example to the other slaves, and that unless some such prompt measure was resorted to, there would be an end of all rule and order on the plantation. That convenient cover for all manner of villainy and outrage, that cowardly alarm cry that the slaves would take the place, was pleaded, just as it had been before in thousands of similar cases. Gore's defense was evidently considered satisfactory, for he was continued in his office without being subjected to a judicial investigation. The murder was committed in the presence of slaves only, and they, being slaves, could neither institute a suit nor testify against the murderer. Mr. Gore lived in St. Michael's, Talbot County, Maryland, and I have no reason to doubt, from what I know to have been the moral sentiment of the place, that he was as highly esteemed and as much respected as though his guilty soul had not been stained with innocent blood. I speak advisedly when I say that in Talbot County, Maryland, killing a slave or any colored person was not treated as a crime, either by the courts or the community. Mr. Thomas Landman, ship carpenter of St. Michael's, killed two slaves, one of whom he butchered with a hatchet by knocking out his brains. He used to boast of having committed the awful and bloody deed. I have heard him do so laughingly, declaring himself a benefactor of his country, and that when others would do as much as he had done, they would be rid of the D.D. niggers. Another notorious fact which I may here state was the murder of a young girl between fifteen and sixteen years of age by her mistress, Mrs. Giles Hicks, who lived but a short distance from Colonel Lloyd's. This wicked woman, in the paroxysm of her wrath, not content with killing her victim, literally mangled her face and broke her breastbone. Wild and infuriated as she was, she took the precaution to cause the burial of the girl but the facts of the case getting abroad, the remains were disinterred, and a coroner's jury assembled, who, after due deliberation, decided that the girl had come to her death from severe beating. The offense for which this girl was hurried out of the world was this. She had been set that night, and several preceding nights, to mind Mrs. Hicks's baby, and having fallen into a sound sleep, the crying of the baby did not wake her, as it did its mother. The tardiness of the girl excited Mrs. Hicks, who, after calling her several times, seized a piece of firewood from the fireplace, and pounded her skull and breastbone till death ensued. I will not say that this murder most foul produced no sensation. It did produce a sensation. A warrant was issued for the arrest of Mrs. Hicks, but incredible to tell, for some reason or other, that warrant was never served, and she not only escaped condign punishment, but the pain and mortification as well of being arraigned before a court of justice. While I am detailing the bloody deeds that took place during my stay on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, I will briefly narrate another dark transaction which occurred about the time of the murder of Denby. On the side of the river Wye, opposite from Colonel Lloyd's, there lived a Mr. Beale Bondley, a wealthy slaveholder. In the direction of his land and near the shore, there was an excellent oyster fishing ground, and to this some of Lloyd's slaves occasionally resorted in their little canoes at night with a view to make up the deficiency of their scanty allowance of food by the oysters they could easily get there. 
Mr. Bondley took it into his head to regard this as a trespass, and while an old man-slave was engaged in catching a few of the many millions of oysters that lined the bottom of the creek to satisfy his hunger, the rascally Bondley, lying in ambush without the slightest warning, discharged the contents of his musket into the back of the poor old man. As good fortune would have it, the shot did not prove fatal, and Mr. Bondley came over the next day to see Colonel Lloyd about it. What happened between them I know not, but there was little said about it and nothing publicly done. One of the commonest sayings to which my ears early became accustomed was that it was worth but a half a cent to kill a nigger and half a cent to bury one. While I heard of numerous murders committed by slaveholders on the eastern shore of Maryland, I never knew a solitary instance where a slaveholder was either hung or imprisoned for having murdered a slave. The usual pretext for such crimes was that the slave had offered resistance. Should a slave, when assaulted, but raise his hand in self-defense, the white assaulting party was fully justified by Southern law and Southern public opinion in shooting the slave down, and for this there was no redress. End of chapter 8「Part One, Chapter Nine of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Chapter Nine. Change of Location. I have nothing cruel or shocking to relate of my own personal experience while I remained on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, at the home of my old master. An occasional cuff from Aunt Katie, and a regular whipping from old master, such as any heedless and mischievous boy might get from his father, is all that I have to say of this sort. I was not old enough to work in the field, and there being little else than field work to perform, I had much leisure. The most I had to do was to drive up the cows in the evening, to keep the front yard clean, and to perform small errands for my young mistress, Lucretia Auld. I had reasons for thinking this lady was very kindly disposed towards me, and although I was not often the object of her attention, I constantly regarded her as my friend, and was always glad when it was my privilege to do her a service. In a family where there was so much that was harsh and indifferent, the slightest word or look of kindness was of great value. Miss Lucretia, as we all continued to call her long after her marriage, had bestowed on me such looks and words as taught me that she pitied me if she did not love me. She sometimes gave me a piece of bread and butter, an article not set down in our bill of fare, but an extra ration aside from both Aunt Katie and Old Master, and given as I believed solely out of the tender regard she had for me. Then, too, I one day got into the wars with Uncle Abel's son Ike, and got sadly worsted, the little rascal struck me directly in the forehead with a sharp piece of cinder, fused with iron from the old blacksmith's forge, which made a cross in my forehead very plainly to be seen even now. The gash bled very freely, and I roared and betook myself home. The cold-hearted Aunt Katie paid no attention, either to my wound or my roaring, except to tell me it served me right. I had no business with Ike. It would do me good. I would now keep away from dem Lloyd niggers. Miss Lucretia, in this state of the case, came forward and called me into the parlor, an extra privilege of itself, and without using toward me any of the hard and reproachful epithets of Aunt Katie, quietly acted the good Samaritan. With her own soft hand she washed the blood from my head and face, brought her own bottle of balsam, and with the balsam wetted a nice piece of white linen and bound up my head. The balsam was not more healing to the wound in my head than her kindness was healing to the wounds in my spirit, induced by the unfeeling words of Aunt Katie. Miss Lucretia was after this yet more, my friend. I felt her to be such, and I have no doubt that the simple act of binding up my head did much to awaken in her heart an interest in my welfare. It is quite true that this interest seldom showed itself in anything more than in giving me a piece of bread and butter but this was a great favor on a slave plantation, and I was the only one of the children to whom such attention was paid. When very severely pinched with hunger, I had the habit of singing, which the good lady very soon came to understand, and when she heard me singing under her window, I was very apt to be paid for my music. 
Thus I had two friends, both at important points, Masser Daniel at the Great House and Miss Lucretia at home. From Masser Daniel I got protection from the bigger boys, and from Miss Lucretia I got bread by singing when I was hungry, and sympathy when I was abused by the termagant in the kitchen. For such friendship I was deeply grateful, and bitter as are my recollections of slavery, it is a true pleasure to recall any instances of kindness, any sunbeams of humane treatment which found way to my soul through the iron grating of my house of bondage. Such beams seem all the brighter from the general darkness into which they penetrate, and the impression they make there is vividly distinct. As before intimated, I received no severe treatment from the hands of my master, but the insufficiency of both food and clothing was a serious trial to me, especially the lack of clothing. In hottest summer and coldest winter I was kept almost in a state of nudity. My only clothing, a little coarse sack cloth or tow linen sort of shirt, scarcely reaching to my knees, was worn night and day and changed once a week. In the daytime I could protect myself by keeping on the sunny side of the house, or in the stormy weather, in the corner of the kitchen chimney. But the great difficulty was to keep warm during the night. The pigs in the pen had leaves, and the horses in the stable had straw, but the children had no beds. They lodged anywhere in the ample kitchen. I slept generally in a little closet, without even a blanket to cover me. In very cold weather I sometimes got down the bag in which corn was carried to the mill, and crawled into that. Sleeping there with my head in and my feet out, I was partly protected, though never comfortable. My feet have been so cracked with the frost that the pen with which I am writing might be laid in the gashes. Our cornmeal mush, which was our only regular if not all-sufficing diet, was, when sufficiently cooled from the cooking, placed in a large tray or trough. This was set down either on the floor of the kitchen or out of doors on the ground, and the children were called like so many pigs, and like so many pigs would come, some with oyster shells, some with pieces of shingles, but none with spoons, and literally devour the mush. He who could eat fastest got most, and he who was strongest got the best place, but few left the trough really satisfied. I was the most unlucky of all for Aunt Katie had no good feeling for me, and if I pushed the children, or if they told her anything unfavorable of me, she always believed the worst and was sure to whip me. As I grew older and more thoughtful, I became more and more filled with a sense of my wretchedness. The unkindness of Aunt Katie, the hunger and cold I suffered, and the terrible reports of wrongs and outrages which came to my ear, together with what I almost daily witnessed, led me to wish I had never been born. I used to contrast my condition with that of the blackbirds, in whose wild and sweet songs I fancied them so happy. Their apparent joy only deepened the shades of my sorrow. There are thoughtful days in the lives of children, at least there were in mine, when they grapple with the great primary subjects of knowledge, and reach in a moment conclusions which no subsequent experience can shake. I was just as well aware of the unjust, unnatural, and murderous character of slavery when nine years old as I am now. Without any appeals to books, to laws, or to authorities of any kind, to regard God as our Father condemned slavery as a crime. I was in this unhappy state when I received from Miss Lucretia the joyful intelligence that my old master had determined to let me go to Baltimore to live with Mr. Hugh Auld a brother to Mr. Thomas Auld, Miss Lucretia's husband. I shall never forget the ecstasy with which I received this information, three days before the time set for my departure. They were the three happiest days I had ever known. I spent the largest part of them in the creek, washing off the plantation's scurf, and thus preparing for my new home. Miss Lucretia took a lively interest in getting me ready. She told me I must get all the dead skin off my feet and knees, for the people in Baltimore were very cleanly, and would laugh at me if I looked dirty. And besides, she was intending to give me a pair of trousers, but which I could not put on unless I got off all the dirt. This was a warning which I was bound to heed, for the thought of owning and wearing a pair of trousers was great indeed. So I went at it in good earnest, working for the first time in my life in the hope of reward. 
I was greatly excited and could hardly consent to sleep lest I should be left. The ties that ordinarily bind children to their homes had no existence in my case, and in thinking of a home elsewhere I was confident of finding none that I should relish less than the one I was leaving. If I should meet with hardship, hunger, and nakedness, I had known them all before, and I could endure them elsewhere, especially in Baltimore, for I had something of the feeling about that city that is expressed in the saying that being hanged in England is better than dying a natural death in Ireland. I had the strongest desire to see Baltimore. My cousin Tom, a boy two or three years older than I, had been there, and though not fluent in speech, he stuttered immoderately, he had inspired me with that desire by his eloquent descriptions of the place. Tom was sometimes cabin boy on board the sloop Sally Lloyd, which Captain Thomas Auld commanded, and when he came home from Baltimore he was always a sort of hero amongst us, at least till his trip to Baltimore was forgotten. I could never tell him anything or point out anything that struck me as beautiful or powerful, but that he had seen something in Baltimore far surpassing it. Even the great house, with all its pictures within and pillars without, he had the hardihood to say, was nothing to Baltimore. He bought a trumpet worth sixpence and brought it home, told what he had seen in the windows of the stores, that he had heard shooting crackers and seen soldiers, that he had seen a steamboat, and that they were ships in Baltimore that could carry four such sloops as the Sally Lloyd. He said a great deal about the market house, of the ringing of the bells, and of many other things which roused my curiosity very much, and indeed brightened my hopes of happiness in my new home. We sailed out of Miles River for Baltimore early on a Saturday morning. I remember only the day of the week, for at that time I had no knowledge of the days of the month, nor indeed of the months of the year. On setting sail I walked aft and gave to Colonel Lloyd's plantation what I hoped would be the last look I should give to it, or to any place like it. After taking this last view, I quitted the quarter-deck, made my way to the bow of the boat, and spent the remainder of the day in looking ahead, interesting myself in what was in the distance, rather than in what was nearby or behind. The vessels sweeping along the bay were objects full of interest to me. The broad bay opened like a shoreless ocean on my boyish vision, filling me with wonder and admiration. Late in the afternoon we reached Annapolis, but not stopping there long enough to admit of going ashore. It was the first large town I had ever seen, and though it was inferior to many a factory village in New England, my feelings on seeing it were excited to a pitch very little below that reached by travelers at the first view of Rome. The dome of the State House was especially imposing, and surpassed in grandeur the appearance of the great house I had left behind. So the great world was opening upon me, and I was eagerly acquainting myself with its multifarious lessons. We arrived in Baltimore on Sunday morning and landed at Smith's Wharf, not far from Bowley's Wharf. We had on board a large flock of sheep for the Baltimore market, and after assisting in driving them to the slaughterhouse of Mr. Curtis on Loudon Slater's Hill, I was conducted by Rich, one of the hands belonging to the sloop, to my new home on Elysiana Street, near Gardiner's Shipyard, on Fells Point. Mr. and Mrs. Hugh Auld, my new master and mistress, were both at home, and met me at the door, together with their rosy-cheeked little son, Thomas, to take care of whom was to constitute my future occupation. In fact, it was to little Tommy, rather than to his parents, that old master made a present of me, and though there was no legal form or arrangement entered into, I have no doubt that Mr. and Mrs. Auld felt that in due time I should be the legal property of their bright-eyed and beloved boy Tommy. I was especially struck with the appearance of my new mistress. Her face was lighted with the kindliest emotions, and the reflex influence of her countenance, as well as the tenderness with which she seemed to regard me, while asking me sundry little questions, greatly delighted me, and lit up to my fancy the pathway of my future. Little Thomas was affectionately told by his mother that there was his Freddy, and that Freddy would take care of him, and I was told to be kind to little Tommy, an injunction I scarcely needed, for I had already fallen in love with the dear boy. With these little ceremonies I was initiated into my new home, 
and entered upon my peculiar duties, then unconscious of a cloud to dim its broad horizon. I may say here that I regard my removal from Colonel Lloyd's plantation as one of the most interesting and fortunate events of my life. Viewing it in the light of human likelihoods, it is quite probable that but for the mere circumstance of being thus removed, before the rigors of slavery had fully fastened upon me, before my young spirit had been crushed under the iron control of the slave driver, I might have continued in slavery until emancipated by the war. End of chapter 9 Part 1, Chapter 10 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 10, Learning to Read. Established in my new home in Baltimore, I was not very long in perceiving that in picturing to myself what was to be my life there, my imagination had painted only the bright side, and that the reality had its dark shades as well as its light ones. The open country, which had been so much to me, was all shut out. Walled in on every side by towering brick buildings, the heat of the summer was intolerable to me, and the hard brick pavements almost blistered my feet. If I ventured out onto the streets, new and strange objects glared upon me at every step, and startling sounds greeted my ears from all directions. My country eyes and ears were confused and bewildered. Troops of hostile boys pounced upon me at every corner. They chased me and called me Eastern Shore Man, till really I almost wished myself back on the Eastern Shore. My new mistress happily proved to be all she had seemed, and in her presence I easily forgot all outside annoyances. Mrs. Sophia was naturally of an excellent disposition, kind, gentle, and cheerful. The supercilious contempt for the rights and feelings of others, and the petulance and bad humor which generally characterized slaveholding ladies, were all quite absent from her manner and bearing toward me. She had never been a slaveholder, a thing then quite unusual at the South, but had depended almost entirely upon her own industry for a living. To this fact the dear lady no doubt owed the excellent preservation of her natural goodness of heart for slavery could change a saint into a sinner and an angel into a demon. I hardly knew how to behave towards Miss Sophia, as I used to call Mrs. Hugh Auld. I could not approach her even as I had formerly approached Mrs. Thomas Auld. Why should I hang down my head and speak with bated breath when there was no pride to scorn me, no coldness to repel me, and no hatred to inspire me with fear? I therefore soon came to regard her as something more akin to a mother than a slave-holding mistress. So far from deeming it impudent in a slave to look her straight in the face, she seemed ever to say, Look up, child, don't be afraid. The sailors belonging to the sloop esteemed it a great privilege to be the bearers of parcels or messages for her, for whenever they came they were sure of a most kind and pleasant reception. If little Thomas was her son, and her most dearly loved child, she made me something like his half-brother in her affections. If dear Tommy was exalted to a place on his mother's knee, Freddy was honored by a place at the mother's side. Nor did the slave boy lack the caressing strokes of her gentle hand, soothing him into the consciousness that, though motherless, he was not friendless. Mrs. Auld was not only kind-hearted, but remarkably pious, frequent in her attendance at public worship, and much given to reading the Bible and to chanting hymns of praise when alone. Mr. Hugh was altogether a different character. He cared very little about religion, knew more of the world and was more a part of the world than his wife. He doubtless set out to be, as the world goes, a respectable man and to get on by becoming a successful shipbuilder in that city of shipbuilding. This was his ambition, and it fully occupied him. I was, of course, of very little consequence to him, and when he smiled upon me, as he sometimes did, the smile was borrowed from his lovely wife, and like borrowed light, was transient and vanished with the source whence it was derived. Though I must in truth characterize Master Hugh as a sour man of forbidding appearance, it is due to him to acknowledge that he was never cruel to me, according to the notion of cruelty in Maryland. During the first year or two, he left me almost exclusively to the management of his wife. She was my lawgiver, 
in hands so tender as hers, and in the absence of the cruelties of the plantation, I became both physically and mentally much more sensitive, and a frown from my mistress caused me far more suffering than had Aunt Katie's hardest cuffs. Instead of the cold, damp floor of my old master's kitchen, I was on carpets. For the corn bag in winter, I had a good straw bed, well furnished with covers. For the coarse corn meal in the morning, I had good bread, and mush occasionally. For my old tow linen shirt, I had good clean clothes. I was really well off. My employment was to run of errands, and to take care of Tommy, to prevent his getting in the way of carriages, and to keep him out of harm's way generally. So for a time everything went well. I say for a time, because the fatal poison of irresponsible power, and the natural influence of slave customs, were not very long in making their impressions on the gentle and loving disposition of my excellent mistress. She at first regarded me as a child like any other. This was the natural and spontaneous thought. Afterwards, when she came to consider me as property, our relations to each other were changed, but a nature so noble as hers could not instantly become perverted, and it took several years before the sweetness of her temper was wholly lost. The frequent hearing of my mistress reading the Bible aloud, for she often read aloud when her husband was absent, awakened my curiosity in respect to this mystery of reading and roused in me the desire to learn. Up to this time I had known nothing whatever of this wonderful art, and my ignorance and inexperience of what it could do for me, as well as my confidence in my mistress, emboldened me to ask her to teach me to read. With an unconsciousness and inexperience equal to my own, she readily consented, and in an incredibly short time, by her kind assistance, I had mastered the alphabet and could spell words of three or four letters. My mistress seemed almost as proud of my progress as if I had been her own child, and supposing that her husband would be as well pleased, she made no secret of what she was doing for me. Indeed, she exultingly told him of the aptness of her pupil and of her intention to persevere, as she felt it her duty to do, in teaching me, at least to read the Bible. And here arose the first dark cloud over my Baltimore prospects, the precursor of chilling blasts and drenching storms. Master Hugh was astounded beyond measure, and probably for the first time proceeded to unfold to his wife the true philosophy of the slave system, and the peculiar rules necessary in the nature of the case to be observed in the management of human chattels. Of course he forbade her to give me any further instruction, telling her in the first place that to do so was unlawful, as it was also unsafe. For, he said, if you give a nigger an inch, he will take an L. Learning will spoil the best nigger in the world. If he learns to read the Bible, it will forever unfit him to be a slave. He should know nothing but the will of his master and learn to obey it. As to himself, learning will do him no good, but a great deal of harm, making him disconsolate and unhappy. If you teach him how to read, he'll want to know how to write, and this accomplished, he'll be running away with himself. Such was the tenor of Master Hugh's oracular exposition, and it must be confessed that he very clearly comprehended the nature and the requirements of the relation of master and slave. His discourse was the first decidedly anti-slavery lecture to which it had been my lot to listen. Mrs. Auld evidently felt the force of what he said, and, like an obedient wife, began to shape her course in the direction indicated by him. The effect of his words on me was neither slight nor transitory. His iron sentences, cold and harsh, sunk like heavy weights deep into my heart, and stirred up within me a rebellion not soon to be allayed. This was a new and special revelation, dispelling a painful mystery against which my youthful understanding had struggled, and struggled in vain, to wit, the white man's power to perpetuate the enslavement of the black man. Very well, thought I, knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. I instinctively assented to the proposition, and from that moment I understood the direct pathway from slavery to freedom. It was just what I needed, and it came to me at a time and from a source whence I least expected it. Of course I was greatly saddened at the thought of losing the assistance of my kind mistress, but the information so instantly derived to some extent compensated me for the loss I had sustained in this direction. Wise as Mr. Auld was, 
He underrated my comprehension, and had little idea of the use to which I was capable of putting the impressive lesson he was giving to his wife. He wanted me to be a slave. I had already voted against that on the home plantation of Colonel Lloyd. That which he most loved I most hated, and the very determination which he expressed to keep me in ignorance only rendered me the more resolute to seek intelligence. In learning to read, therefore, I am not sure that I do not owe quite as much to the opposition of my master as to the kindly assistance of my amiable mistress. I acknowledge the benefit rendered me by the one, and by the other, believing that but for my mistress I might have grown up in ignorance. End of chapter 10 Part 1, Chapter 11 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 11, Growing in Knowledge. I lived in the family of Mr. Auld at Baltimore seven years, during which time, as the almanac makers say of the weather, my condition was variable. The most interesting feature of my history here was my learning, under somewhat marked disadvantages, to read and write. In attaining this knowledge, I was compelled to resort to indirections by no means congenial to my nature, and which were really humiliating to my sense of candor and uprightness. My mistress, checked in her benevolent designs toward me, not only ceased instructing me herself, but set her face as a flint against my learning to read by any means. It is due to her to say, however, that she did not adopt this course in all its stringency at first. She either thought it unnecessary, or she lacked the depravity needed to make herself forget at once my human nature. She was, as I have said, naturally a kind and tender-hearted woman, and in the humanity of her heart and the simplicity of her mind, she set out, when I first went to live with her, to treat me as she supposed one human being ought to treat another. Nature never intended that men and women should be either slaves or slaveholders, and nothing but rigid training long persisted in can perfect the character of the one or the other. Mrs. Auld was singularly deficient in the qualities of a slaveholder. It was no easy matter for her to think or to feel that the curly-headed boy, who stood by her side and even leaned on her lap, who was loved by little Tommy and who loved little Tommy in turn, sustained to her only the relation of a chattel. I was more than that. She felt me to be more than that. I could talk and sing, I could laugh and weep, I could reason and remember, I could love and hate. I was human, and she, dear lady, knew and felt me to be so. How could she then treat me as a brute, without a mighty struggle with all the noblest powers of her soul? That struggle came, and the will and power of the husband were victorious. Her noble soul was overcome, and he who wrought the wrong was injured in the fall no less than the rest of the household. When I went into that household, it was the abode of happiness and contentment. The wife and mistress there was a model of affection and tenderness. Her fervent piety and watchful uprightness made it impossible to see her without thinking and feeling that that woman is a Christian. There was no sorrow nor suffering for which she had not a tear, and there was no innocent joy for which she had not a smile. She had bread for the hungry, clothes for the naked, and comfort for every mourner who came within her reach. But slavery soon proved its ability to divest her of these excellent qualities, and her home of its early happiness. Conscience cannot stand much violence. Once thoroughly injured, who is he who can repair the damage? If it be broken toward the slave on Sunday, it will be toward the master on Monday. It cannot long endure such shocks. It must stand unharmed, or it does not stand at all. As my condition in the family waxed bad, that of the family waxed no better. The first step in the wrong direction was the violence done to nature and to conscience in arresting the benevolence that would have enlightened my young mind. In ceasing to instruct me, my mistress had to seek to justify herself to herself, and once consenting to take sides in such a debate, she was compelled to hold her position. One needs little knowledge of moral philosophy to see where she inevitably landed. She finally became even more violent in her opposition to my learning to read than was Mr. Auld himself. Nothing now appeared to make her more angry than seeing me seated in some nook or corner, quietly reading a book or newspaper. 
She would rush at me with the utmost fury, and snatch the book or paper from my hand, with something of the wrath and consternation which a traitor might be supposed to feel on being discovered in a plot by some dangerous spy. The conviction once thoroughly established in her mind, that education and slavery were incompatible with each other. I was most narrowly watched in all my movements. If I remained in a separate room from the family for any considerable length of time, I was sure to be suspected of having a book, and was at once called to give an account of myself. But this was too late. The first and never to be retracted step had been taken. Teaching me the alphabet had been the inch given. I was now waiting only for the opportunity to take the L. Filled with the determination to learn to read at any cost, I hit upon many expedients to accomplish that much desired end. The plan which I mainly adopted, and the one which was the most successful, was that of using as teachers my young white playmates, with whom I met on the streets. I used almost constantly to carry a copy of Webster's spelling book in my pocket, and when sent of errands or when playtime was allowed me, I would step aside with my young friends and take a lesson in spelling. I am greatly indebted to these boys, Gustavus Dorgan, Joseph Bailey, Charles Faraday, and William Cosdry. Although slavery was a delicate subject, and in Maryland very cautiously talked about among grown-up people, I frequently talked with the white boys about it, and that very freely. I would sometimes say to them, while seated on a curbstone or a cellar door, I wish I could be free as you will be when you get to be men. You will be free, you know, as soon as you are twenty-one, and can go where you like, but I'm a slave for life. Have I not as good a right to be free as you have? Words like these, I observed, always troubled them and I had no small satisfaction in drawing out from them, as I occasionally did, that fresh and bitter condemnation of slavery which ever springs from natures unseared and unperverted. Of all consciences, let me have those to deal with which have not been seared and bewildered with the cares and perplexities of life. I do not remember ever, while I was in slavery, to have met with a boy who defended the system but I do remember many times when I was consoled by them, and by them encouraged to hope that something would yet occur by which I would be made free. Over and over again they have told me that they believed I had as good a right to be free as they had, and that they did not believe God ever made any one to be a slave. It is easily seen that such little conversations with my playfellows had no tendency to weaken my love of liberty, nor to render me contented as a slave. When I was about thirteen years old, and had succeeded in learning to read, every increase of knowledge, especially anything respecting the free states, was an additional weight to the almost intolerable burden of my thought, I am a slave for life. To my bondage I could see no end. It was a terrible reality, and I shall never be able to tell how sadly that thought chafed my young spirit. Fortunately or unfortunately, I had, by blacking boots for some gentleman, earned a little money with which I purchased of Mr. Knight on Thames Street what was then a very popular school book, viz. The Columbian Orator, for which I paid fifty cents. I was led to buy this book by hearing some little boys say that they were going to learn some pieces out of it for the exhibition. This volume was indeed a rich treasure, and, for a time, every opportunity afforded me was spent in diligently perusing it. Among much other interesting matter, that which I read again and again with unflagging satisfaction was a short dialogue between a master and his slave. The slave is represented as having been recaptured in a second attempt to run away, and the master opens the dialogue with an upbraiding speech, charging the slave with ingratitude, and demanding to know what he has to say in his own defense. Thus upbraided and thus called upon to reply, the slave rejoins that he knows how little anything that he can say will avail, seeing that he is completely in the hands of his owner, and with noble resolution calmly says, I submit to my fate. Touched by the slave's answer, the master insists upon his further speaking, and recapitulates the many acts of kindness which he has performed toward the slave, and tells him he is permitted to speak for himself. Thus invited, the quondam slave made a spirited defense of himself, and thereafter the whole argument for and against slavery is brought out. The master was vanquished at every turn in the argument, and appreciating the fact, he generously and meekly emancipates the slave, 
with his best wishes for his prosperity. It is unnecessary to say that a dialogue with such an origin and such an end, read by me when every nerve of my being was in revolt at my own condition as a slave, affected me most powerfully. I could not help feeling that the day might yet come when the well-directed answers made by the slave to the master, in this instance, would find a counterpart in my own experience. This, however, was not all the fanaticism which I found in the Columbian orator. I met there one of Sheridan's mighty speeches on the subject of Catholic emancipation, Lord Chatham's speech on the American War, and speeches by the great William Pitt, and by Fox. These were all choice documents to me, and I read them over and over again, with an interest ever increasing, because it was ever gaining in intelligence. For the more I read them, the better I understood them. The reading of these speeches added much to my limited stock of language, and enabled me to give tongue to many interesting thoughts which had often flashed through my mind and died away for want of words in which to give them utterance. The mighty power and heart-searching directness of truth penetrating the heart of a slaveholder and compelling him to yield up his earthly interests to the claims of eternal justice were finely illustrated in the dialogue, and from the speeches of Sheridan I got a bold and powerful denunciation of oppression and a most brilliant vindication of the rights of man. Here was indeed a noble acquisition. If I had ever wavered under the consideration that the Almighty in some way had ordained slavery and willed my enslavement for his own glory, I wavered no longer. I had now penetrated to the secret of all slavery and of all oppression, and had ascertained their true foundation to be in the pride, the power, and the avarice of man. With a book in my hand so redolent of the principles of liberty, and with a perception of my own human nature, and of the facts of my past and present experience, I was equal to a contest with the religious advocates of slavery, whether white or black, for blindness in this matter was not confined to the white people. I have met, at the South, many good religious colored people who were under the delusion that God required them to submit to slavery, and to wear their chains with meekness and humility. I could entertain no such nonsense as this, and I quite lost my patience when I found a colored man weak enough to believe such stuff. Nevertheless, eager as I was to partake of the tree of knowledge, its fruits were bitter as well as sweet. Slaveholders, thought I, are only a band of successful robbers, who, leaving their own homes, went into Africa for the purpose of stealing and reducing my people to slavery. I loathed them as the meanest and the most wicked of men, and as I read, behold, the very discontent so graphically predicted by Master Hugh had already come upon me. I was no longer the light-hearted, gleesome boy full of mirth and play that I was when I landed in Baltimore. Light had penetrated the moral dungeon where I had lain, and I saw the bloody whip for my back and the iron chain for my feet, and my good, kind master was the author of my situation. The revelation haunted me, stung me, and made me gloomy and miserable. As I writhed under the sting and torment of this knowledge, I almost envied my fellow slaves their stupid indifference. It opened my eyes to the horrible pit, and revealed the teeth of the frightful dragon that was ready to pounce upon me. But alas, it opened no way for my escape. I wished myself a beast, a bird, anything rather than a slave. I was wretched and gloomy beyond my ability to describe. This everlasting thinking distressed and tormented me, and yet there was no getting rid of this subject of my thoughts. Liberty, as the inestimable birthright of every man, converted every object into an asserter of this right. I heard it in every sound, and saw it in every object. It was ever present to torment me with a sense of my wretchedness. The more beautiful and charming were the smiles of nature, the more horrible and desolate was my condition. I saw nothing without seeing it, and I heard nothing without hearing it. I do not exaggerate when I say that it looked at me in every star, smiled in every calm, breathed in every wind, and moved in every storm. I have no doubt that my state of mind had something to do with the change in treatment which my mistress adopted towards me. I can easily believe that my leaden, downcast, and disconsolate look was very offensive to her. Poor lady, she did not understand my trouble, and I could not tell her. Could I have made her acquainted with the real state of my mind, and given her the reasons therefor, 
it might have been well for both of us. As it was, her abuse fell upon me like the blows of the false prophet upon his ass. She did not know that an angel stood in the way. Nature made us friends, but slavery had made us enemies. My interests were in a direct opposition to hers, and we both had our private thoughts and plans. She aimed to keep me ignorant, and I resolved to know, although knowledge only increased my misery. My feelings were not the result of any marked cruelty in the treatment I received. They sprung from the consideration of my being a slave at all. It was slavery, not its mere incidents, that I hated. I had been cheated. I saw through the attempt to keep me in ignorance. I saw that slaveholders would have gladly made me believe that, in making a slave of me and in making slaves of others, they were merely acting under the authority of God, and I felt to them as to robbers and deceivers. The feeding and clothing me well could not atone for taking my liberty from me. The smiles of my mistress could not remove the deep sorrow that dwelt in my young bosom. Indeed, these came in time but to deepen my sorrow. She had changed, and the reader will see that I, too, had changed. We were both victims to the same overshadowing evil, she as mistress, I as slave. I will not censure her harshly. End of chapter 11 Part 1, Chapter 12 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 12 Religious Nature Awakened In the unhappy state of mind described in the foregoing chapter, regretting my very existence because doomed to a life of bondage, and so goaded and wretched as to be even tempted at times to take my own life, I was most keenly sensitive to know any and everything possible that had any relation to the subject of slavery. I was all ears, all eyes, whenever the words slave or slavery dropped from the lips of any white person, and more and more frequently occasions occurred when these words became leading ones in high social debate at our house. Very often I would overhear Master Hugh, or some of his company, speak with much warmth of the abolitionists. Who or what the abolitionists were I was totally ignorant. I found, however, that whoever or whatever they might be, they were most cardinally hated and abused by slaveholders of every grade. I very soon discovered, too, that slavery was, in some sort, under consideration whenever the abolitionists were alluded to. This made the term a very interesting one to me. If a slave had made good his escape from slavery, it was generally alleged that he had been persuaded and assisted to do so by the abolitionists. If a slave killed his master, or struck down his overseer, or set fire to his master's dwelling, or committed any violence or crime out of the common way, it was certain to be said that such a crime was the legitimate fruits of the abolition movement. Hearing such charges often repeated, I, naturally enough, received the impression that abolition, whatever else it might be, was not unfriendly to the slave, not very friendly to the slaveholder. I therefore set about finding out, if possible, who and what the abolitionists were, and why they were so obnoxious to the slaveholders. The dictionary offered me very little help. It taught me that abolition was the act of abolishing, but it left me in ignorance at the very point where I most wanted information, and that was as to the thing to be abolished. A city newspaper, the Baltimore American, gave me the incendiary information denied me by the dictionary. In its columns I found that on a certain day a vast number of petitions and memorials had been presented to Congress, praying for the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia, and for the abolition of the slave trade between the states of the Union. This was enough. The vindictive bitterness, the marked caution, the studied reserve, and the ambiguity practiced by our white folks when alluding to this subject was now fully explained. Ever after that, when I heard the word abolition, I felt the matter one of a personal concern, and I drew near to listen whenever I could do so, without seeming too solicitous and prying. There was hope in those words. Ever and anon, too, I could see some terrible denunciation of slavery in our papers, copied from abolition papers at the North, and the injustice in such denunciation commented on. 
These I read with avidity. I had a deep satisfaction in the thought that the rascality of slaveholders was not concealed from the eyes of the world, and that I was not alone in abhorring the cruelty and brutality of slavery. A still deeper train of thought was stirred. I saw that there was fear as well as rage in the manner of speaking of the abolitionists, and from this I inferred that they must have some power in the country, and I felt that they might perhaps succeed in their designs. When I met with a slave to whom I deemed it safe to talk on the subject, I would impart to him so much of the mystery as I had been able to penetrate. Thus the light of this grand movement broke in upon my mind by degrees, and I must say that ignorant as I was of the philosophy of that movement, I believed in it from the first, and I believed in it partly because I saw that it alarmed the consciences of the slaveholders. The insurrection of Nat Turner had been quelled, but the alarm and terror which it occasioned had not subsided. The cholera was then on its way to this country, and I remember thinking that God was angry with the white people because of their slaveholding wickedness, and therefore his judgments were abroad in the land. Of course, it was impossible for me not to hope much for the abolition movement when I saw it supported by the Almighty and armed with death. Previously to my contemplation of the anti-slavery movement and its probable results, my mind had been seriously awakened to the subject of religion. I was not more than thirteen years old when, in my loneliness and destitution, I longed for someone to whom I could go as to a father and protector. The preaching of a white Methodist minister named Hanson was the means of causing me to feel that in God I had such a friend. He thought that all men, great and small, bond and free, were sinners in the sight of God, that they were by nature rebels against his government, and that they must repent of their sins and be reconciled to God through Christ. I cannot say that I had a very distinct notion of what was required of me, but one thing I did know well, that I was wretched and had no means of making myself otherwise. I consulted a good colored man named Charles Lawson, and in tones of holy affection he told me to pray and to cast all my care upon God. This I sought to do, and, though for weeks I was a poor, broken-hearted mourner, traveling through doubts and fears, I finally found my burden lightened and my heart relieved. I loved all mankind, slaveholders not accepted, though I abhorred slavery more than ever. I saw the world in a new light, and my great concern was to have everybody converted. My desire to learn increased, and especially did I want a thorough acquaintance with the contents of the Bible. I have gathered scattered pages of the Bible from the filthy street gutters, and washed and dried them, that in moments of leisure I might get a word or two of wisdom from them. While thus religiously seeking knowledge, I became acquainted with a good old colored man named Lawson. This man not only prayed three times a day, but he prayed as he walked through the streets, at his work, on his dray, everywhere. His life was a life of prayer, and his words when he spoke to anyone were about a better world. Uncle Lawson lived near Master Hugh's house, and becoming deeply attached to him, I went often with him to prayer meeting and spent much of my leisure time on Sunday with him. The old man could read a little, and I was a great help to him in making out the hard words, for I was a better reader than he. I could teach him the letter, but he could teach me the spirit, and refreshing times we had together in singing and praying. These meetings went on for a long time without the knowledge either of Master Hugh or my mistress. Both knew, however, that I had become religious, and seemed to respect my conscientious piety. My mistress was still a professor of religion, and belonged to class. Her leader was no less a person than Reverend Beverly Waugh, the presiding elder, and afterwards one of the bishops of the Methodist Episcopal Church. In view of the cares and anxieties incident to the life she was leading, and especially in view of the separation from religious associations to which she was subjected, my mistress had, as I have before stated, become lukewarm and needed to be looked up by her leader. This often brought Mr. Waugh to our house, and gave me an opportunity to hear him exhort and pray. But my chief instructor in religious matters was Uncle Lawson. He was my spiritual father, and I loved him intensely, 
and was at his house every chance I could get. This pleasure, however, was not long unquestioned. Master Hugh became averse to our intimacy, and threatened to whip me if I ever went there again. I now felt myself persecuted by a wicked man, and I would go. The good old man had told me that the Lord had great work for me to do, and I must prepare to do it, that he had been shown that I must preach the gospel. His words made a very deep impression upon me, and I verily felt that some such work was before me, though I could not see how I could ever engage in its performance. The good Lord would bring it to pass in his own good time, he said, and that I must go on reading and studying the scriptures. This advice and these suggestions were not without their influence on my character and destiny. He fanned my already intense love of knowledge into a flame by assuring me that I was to be a useful man in the world. When I would say to him, How can these things be, and what can I do? His simple reply was, Trust in the Lord. When I would tell him, I am a slave, and a slave for life, how can I do anything? He would quietly answer, The Lord can make you free, my dear. All things are possible with him. Only have faith in God. Ask, and it shall be given you. If you want liberty, ask the Lord for it in faith, and he will give it to you. Thus assured and thus cheered on under the inspiration of hope, I worked and prayed with a light heart, believing that my life was under the guidance of a wisdom higher than my own. With all other blessings sought at the mercy seat, I always prayed that God would, of his great mercy, and in his own good time, deliver me from bondage. I went one day on the wharf of Mr. Waters, and seeing two Irishmen unloading a scow of stone or ballast, I went on board unasked and helped them. When we had finished the work, one of the men came to me aside and asked me a number of questions, and among them if I were a slave. I told him I was a slave for life. The good Irishman gave a shrug and seemed deeply affected. He said it was a pity so fine a little fellow as I should be a slave for life. They both had much to say about the matter, and expressed the deepest sympathy with me, and the most decided hatred of slavery. They went so far as to tell me that I ought to run away and go to the north, that I should find friends there, and that I should then be as free as anybody. I pretended not to be interested in what they said, for I feared they might be treacherous. White men were not unfrequently known to encourage slaves to escape, and then, to get the reward, they would kidnap them and return them to their masters. While I mainly inclined to the notion that these men were honest and meant me no ill, I feared it might be otherwise. I nevertheless remembered their words and their advice, and looked forward to an escape to the north as a possible means of gaining the liberty for which my heart panted. It was not my enslavement at the then present time which most affected me. The being a slave for life was the saddest thought. I was too young to think of running away immediately. Besides, I wished to learn to write before going, as I might have occasion to write my own pass. I now not only had the hope of freedom, but a foreshadowing of the means by which I might some day gain that inestimable boon. Meanwhile, I resolved to add to my educational attainments the art of writing. After this manner, I began to learn to write. I was much in the shipyard, Master Hughes, and that of Durgan and Bailey, and I observed that the carpenters, after hewing and getting ready a piece of timber to use, wrote on it the initials of the name of that part of the ship for which it was intended. When, for instance, a piece of timber was ready for the starboard side, it was marked with a capital S. A piece for the larboard side was marked L. Larboard forward was marked LF. Larboard aft was marked LA. Starboard aft, SA. And starboard forward, SF. I soon learned these letters and for what they were placed on the timbers. My work now was to keep fire under the steam box and to watch the shipyard while the carpenters had gone to dinner. This interval gave me a fine opportunity for copying the letters named. I soon astonished myself with the ease with which I made the letters, and the thought was soon present, If I can make four letters, I can make more. Having made these readily and easily, when I met boys about the Bethel Church or on any of the playgrounds, I entered the lists with them in the art of writing, 
and would make the letters which I had been so fortunate as to learn, and ask them to beat that if they could. With playmates for my teachers, fences and pavements for my copy books, and chalk for my pen and ink, I learned to write. I, however, adopted afterwards various methods for improving my hand. The most successful was copying the italics in Webster's spelling book until I could make them all without looking on the book. By this time, my little master Tommy had grown to be a big boy and had written over a number of copy books and brought them home. They had been shown to the neighbors, had elicited due praise, and had been laid carefully away. Spending parts of my time both at the shipyard and the house, I was often the lone keeper of the latter as of the former. When my mistress left me in charge of the house, I had a grand time. I got Master Tommy's copy books and a pen and ink, and in the ample spaces between the lines I wrote other lines as nearly like his as possible. The process was a tedious one, and I ran the risk of getting a flogging for marking the highly prized copy books of the oldest son. In addition to these opportunities, sleeping as I did in the kitchen loft, a room seldom visited by any of the family, I contrived to get a flour barrel up there and a chair, and upon the head of that barrel I have written or endeavored to write, copying from the Bible and the Methodist hymn book and other books which I had accumulated till late at night, and when all the family were in bed and asleep. I was supported in my endeavors by renewed advice and by holy promises from the good Father Lawson, with whom I continued to meet and pray and read the scriptures. Although Master Hugh was aware of these meetings, I must say for his credit that he never executed his threats to whip me for having thus innocently employed my leisure time. End of chapter 12 Part 1, Chapter 13 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 13 the vicissitudes of slave life. I must now ask the reader to go back with me a little in point of time, in my humble story, and notice another circumstance that entered into my slavery experience, and which, doubtless, has had a share in deepening my horror of slavery, and of my hostility toward those men and measures that practically uphold the slave system. It has already been observed that though I was, after my removal from Colonel Lloyd's plantation, in form the slave of Master Hugh Auld, I was in fact, and in law, the slave of my old master, Captain Anthony. Very well. In a very short time after I went to Baltimore, my old master's youngest son, Richard, died, and in three years and six months after, my old master himself died, leaving, to share the estate, only his daughter Lucretia and his son Andrew. The old man died while on a visit to his daughter in Hillsborough, where Captain Ald and Mrs. Lucretia now lived. Master Thomas, having given up the command of Colonel Lloyd's sloop, was now keeping store in that town. Cut off thus unexpectedly, Captain Anthony died intestate, and his property must be equally divided between his two children, Andrew and Lucretia. The valuation and division of slaves among contending heirs was a most important incident in slave life. The characters and tendencies of the heirs were generally well understood by the slaves who were to be divided, of whom all had their aversions and their preferences. But neither their aversions nor their preferences availed anything. On the death of old master, I was immediately sent for to be valued and divided with the other property. Personally, my concern was mainly about my possible removal from the home of Master Hugh, for up to this time there had no dark clouds arisen to darken the sky of that happy abode. It was a sad day to me when I left for the eastern shore, to be valued and divided, as it was for my dear mistress and teacher, and for little Tommy. We all three wept bitterly, for we were parting, and it might be we were parting forever." No one could tell amongst which pile of chattels I might be flung. Thus early I got a foretaste of that painful uncertainty which in one form or another was ever obtruding itself in the pathway of the slave. It furnished me a new insight into the unnatural power to which I was subjected. Sickness, adversity, and death may interfere with the plans and purposes of all, 
but the slave had the added danger of changing homes, in the separations unknown to other men. Then, too, there was the intensified degradation of the spectacle. What an assemblage! Men and women, young and old, married and single, moral and thinking human beings, in open contempt of their humanity, leveled at a blow with horses, sheep, horned cattle and swine, horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank in the scale of social existence, and all subjected to the same narrow inspection, to ascertain their value in gold and silver, the only standard of worth applied by slaveholders to their slaves. Personality swallowed up in the sordid idea of property, manhood lost in chattelhood. The valuation over, then came the division and apportionment. Our destiny was to be fixed for life, and we had no more voice in the decision of the question than the oxen and cows that stood chewing at the haymow. One word of the appraisers against all preferences and prayers could sunder all the ties of friendship and affection, even to separating husbands and wives, parents and children. We were all appalled before that power which, to human seeming, could in a moment bless or blast us. Added to this dread of separation, most painful to the majority of the slaves, we all had a decided horror of falling into the hands of Master Andrew, who was distinguished for his cruelty and intemperance. Slaves had a great dread, very naturally, of falling into the hands of drunken owners. Master Andrew was a confirmed sot, and had already by his profligate dissipation wasted a large portion of his father's property. To fall into his hands, therefore, was considered as the first step toward being sold away to the far south. He would no doubt spend his fortune in a few years, it was thought, and his farms and slaves would be sold at public auction, and the slaves hurried away to the cotton fields and rice swamps of the burning south. This was cause of deep consternation. The people of the north, and free people generally, I think, have less attachment to the places where they are born and brought up than had the slaves. Their freedom to come and go, to be here or there, as they list, prevents any extravagant attachment to any one particular place. On the other hand, the slave was a fixture. He had no choice, no goal, but was pegged down to one single spot, and must take root there or nowhere. The idea of removal elsewhere came generally in shape of a threat, and in punishment for crime. It was therefore attended with fear and dread. The enthusiasm which animates the bosoms of young free men, when they contemplate a life in the far west, or in some distant country, where they expect to rise to wealth and distinction, could have no place in the thought of the slave. Nor could those from whom they separated know anything of that cheerfulness with which friends and relations yield each other up, when they feel that it is for the good of the departing one that he is removed from his native place. Then, too, there is correspondence and the hope of reunion, but with the slaves all these mitigating circumstances were wanting. There was no improvement in condition probable, no correspondence possible, no reunion attainable. His going out into the world was like a living man going into the tomb, who, with open eyes, sees himself buried out of sight and hearing of wife, children, and friends of kindred tie. In contemplating the likelihoods and possibilities of our circumstances, I probably suffered more than most of my fellow servants. I had known what it was to experience kind and even tender treatment. They had known nothing of the sort. Life to them had been rough and thorny as well as dark. They had, most of them, lived on my old master's farm in Tuckahoe, and had felt the rigors of Mr. Plummer's rule. He had written his character on the living parchment of most of their backs, and left them seamed and callous. My back, thanks to my early removal to Baltimore, was yet tender. I had left a kind mistress in tears when we parted, and the probability of ever seeing her again, trembling in the balance, as it were, could not fail to excite in me alarm and agony. The thought of becoming the slave of Andrew Anthony, who but a few days before the division had in my presence seized my brother Perry by the throat, dashed him on the ground, and with the heel of his boot stamped him on the head, until the blood gushed from his nose and ears, was terrible. 
this fiendish proceeding had no better apology than the fact that Perry had gone to play when Master Andrew wanted him for some trifling service. After inflicting this cruel treatment on my brother, observing me, as I looked at him in astonishment, he said, "'That's the way I'll serve you one of these days,' meaning, probably, when I should come into his possession. This threat, the reader may well suppose, was not very tranquilizing to my feelings. At last the anxiety and suspense were ended, and ended, thanks to a kind providence, in accordance with my wishes. I fell to the portion of Mrs. Lucretia, the dear lady who bound up my head in her father's kitchen and shielded me from the maledictions of Aunt Katie. Captain Thomas Auld and Mrs. Lucretia at once decided on my return to Baltimore. They knew how warmly Mrs. Hugh Auld was attached to me, and how delighted Tommy would be to see me, and withal, having no immediate use for me, they willingly concluded this arrangement. I need not stop to narrate my joy on finding myself back in Baltimore. I was just one month absent, but the time seemed fully six months. I had returned to Baltimore but a short time when the tidings reached me that my kind friend, Mrs. Lucretia, was dead. She left one child, a daughter, named Amanda, of whom I shall speak again. Shortly after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, Master Andrew died, leaving a wife and one child. Thus the whole family of Anthony's, as it existed when I went to Colonel Lloyd's place, was swept away during the first five years' time of my residence at Master Hugh Auld's in Baltimore. No especial alternation took place in the condition of the slaves in consequence of these deaths, yet I could not help the feeling that I was less secure now that Mrs. Lucretia was gone. While she lived, I felt that I had a strong friend to plead for me in any emergency. In a little book which I published six years after my escape from slavery, entitled Narrative of Frederick Douglass, when the distance between the past then described and the present was not so great as it is now, speaking of these changes in my master's family and their results, I used this language. Now all the property of my old master, slaves included, was in the hands of strangers, strangers who had had nothing to do in its accumulation. Not a slave was left free. All remained slaves, from the youngest to the oldest. If any one thing more than another in my experience has served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery and fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders, it is their base ingratitude to my poor old grandmother. She had served my old master faithfully from youth to old age. She had been the source of all his wealth. She had peopled his plantation with slaves. She had become a great-grandmother in his service. She had rocked him in his infancy, attended him in his childhood, served him through life, and at his death wiped from his icy brow the cold death-sweat, and closed his eyes forever. She was nevertheless a slave, a slave for life, a slave in the hands of strangers, and in their hands she saw her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren divided like so many sheep, and this without being gratified with the small privilege of a single word as to their or her own destiny, and, to cap the climax of their base ingratitude, my grandmother, who was now very old, having outlived my old master and all his children, having seen the beginning and end of them, her present owner, his grandson, finding that she was of but little value, that her frame was already racked with the pains of old age, and that complete helplessness was fast stealing over her once active limbs, took her to the woods, built her a little hut with a mud chimney, and then gave her the bounteous privilege of there supporting herself in utter loneliness, thus virtually turning her out to die. If my poor dear old grandmother now lives, she lives to remember and mourn over the loss of children, the loss of grandchildren, and the loss of great-grandchildren. They are, in the language of Whittier, the slave's poet, Gone, gone, sold and gone, to the rice swamp dank and lone, where the slave whip ceaseless swings, where the noisome insect stings, where the fever demon strews poison with the falling dews where the sickly sunbeams glare through the hot and misty air. Gone, gone, sold and gone, to the rice swamp, dank and lone, 
from Virginia's hills and waters, woe is me, my stolen daughters. The hearth is desolate, the unconscious children who once sang and danced in her presence are gone. She gropes her way, in the darkness of age, for a drink of water. Instead of the voices of her children, she hears by day the moans of the dove, and by night the screams of the hideous owl. All is gloom. The grave is at the door, and now, weighed down by the pains and aches of old age, when the head inclines to the feet, when the beginning and end of human existence meet, and helpless infancy and painful old age combine together, at this time, this most needed time for the exercise of that tenderness and affection which children only can bestow on a declining parent, my poor old grandmother, the devoted mother of twelve children, is left all alone in yonder little hut before a few dim cinders. Two years after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, Master Thomas married his second wife. Her name was Rowena Hamilton, the eldest daughter of Mr. William Hamilton, a rich slaveholder on the eastern shore of Maryland, who lived about five miles from St. Michael's, the then place of Master Thomas Auld's residence. Not long after his marriage, Master Thomas had a misunderstanding with Master Hugh, and, as a means of punishing him, ordered him to send me home. As the ground of the misunderstanding will serve to illustrate the character of Southern chivalry and Southern humanity fifty years ago, I will relate it. Among the children of my Aunt Millie was a daughter named Henny. When quite a child, Henny had fallen into the fire and had burnt her hands so badly that they were of very little use to her. Her fingers were drawn almost into the palms of her hands. She could make out to do something, but she was considered hardly worth the having, of little more value than a horse with a broken leg. This unprofitable piece of property, ill-shapen and disfigured, Captain Ald sent off to Baltimore. After giving poor Henny a fair trial, Master Hugh and his wife came to the conclusion that they had no use for the poor cripple, and they sent her back to Master Thomas. This the latter took as an act of ingratitude on the part of his brother, and, as a mark of his displeasure, required him to send me immediately to St. Michael's, saying, If he cannot keep hen, he shan't have Fred. Here was another shock to my nerves, another breaking up of my plans, and another severance of my religious and social alliances. I was now a big boy. I had become quite useful to several young colored men, who had made me their teacher. I had taught some of them to read, and was accustomed to spend many of my leisure hours with them. Our attachment was strong, and I greatly dreaded the separation. But, with slaves, regrets are unavailing. My wishes were nothing. My happiness was the sport of my master. My regrets at leaving Baltimore now were not for the same reasons as when I before left the city to be valued and handed over to a new owner. A change had taken place, both in Master Hugh and in his once pious and affectionate wife. The influence of brandy and bad company on him, and of slavery and social isolation on her, had wrought disastrously upon the characters of both. Thomas was no longer little Tommy, but was a big boy, and had learned to assume towards me the airs of his class. My condition, therefore, in the house of Master Hugh, was not by any means so comfortable as in former years. My attachments were now outside of our family. They were to those to whom I imparted instruction, and to those little white boys from whom I received instruction. There, too, was my dear old father, the pious Lawson, who was in all the Christian graces the very counterpart of Uncle Tom, the resemblance so perfect that he might have been the original of Mrs. Stowe's Christian hero. The thought of leaving these dear friends greatly troubled me, for I was going without the hope of ever returning again, the feud being most bitter and apparently wholly irreconcilable. In addition to the pain of parting from friends, as I supposed forever, I had the added grief of neglected chances of escape to brood over. I had put off running away until I was now to be placed where opportunities for escape would be much more difficult and less frequent. As we sailed down the Chesapeake Bay, on board the sloop Amanda, to St. Michael's, and were passed by the steamers plying between Baltimore and Philadelphia, I formed many a plan for my future, 
beginning and ending in the same determination, to find some way yet of escape from slavery. End of chapter 13 Part 1, Chapter 14 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 14, Experience in St. Michael's. St. Michael's, the village in which was now my new home, compared favorably with villages and slave states generally, at this time, 1833. There were a few comfortable dwellings in it, but the place as a whole wore a dull, slovenly, enterprise-forsaken aspect. The mass of the buildings were of wood. They had never enjoyed the artificial adornment of paint, and time and storms had worn off the bright color of the wood, leaving them almost as black as buildings charred by a conflagration. St. Michael's had, in former years, enjoyed some reputation as a shipbuilding community but that business had almost entirely given place to oyster-fishing for the Baltimore and Philadelphia markets, a course of life highly unfavorable to morals, industry, and manners. Miles River was broad, and its oyster-fishing grounds were extensive, and the fishermen were, during autumn, winter, and spring, often out all day and a part of the night. This exposure was an excuse for carrying with them, in considerable quantities, spiritous liquors, the then supposed best antidote for cold. Each canoe was supplied with its jug of rum, and tippling among this class of the citizens became general. This drinking habit in an ignorant population fostered coarseness, vulgarity, and an indolent disregard for the social improvement of the place, so that it was admitted by the few sober-thinking people who remained there that St. Michael's was an unsaintly as well as unsightly place. I went to St. Michael's to live in March, 1833. I know the year because it was the one succeeding the first cholera in Baltimore, and was also the year of that strange phenomenon when the heavens seemed about to part with their starry train. I witnessed this gorgeous spectacle and was awestruck. The air seemed filled with bright descending messengers from the sky. It was about daybreak when I saw this sublime scene. I was not without the suggestion at the moment that it might be the harbinger of the coming of the Son of Man, and in my then state of mind I was prepared to hail him as my friend and deliverer. I had read that the stars shall fall from heaven, and they were now falling. I was suffering very much in my mind. It did seem that every time the young tendrils of my affection became attached they were rudely broken by some unnatural outside power, and I was looking away to heaven for the rest denied me on earth. But to my story. It was now more than seven years since I had lived with Master Thomas Auld, in the family of my old master, Captain Anthony, on the home plantation of Colonel Lloyd. I knew him then as the husband of old master's daughter. I had now to know him as my master. All my lessons concerning his temper and disposition and the best methods of pleasing him were yet to be learned. Slaveholders, however, were not very ceremonious in approaching a slave, and my ignorance of the new material in the shape of a master was but transient. Nor was my new mistress long in making known her animus. Unlike Miss Lucretia, whom I remembered with the tenderness which departed blessings leave, Mrs. Rowena Auld was as cold and cruel as her husband was stingy, and possessed the power to make him as cruel as herself, while she could easily descend to the level of his meanness. As long as I lived in Mr. Hugh Auld's family, in whatever changes came over them, there had always been a bountiful supply of food. Now, for the first time in seven years, I realized the pitiless pinchings of hunger. So wretchedly starved were we that we were compelled to live at the expense of our neighbors or to steal from the home larder. This was a hard thing to do, but after much reflection I reasoned myself into the conviction that there was no other way to do, and that after all there was no wrong in it. Considering that my labor and person were the property of Master Thomas, and that I was deprived of the necessaries of life, necessaries obtained by my own labor, it was easy to deduce the right to supply myself with what was my own. It was simply appropriating what was my own to the use of my master, since the health and strength derived from such food were exerted in his service. To be sure, this was stealing, according to the law and gospel I heard from the pulpit, but I had begun to attach less importance to what dropped from that quarter on such points. 
It was not always convenient to steal from master, and the same reason why I might innocently steal from him did not seem to justify me in stealing from others. In the case of my master, it was a question of removal, the taking his meat out of one tub and putting it in another. The ownership of the meat was not affected by the transaction. At first he owned it in the tub, and last he owned it in me. His meat house was not always open. There was a strict watch kept in that point, and the key was carried in Mrs. Auld's pocket. We were oftentimes severely pinched with hunger when meat and bread were moldering under lock and key. This was so when she knew we were nearly half-starved, and yet with saintly air she would each morning kneel with her husband and pray that a merciful God would bless them in basket and store and save them at last in his kingdom. But I proceed with my argument. It was necessary that the right to steal from others should be established, and this could only rest upon a wider range of generalization than that which supposed the right to steal from my master. It was some time before I arrived at this clear right. To give some idea of my train of reasoning, I will state the case as I laid it out in my mind. I am, I thought, not only the slave of Master Thomas, but I am the slave of society at large. Society at large has bound itself, in form and in fact, to assist Master Thomas in robbing me of my rightful liberty, and of the just reward of my labor. Therefore, whatever rights I have against Master Thomas, I have equally against those confederated with him in robbing me of liberty. As society has marked me out as privileged plunder, on the principle of self-preservation, I am justified in plundering in turn. Since each slave belongs to all, all must therefore belong to each. I reasoned further that within the bounds of his just earnings the slave was fully justified in helping himself to the gold and silver and the best apparel of his master, or that of any other slaveholder, and that such taking was not stealing in any just sense of the word. The morality of free society could have no application to slave society. Slaveholders made it almost impossible for the slave to commit any crime known either to the laws of God or to the laws of man. If he stole, he but took his own. If he killed his master, he only imitated the heroes of the revolution. Slaveholders I held to be individually and collectively responsible for all the evils which grew out of the horrid relation, and I believed they would be so held in the sight of God. To make a man a slave was to rob him of moral responsibility. Freedom of choice is the essence of all accountability. But my kind readers are probably less concerned about what were my options than about that which were more nearly touched by my personal experience, albeit my opinions have, in some sort, been the outgrowth of my experience. When I lived with Captain Auld, I thought him incapable of a noble action. His leading characteristic was intense selfishness. I think he was himself fully aware of this fact, and often tried to conceal it. Captain Auld was not born a slaveholder. He was not a birthright member of the slaveholding oligarchy. He was only a slaveholder by marriage right, and of all slaveholders, these were by far the most exacting. There was in him all the love of domination, the pride of mastery, and the swagger of authority. But his rule lacked the vital element of consistency. He could be cruel, but his methods of showing it were cowardly, and evincing his meanness rather than his spirit. His commands were strong, his enforcements weak. Slaves were not insensible to the whole-souled qualities of a generous, dashing slaveholder, who was fearless of consequences, and they preferred a master of this bold and daring kind, even with the risk of being shot down for impudence, to the fretful little soul who never used the lash, but at the suggestion of a love of gain. Slaves, too, readily distinguish between the birthright bearing of the original slaveholder and the assumed attitudes of the accidental slaveholder, and while they could have no respect for either, they despised the latter more than the former. The luxury of having slaves to wait upon him was new to Master Thomas, and for it he was wholly unprepared. He was a slaveholder without the ability to hold or manage his slaves. Failing to command their respect, both himself and wife were ever on the alert, lest some indignity should be offered them by the slaves. It was in the month of August, 1833, when I had become almost desperate under the treatment of Master Thomas, 
and entertained more strongly than ever the oft-repeated determination to run away, that a circumstance occurred which seemed to promise brighter and better days for us all. At a Methodist camp meeting held in the Bay Side, the famous place for camp meetings, about eight miles from St. Michael's, Master Thomas came out with a profession of religion. He had long been an object of interest to the church and to the ministers, as I had seen by the repeated visits and lengthy exhortations of the latter. He was a fish quite worth catching, for he had money and standing. In the community of St. Michael's he was equal to the best citizen. He was strictly temperate, and there was little to do for him in order to give him the appearance of piety and to make him a pillar of the church. Well, the camp meeting continued a week. People gathered from all parts of the country, and two steamboats came loaded from Baltimore. The ground was happily chosen, seats were arranged, a stand erected, and a rude altar fronting the preacher's stand, fenced in with straw in it, making a soft kneeling place for the accommodation of mourners. This place would have held at least one hundred persons. In front and on the sides of the preacher's stand, and outside the long rows of seats, rose the first class of stately tents, each vying with the other in strength, neatness, and capacity for accommodation. Behind this first circle of tents was another, less imposing, which reached around the campground to the speaker's stand. Outside this second class of tents were covered wagons, ox carts, and vehicles of every shape and size. These served as tents for their owners. Outside of these, huge fires were burning in all directions, where roasting and boiling and frying were going on, for the benefit of those who were attending to their spiritual welfare within the circle. Behind the preacher's stand, a narrow space was marked out for the use of the colored people. There were no seats provided for this class of persons, and if the preachers addressed them at all, it was in an aside. After the preaching was over, at every service, an invitation was given to mourners to come forward into the pen, and in some cases ministers went out to persuade men and women to come in. By one of these ministers, Master Thomas was persuaded to go inside the pen. I was deeply interested in that matter, and followed, and though colored people were not allowed either in the pen or in front of the preacher's stand, I ventured to take my stand at a sort of halfway place between the blacks and whites, where I could distinctly see the movements of the mourners, and especially the progress of Master Thomas. If he has got religion, thought I, he will emancipate his slaves, or, if he should not do as much as this, he will at any rate behave towards us more kindly, and feed us more generously than he has heretofore done. Appealing to my own religious experience, and judging my master by what was true in my case, I could not regard him as soundly converted, unless some such good results followed his profession of religion. But in my expectations I was doubly disappointed. Master Thomas was Master Thomas still. The fruits of his righteousness were to show themselves in no such way as I had anticipated. His conversion was not to change his relation toward men, at any rate not toward black men, but toward God. My faith, I confess, was not great. There was something in his appearance that in my mind cast a doubt over his conversion. Standing where I did, I could see his every movement. I watched very narrowly while he remained in the pen and although I saw that his face was extremely red and his hair disheveled, and though I heard him groan, and saw a stray tear halting on his cheek, as if inquiring, Which way shall I go? I could not wholly confide in the genuineness of the conversion. The hesitating behavior of that teardrop and its loneliness distressed me, and cast a doubt upon the whole transaction of which it was a part. But people said, Captain Auld has come through and it was for me to hope for the best. I was bound in charity to do this, for I too was religious, and had been in the church full three years, although now I was not more than sixteen years old. Slaveholders may sometimes have confidence in the piety of some of their slaves, but slaves seldom have confidence in the piety of their masters. He can't go to heaven without blood on his skirts, was a settled point in the creed of every slave one which rose superior to all teachings to the contrary, and stood forever as a fixed fact. The highest evidence of his acceptance with God, which the slaveholder could give the slave, was the emancipation of his slaves. This was proof to us that he was willing to give up all to God, 
and for the sake of God, and not to do this, was, in our estimation, an evidence of hard-heartedness, and was wholly inconsistent with the idea of genuine conversion. I have read somewhere, in the Methodist discipline, the following question and answer. Question. What shall be done for the extirpation of slavery? Answer. We declare that we are as much as ever convinced of the great evil of slavery. Therefore, no slaveholder shall be eligible to any official station in our church. These words sounded in my ears for a long time and encouraged me to hope. But, as I have before said, I was doomed to disappointment. Master Thomas seemed to be aware of my hopes and expectations concerning him. I have thought before now that he looked at me in answer to my glances, as much as to say, I will teach you, young man, that though I have parted with my sins, I have not parted with my sense. I shall hold my slaves and go to heaven too. There was always a scarcity of good nature about the man, but now his whole countenance was soured all over with the seemings of piety, and he became more rigid and stringent in his exactions. If religion had any effect at all on him, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways. Do I judge him harshly? God forbid. Captain Auld made the greatest professions of piety. His house was literally a house of prayer. In the morning and in the evening, loud prayers and hymns were heard there, in which both himself and wife joined. Yet no more nor better meal was distributed at the quarters, no more attention was paid to the moral welfare of the kitchen, and nothing was done to make us feel that the heart of Master Thomas was one whit better than it was before he went into the little pen opposite the preacher's stand on the campground. Our hopes, too, founded on the discipline, soon vanished, for he was taken into the church at once, and before he was out of his term of probation he led in class. He quite distinguished himself among the brethren as a fervent exhorter. His progress was almost as rapid as the growth of the fabled vine of Jack and the Beanstalk. No man was more active in revivals, or would go more miles to assist in carrying them on, and in getting outsiders interested in religion. His house, being one of the holiest in St. Michael's, became the preacher's home. They evidently liked to share his hospitality, for while he starved us, he stuffed them three or four of these ambassadors, not unfrequently being there at a time, and all living on the fat of the land, while we in the kitchen were worse than hungry. Not often did we get a smile of recognition from these holy men. They seemed about as unconcerned about our getting to heaven as about our getting out of slavery. To this general charge I must make one exception, the Reverend George Cookman, Unlike Reverend Messrs. Storks, Ury, Nicky, Humphrey, and Cooper, all of whom were on the St. Michael's circuit, he kindly took an interest in our temporal and spiritual welfare. Our souls and our bodies were alike sacred in his sight, and he really had a good deal of genuine anti-slavery feeling mingled with his colonization ideas. There was not a slave in our neighborhood who did not love and venerate Mr. Cookman. It was pretty generally believed that he had been instrumental in bringing one of the largest slaveholders in that neighborhood, Mr. Samuel Harrison, to emancipate all his slaves, and the general impression about Mr. Cookman was that whenever he met slaveholders, he labored faithfully with them, as a religious duty, to induce them to liberate their bondmen. When this good man was at our house, we were all sure to be called in to prayers in the morning and he was not slow in making inquiries as to the state of our minds, nor in giving us a word of exhortation and of encouragement. Great was the sorrow of all the slaves when this faithful preacher of the gospel was removed from the circuit. He was an eloquent preacher, and possessed what few ministers, south of Mason and Dixon's line, possessed or dared to show, viz., a warm and philanthropic heart. This Mr. Cookman was an Englishman by birth, and perished on board the ill-fated steamship President while on his way to England. But to my experience with Master Thomas after his conversion. In Baltimore, I could occasionally get into a Sabbath school amongst the free children and receive lessons with the rest. But having already learned to read and write, I was more a teacher than a scholar, even there. When, however, I went back to the eastern shore and was at the house of Master Thomas, I was not allowed either to teach or to be taught. The whole community among the whites, with but one exception, 
frowned upon everything like imparting instruction, either to slaves or to free colored persons. That single exception, a pious young man named Wilson, asked me one day if I would like to assist him in teaching a little Sabbath school at the house of a free colored man named James Mitchell. The idea to me was a delightful one, and I told him that I would gladly devote to that most laudable work as many of my Sabbaths as I could command. Mr. Wilson soon mustered up a dozen old spelling books and a few testaments, and we commenced operations with some twenty pupils in our school. Here, thought I, is something worth living for. Here is a chance for usefulness. The first Sunday passed delightfully, and I spent the week after very joyously. I could not go to Baltimore, where was the little company of young friends who had been so much to me there, and from whom I felt parted forever. But I could make a little Baltimore here. At our second meeting, I learned there were some objections to the existence of our school, and surely enough, we had scarcely got to work, good work, simply teaching a few colored children how to read the gospel of the Son of God, when in rushed a mob headed by two class leaders, Mr. Wright Fairbanks and Mr. Garrison West, and with them Master Thomas. They were armed with sticks and other missiles and drove us off, commanding us never again to meet for such a purpose. One of this pious crew told me that as for me, I wanted to be another Nat Turner, and that if I did not look out, I should get as many balls in me as Nat did into him. Thus ended the Sabbath school, and the reader will not be surprised that this conduct, on the part of class leaders and professedly holy men, did not serve to strengthen my religious convictions. The cloud over my St. Michael's home grew heavier and blacker than ever. It was not merely the agency of Master Thomas in breaking up our Sabbath school that shook my confidence in the power of that kind of southern religion to make men wiser or better, but I saw in him all the cruelty and meanness after his conversion which he had exhibited before that time. His cruelty and meanness were especially displayed in his treatment of my unfortunate cousin Henny, whose lameness made her a burden to him. I have seen him tie up this lame and maimed woman and whip her in a manner most brutal and shocking. And then, with blood-chilling blasphemy, he would quote the passage of Scripture. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. He would keep this lacerated woman tied up by her wrists to a bolt in the joist, three, four, and five hours at a time. He would tie her up early in the morning, whip her with a cowskin before breakfast, leave her tied up, go to his store, and return to dinner, repeat the castigation, laying the rugged lash on flesh already raw by repeated blows. He seemed desirous to get the poor girl out of existence, or at any rate off his hands. In proof of this, he afterwards gave her away to his sister Sarah, Mrs. Klein, but as in the case of Mr. Hugh, Henny was soon returned on his hands. Finally, upon a pretense that he could do nothing for her, I use his own words, he set her adrift to take care of herself. Here was a recently converted man, holding with tight grasp the well-framed and able-bodied slaves left him by old master, the persons who in freedom could have taken care of themselves, yet turning loose the only cripple among them virtually to starve and die. No doubt had Master Thomas been asked by some pious northern brother why he held slaves. His reply would have been precisely that which many another slaveholder had returned to the same inquiry, viz., I hold my slaves for their own good. The many differences springing up between Master Thomas and myself, owing to the clear perception I had of his character, and the boldness with which I defended myself against his capricious complaints, led him to declare that I was unsuited to his wants, that my city life had affected me perniciously, that in fact it had almost ruined me for every good purpose, and had fitted me for everything bad. One of my greatest faults, or offenses, was that of letting his horse get away and go down to the farm which belonged to his father-in-law. The animal had a liking for that farm, with which I fully sympathized. Whenever I let it out, it would go dashing down the road to Mr. Hamilton's, as if going on a grand frolic. My horse gone, of course I must go after it. The explanation of our mutual attachment to the place is the same. The horse found good pasturage, and I found there plenty of bread. 
Mr. Hamilton had his faults, but starving his slaves was not one of them. He gave food in abundance and of excellent quality. In Mr. Hamilton's cook, Aunt Mary, I found a generous and considerate friend. She never allowed me to go there without giving me bread enough to make good the deficiencies of a day or two. Master Thomas at last resolved to endure my behavior no longer. He could keep neither me nor his horse. We liked so well to be at his father-in-law's farm. I had lived with him nearly nine months, and he had given me a number of severe whippings, without any visible improvement in my character or conduct, and now he was resolved to put me out, as he said, to be broken. There was, in the bay side, very near the campground where my master received his religious impressions, a man named Edward Covey, who enjoyed the reputation of being a first-rate hand at breaking young Negroes. This Covey was a poor man, a farm renter, and his reputation of being a good hand to break in slaves was of immense pecuniary advantage to him, since it enabled him to get his farm tilled with very little expense compared with what it would have cost him otherwise. Some slaveholders thought it an advantage to let Mr. Covey have the government of their slaves a year or two, almost free of charge, for the sake of the excellent training they had under his management. Like some horse-breakers noted for their skill, who ride the best horses in the country without expense, Mr. Covey could have under him the most fiery bloods of the neighborhood, for the simple reward of returning them to their owners well broken. Added to the natural fitness of Mr. Covey for the duties of his profession, he was said to enjoy religion, and he was as strict in the cultivation of piety as he was in the cultivation of his farm. I was made aware of these traits in his character by some one who had been under his hand, and while I could not look forward to going to him with any degree of pleasure, I was glad to get away from St. Michael's. I believed I should get enough to eat at Covey's, even if I suffered in other respects, and this, to a hungry man, is not a prospect to be regarded with indifference. End of chapter 14 Part 1, Chapter 15 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 15, Covey, the Negro Breaker. The morning of January 1, 1834, with its chilling wind and pinching frost, quite in harmony with the winter in my own mind, found me with my little bundle of clothing on the end of a stick swung across my shoulder, on the main road bending my way toward Covey's, whither I had been imperiously ordered by Master Thomas. He had been as good as his word, and had committed me without reserve to the mastery of that hard man. Eight or ten years had now passed since I had been taken from my grandmother's cabin in Tuckahoe, and these years, for the most part, I had spent in Baltimore, where, as the reader has already seen, I was treated with comparative tenderness. I was now about to sound profounder depths in slave life. My new master was notorious for his fierce and savage disposition, and my only consolation in going to live with him was the certainty of finding him precisely as represented by common fame. There was neither joy in my heart nor elasticity in my frame as I started for the tyrant's home. Starvation made me glad to leave Thomas Auld's, and the cruel lash made me dread to go to Covey's. Escape, however, was impossible, so, heavy and sad, I paced the seven miles which lay between his house and St. Michael's, thinking much by the solitary way of my adverse condition. But thinking was all I could do. Like a fish in a net allowed to play for time, I was now drawn rapidly to the shore and secured at all points. I am, thought I, but the sport of a power which makes no account either of my welfare or of my happiness. By a law which I can comprehend, but cannot evade or resist, I am ruthlessly snatched from the hearth of a fond grandmother and hurried away to the home of a mysterious old master. Again I am removed from there to a master in Baltimore. Thence am I snatched away to the eastern shore to be valued with the beasts of the field, and with them divided and set apart for a possessor. Then I am sent back to Baltimore, 
and by the time I have formed new attachments, and have begun to hope that no more rude shocks shall touch me, a difference arises between brothers, and I am again broken up and sent to St. Michael's. And now from the latter place I am footing my way to the home of another master, where, I am given to understand, like a wild young working animal, I am to be broken to the yoke of a bitter and lifelong bondage. With thoughts and reflections like these, I came in sight of a small wood-colored building, about a mile from the main road, and which, from the description I had received at starting, I easily recognized as my new home. The Chesapeake Bay, upon the jutting banks of which the little wood-colored house was standing, white with foam raised by the heavy northwest wind, Poplar Island, covered with a thick black pine forest, standing out amid this half-ocean, and Keat Point, stretching its sandy, desert-like shores out into the foam-crested bay, were all in sight, and served to deepen the wild and desolate scene. The good clothes I had brought with me from Baltimore were now worn thin, and had not been replaced, for Master Thomas was as little careful to provide against cold as against hunger. Met here by a north wind, sweeping through an open space of forty miles, I was glad to make any port, and therefore I speedily pressed on to the wood-colored house. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Covey, Mrs. Kemp, a broken-backed woman, sister to Mrs. Covey, William Hughes, cousin to Mr. Covey, Caroline the cook, Bill Smith, a hired man, and myself. Bill Smith, Bill Hughes, and myself were the working force of the farm, which comprised three or four hundred acres. I was now for the first time in my life to be a field hand, and in my new employment I found myself even more awkward than a green country boy may be supposed to be upon his first entrance into the bewildering scenes of city life. My awkwardness gave me much trouble. Strange and unnatural as it may seem, I had been in my new home but three days before Mr. Covey, my brother in the Methodist church, gave me a bitter foretaste of what was in reserve for me. I presume he thought that, since he had but a single year in which to complete his work, the sooner he began, the better. Perhaps he thought that by coming to blows at once, we should mutually better understand our relations to each other. But to whatever motive, direct or indirect, the cause may be referred, I have not been in his possession three whole days before he subjected me to a most brutal chastisement. Under his heavy blows, blood flowed freely, and wails were left on my back as large as my little finger. The sores from this flogging continued for weeks, for they were kept open by the rough and coarse cloth which I wore for shirting. The occasion and details of this first chapter of my experience as a field hand must be told, that the reader may see how unreasonable, as well as how cruel, my new master Covey was. The whole thing I found to be characteristic of the man, and I was probably treated no worse by him than had been scores of lads previously committed to him for reasons similar to those which induced my master to place me with him. But here are the facts connected with the affair, precisely as they occurred. On one of the coldest mornings of the whole month of January, 1834, I was ordered at daybreak to get a load of wood from a forest about two miles from the house. In order to perform this work, Mr. Covey gave me a pair of unbroken oxen, for it seemed that his breaking abilities had not been turned in that direction. In due form, and with all proper ceremony, I was introduced to this huge yoke of unbroken oxen, and was carefully made to understand which was Buck and which was Darby which was the in-hand ox and which was the off-hand. The master of this important ceremony was no less a person than Mr. Covey himself, and the introduction was the first of the kind I had ever had. My life hitherto had been quite away from horned cattle, and I had no knowledge of the art of managing them. What was meant by the in-ox as against the off-ox, when both were equally fastened to one cart and under one yoke, I could not very easily divine and the difference implied by the names and the peculiar duties of each were alike Greek to me. Why was not the off-ox called the in-ox? Where and what is the reason for this distinction in names when there is none in the things themselves? After initiating me into the use of the woe, back, gee, lither, 
the entire language spoken between oxen and driver, Mr. Covey took a rope of about ten feet long and one inch thick, and placed one end of it around the horns of the in-hand ox, and gave the other end to me, telling me that if the oxen started to run away, as the scamp knew they would, I must hold on to the rope and stop them. I need not tell anyone who was acquainted with either the strength or the disposition of the untamed ox, that this order was about as unreasonable as a command to shoulder a mad bull. I had never before driven oxen, and I was as awkward a driver as it was possible to conceive. I could not plead my ignorance to Mr. Covey. There was that in his manner which forbade any reply. Cold, distant, morose, with a face wearing all the marks of captious pride and malicious sternness, he repelled all advances. He was not a large man, not more than five feet ten in height, I should think short-necked, round-shouldered, of quick and wiry motion, of thin and wolfish visage, with a pair of small greenish-gray eyes, set well back under a forehead without dignity, and which were constantly in motion, expressing his passions rather than his thoughts, in sight, but denying them utterance in words. The creature presented an appearance altogether ferocious and sinister, disagreeable and forbidding in the extreme. When he spoke, it was from the corner of his mouth, and in a sort of light growl like that of a dog when an attempt is made to take a bone from him. I already believed him a worse fellow than he had been represented to be. With his directions and without stopping to question, I started for the woods, quite anxious to perform in a creditable manner my first exploit in driving. The distance from the house to the woods gate, a full mile, I should think, was passed over with little difficulty, for although the animals ran, I was fleet enough in the open field to keep pace with them, especially as they pulled me along at the end of the rope. But on reaching the woods, I was speedily thrown into a distressing plight. The animals took fright, and started off ferociously into the woods, carrying the cart full tilt against trees, over stumps, and dashing from side to side in a manner altogether frightful. As I held the rope, I expected every moment to be crushed between the cart and the huge trees, among which they were so furiously dashing. After running thus for several minutes, my oxen were finally brought to a stand, by a tree, against which they dashed themselves with great violence, upsetting the cart and entangling themselves among sundry young saplings. By the shock, the body of the cart was flung in one direction, and the wheels and tongue in another and all in the greatest confusion. There I was, all alone in the thick wood to which I was a stranger, my cart upset and shattered, my oxen, wild and enraged, were entangled, and I, poor soul, was but a green hand to set all this disorder right. I knew no more of oxen than the ox-driver is supposed to know of wisdom. After standing a few minutes, surveying the damage, and not without a presentiment that this trouble would draw after it others even more distressing, I took one end of the cart body, and, by an extra outlay of strength, I lifted it toward the axle-tree, from which it had been violently flung. After much pulling and straining, I succeeded in getting the body of the cart in its place. This was an important step out of the difficulty, and its performance increased my courage for the work which remained to be done. The cart was provided with an axe, a tool with which I had become pretty well acquainted in the shipyard at Baltimore. With this I cut down the saplings by which my oxen were entangled, and again pursued my journey, with my heart in my mouth, lest the oxen should again take it into their senseless heads to cut up a caper. But this spree was over for the present, and the rascals now moved off as soberly as though their behavior had been natural and exemplary. On reaching the part of the forest where I had, the day before, been chopping wood, I filled the cart with a heavy load, as a security against another runaway. But the neck of an ox is equal in strength to iron. It defies ordinary burdens. Tame and docile to a proverb, when well trained, when but half broken to the yoke, the ox is the most sullen and intractable of animals. I saw in my own situation several points of similarity with that of the oxen. They were property. So was I. Covey was to break me. I was to break them. Break and be broken was the order. Half of the day was already gone, and I had not yet turned my face homeward. 
It required only two days' experience and observation to teach me that no such apparent waste of time would be lightly overlooked by Covey. I therefore hurried toward home, but in reaching the lane gate I met the crowning disaster of the day. This gate was a fair specimen of southern handicraft. There were two huge posts, eighteen inches in diameter, rough-hued and square, and the heavy gate was so hung on one of these that it opened only about half the proper distance. On arriving here, it was necessary for me to let go the end of the rope on the horns of the in-hand ox, and as soon as the gate was open and I let go of it to get the rope again, off went my oxen, full tilt, making nothing of their load, as, catching the huge gate between the wheel and the cart body, they literally crushed it to splinters and came within a few inches of subjecting me to a similar catastrophe, for I was just in advance of the wheel when it struck the left gate post. With these two hairbreadth escapes, I thought I could successfully explain to Mr. Covey the delay and avert punishment. I was not without a faint hope of being commended for the stern resolution which I had displayed in accomplishing the difficult task, a task which I afterwards learned even Covey himself would not have undertaken without first driving the oxen for some time in the open field, preparatory to their going to the woods. But in this hope I was disappointed. On coming to him, his countenance assumed an aspect of rigid displeasure, and as I gave him a history of the casualties of my trip, his wolfish face, with his greenish eyes, became intensely ferocious. "'Go back to the woods again,' he said, muttering something else about wasting time. I hastily obeyed, but I had not gone far on my way when I saw him coming after me. My oxen now behaved themselves with singular propriety, contrasting their present conduct to my representation of their former antics. I almost wished now that Covey was coming, they would do something in keeping with the character I had given them. But no, they had already had their spree, and they could afford now to be extra good, readily obeying orders, and seeming to understand them quite as well as I did myself. On reaching the woods, my tormentor, who seemed all the time to be remarking to himself upon the good behavior of the oxen, came up to me and ordered me to stop the cart, accompanying the same with the threat that he would now teach me how to break gates and idle away my time when he sent me to the woods. Suiting the action to the words, Covey paced off in his own wiry fashion to a large black gum tree, the young shoots of which are generally used for ox goads, they being exceedingly tough. Three of these goads, from four to six feet long, he cut off and trimmed up with his large jackknife. This done, he ordered me to take off my clothes. To this unreasonable order I made no reply, but in my apparent unconsciousness and inattention to this command, I indicated very plainly a stern determination to do no such thing. If you will beat me, thought I, you shall do so over my clothes. After many threats, which made no impression upon me, he rushed at me with something of the savage fierceness of a wolf, tore off the few and thinly worn clothes I had on, and proceeded to wear out on my back the heavy goads which he had cut from the gum tree. This flogging was the first of a series of floggings, and though very severe, it was less so than many which came after it, and these for offenses far lighter than the gate-breaking. I remained with Mr. Covey one year, I cannot say I lived with him, and during the first six months that I was there, I was whipped, either with sticks or cowskins, every week. Aching bones and a sore back were my constant companions. Frequent as the lash was used, Mr. Covey thought less of it as a means of breaking down my spirit than that of hard and continued labor. He worked me steadily up to the point of my powers of endurance. From the dawn of day in the morning till the darkness was complete in the evening, I was kept hard at work in the field or the woods. At certain seasons of the year we were all kept in the field till eleven and twelve o'clock at night. At these times Covey would attend us in the field and urge us on with words or blows, as it seemed best to him. He had in his life been an overseer, and he well understood the business of slave-driving. There was no deceiving him. He knew just what a man or boy could do, and he held both to strict account. When he pleased, he would work himself like a very Turk, making everything fly before him. 
It was, however, scarcely necessary for Mr. Covey to be really present in the field to have his work go on industriously. He had the faculty of making us feel that he was always present. By a series of adroitly managed surprises, which he practiced, I was prepared to expect him at any moment. His plan was never to approach in an open, manly, and direct manner the spot where his hands were at work. No thief was ever more artful in his devices than this man Covey. He would creep and crawl in ditches and gullies, hide behind stumps and bushes, and practice so much of the cunning of the serpent that Bill Smith and I, between ourselves, never called him by any other name than the snake. We fancied that in his eyes and in his gait we could see a snakish resemblance. One half of his proficiency in the art of negro-breaking consisted, I should think, in this species of cunning. We were never secure. He could see or hear us nearly all the time. He was, to us, behind every stump, tree, bush, and fence on the plantation. He carried this kind of trickery so far that he would sometimes mount his horse and make believe he was going to St. Michael's, and in thirty minutes afterwards you might find his horse tied in the woods and the snake-like covey lying flat in the ditch, with his head lifted above its edge, or in a fence corner, watching every movement of the slaves. I have known him walk up to us and give us special orders as to our work in advance, as if he were leaving home with a view to being absent several days, and before he got halfway to the house he would avail himself of our inattention to his movements to turn short on his heel, conceal himself behind a fence corner or a tree, and watch us until the going down of the sun. Mean and contemptible as is all this, it is in keeping with the character which the life of a slaveholder was calculated to produce. There was no earthly inducement in the slave's condition to incite him to labor faithfully. The fear of punishment was the sole motive of any sort of industry with him. Knowing this fact as the slaveholder did, and judging the slave by himself, he naturally concluded that the slave would be idle whenever the cause for this fear was absent. Hence, all sorts of petty deceptions were practiced to inspire fear. But with Mr. Covey, trickery was natural. Everything in the shape of learning or religion which he possessed was made to conform to this semi-lying propensity. He did not seem conscious that the practice had anything unmanly, base, or contemptible about it. It was with him a part of an important system essential to the relation of master and slave. I thought I saw in his very religious devotions this controlling element of his character. A long prayer at night made up for a short prayer in the morning, and few men could seem more devotional than he when he had nothing else to do. Mr. Covey was not content with the cold style of family worship adopted in the cold latitudes, which begin and end with a simple prayer. No, the voice of praise as well as of prayer must be heard in his house night and morning. At first I was called upon to bear some part in these exercises, but the repeated floggings given me turned the whole thing into mockery. He was a poor singer and relied mainly upon me for raising the hymn for the family, and when I failed to do so he was thrown into much confusion. I do not think he ever abused me on account of these vexations. His religion was a thing altogether apart from his worldly concerns. He knew nothing of it as a holy principle directing and controlling his daily life and making the latter conform to the requirements of the gospel. One or two facts will illustrate his character better than a volume of generalities. I have already implied that Mr. Edward Covey was a poor man. He was, in fact, just commencing to lay the foundation of his fortune, as fortune was regarded in a slave state. The first condition of wealth and respectability there, being the ownership of human property, every nerve was strained by the poor man to obtain it, with little regard sometimes as to the means. In pursuit of this object, pious as Mr. Covey was, he proved himself as unscrupulous and base as the worst of his neighbors. In the beginning he was only able, as he said, to buy one slave, and scandalous and shocking as is the fact, he boasted that he bought her simply as a breeder. But the worst of this is not told in this naked statement. This young woman, Caroline was her name, 
was virtually compelled by Covey to abandon herself to the object for which he had purchased her, and the result was the birth of twins at the end of the year. At this addition to his human stock, Covey and his wife were ecstatic with joy. No one dreamed of reproaching the woman or of finding fault with the hired man, Bill Smith, the father of the children, for Mr. Covey himself had locked the two up together every night, thus inviting the result. But I will pursue this revolting subject no farther. No better illustration of the unchaste, demoralizing, and debasing character of slavery can be found than is furnished in the fact that this professedly Christian slaveholder, amidst all his prayers and hymns, was shamelessly and boastfully encouraging and actually compelling in his own house undisguised and unmitigated fornication as a means of increasing his stock. It was the system of slavery which made this allowable, and which no more condemned the slaveholder for buying a slave woman and devoting her to this life than for buying a cow and raising stock from her, and the same rules were observed, with a view to increasing the number and quality of the one as of the other. If at any one time of my life, more than another, I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that time was during the first six months of my stay with this man, Covey. We worked all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, snow, or hail too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. The longest days were too short for him, and the shortest nights were too long for him. I was somewhat unmanageable at the first, but a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed, my intellect languished, the disposition to read departed, the cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died out, the dark night of slavery closed in upon me, and behold a man transformed to a brute. Sunday was my only leisure time. I spent this under some large tree, in a sort of beast-like stupor between sleeping and waking. At times I would rise up and a flash of energetic freedom would dart through my soul, accompanied with a faint beam of hope that flickered for a moment, and then vanished. I sank down again, mourning over my wretched condition. I was sometimes tempted to take my life and that of Covey, but was prevented by a combination of hope and fear. My sufferings, as I remember them now, seemed like a dream rather than like a stern reality. Our house stood within a few rods of the Chesapeake Bay, whose broad bosom was ever white with sails from every quarter of the habitable globe. Those beautiful vessels, robed in white, and so delightful to the eyes of freemen, were to me so many shrouded ghosts, to terrify and torment me with thoughts of my wretched condition. I have often, in the deep stillness of a summer's Sabbath, stood all alone upon the banks of that noble bay, and traced, with saddened heart and tearful eye, the countless number of sails moving off to the mighty ocean. The sight of these always affected me powerfully. My thoughts would compel utterance, and there, with no audience but the Almighty, I would pour out my soul's complaint in my rude way with an apostrophe to the moving multitude of ships. You are loosed from your moorings and free. I am fast in my chains and am a slave. You move merrily before the gentle gale, and I sadly before the bloody whip. You are freedom's swift-winged angels that fly around the world, I am confined in bonds of iron. Oh, that I were free! Oh, that I were on one of your gallant decks, and under your protecting wing! Alas, betwixt me and you the turbid waters roll. Go on, go on! Oh, that I could also go! Could I but swim, if I could fly? Oh, why was I born a man of whom to make a brute? The glad ship is gone. She hides in the dim distance. I am left in the hell of unending slavery. O oh God, save me. God, deliver me. Let me be free. Is there any God? Why am I a slave? I will run away. I will not stand it. Get caught or get clear. I'll try it. I had as well die with egg as with fever. I have only one life to lose. I had as well be killed running as die standing. Only think of it. One hundred miles north, and I am free. 
Try it? Yes. God helping me, I will. It cannot be that I shall live and die a slave. I will take to the water. This very bay shall yet bear me into freedom. The steamboats steer in a northeast course from North Point. I will do the same, and when I get to the head of the bay, I will turn my canoe adrift and walk straight through Delaware into Pennsylvania. When I get there, I shall not be required to have a pass. I will travel there without being disturbed. Let but the first opportunity offer, and come what will, I am off. Meanwhile, I will try to bear the yoke. I am not the only slave in the world. Why should I fret? I can bear as much as any of them. Besides, I am but a boy yet, and all boys are bound out to someone. It may be that my misery and slavery will only increase my happiness when I get free. There is a better day coming. I shall never be able to narrate half the mental experience through which it was my lot to pass during my stay at Covey's. I was completely wrecked, changed, and bewildered. Goaded almost to madness at one time, and at another, reconciling myself to my wretched condition. All the kindness I had received at Baltimore, all my former hopes and aspirations for usefulness in the world, and even the happy moments spent in the exercises of religion, contrasted with my then present lot, served but to increase my anguish. I suffered bodily as well as mentally. I had neither sufficient time in which to eat or to sleep except on Sundays. The overwork and the brutal chastisements of which I was the victim, combined with that ever-gnawing and soul-devouring thought, I am a slave, a slave for life, a slave with no rational ground to hope for freedom, rendered me a living embodiment of mental and physical wretchedness. End of chapter 15 Part 1, Chapter 16 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 16. Another Pressure of the Tyrant's Vice. The reader has but to repeat in his mind once a week the scene in the woods where Covey subjected me to his merciless lash to have a true idea of my bitter experience during the first six months of the breaking process through which he carried me. I have no heart to repeat each separate transaction. Such a narration would fill a volume much larger than the present one. I aim only to give the reader a truthful impression of my slave life, without unnecessarily affecting him with harrowing details. As I have intimated that my hardships were much greater during the first six months of my stay at Covey's than during the remainder of the year, and as the change in my condition was owing to causes which may help the reader to a better understanding of human nature when subjected to the terrible extremities of slavery, I will narrate the circumstances of this change, although I may seem thereby to applaud my own courage. You have, dear reader, seen me humbled, degraded, broken down, enslaved, and brutalized, and you understand how it was done. Now let us see the converse of all this, and how it was brought about, and this will take us through the year 1834. On one of the hottest days of the month of August of the year just mentioned, had the reader been passing through Covey's farm, he might have seen me at work in what was called the treading yard, a yard upon which wheat was trodden out from the straw by the horse's feet. I was there at work feeding the fan, or rather bringing wheat to the fan, where Bill Smith was feeding. Our force consisted of Bill Hughes, Bill Smith, and a slave by the name of Eli, the latter having been hired for the occasion. The work was simple and required strength and activity rather than any skill or intelligence, and yet to one entirely unused to such work, it came very hard. The heat was intense and overpowering, and there was much hurry to get the wheat trodden out that day, through the fan, since if that work was done an hour before sundown, the hands would have, according to a promise of Covey, that hour added to their night's rest. I was not behind any of them in the wish to complete the day's work before sundown, and hence I struggled with all my might to get it forward. The promise of one hour's repose on a weekday was sufficient to quicken my pace, and to spur me on to extra endeavor. Besides, we had all planned to go fishing, and I certainly wished to have a hand in that. 
but I was disappointed, and the day turned out to be one of the bitterest I ever experienced. About three o'clock, while the sun was pouring down his burning rays, and not a breeze was stirring, I broke down. My strength failed me. I was seized with a violent aching of the head, attended with extreme dizziness and trembling in every limb. Finding what was coming, and feeling that it would never do to stop work, I nerved myself up and staggered on, until I fell by the side of the wheat fan, with a feeling that the earth had fallen in upon me. This brought the entire work to a dead stand. There was work for four, each one had his part to perform, and each part depended on the other, so that when one stopped, all were compelled to stop. Covey, who had become my dread, was at the house, about a hundred yards from where I was fanning, and instantly, upon hearing the fan stop, he came down to the treading yard to inquire into the cause of the interruption. Bill Smith told him that I was sick and unable longer to bring wheat to the fan. I had by this time crawled away in the shade under the side of a post and rail fence, and was exceedingly ill. The intense heat of the sun, the heavy dust rising from the fan, and the stooping to take up the wheat from the yard, together with the hurrying to get through, had caused a rush of blood to my head. In this condition Covey, finding out where I was, came to me, and after standing over me a while, asked what the matter was. I told him as well as I could, for it was with difficulty that I could speak. He gave me a savage kick in the side which jarred my whole frame, and commanded me to get up. The monster had obtained complete control over me, and if he had commanded me to do any possible thing, I should, in my then state of mind, have endeavored to comply. I made an effort to rise, but fell back in the attempt before gaining my feet. He gave me another heavy kick, and again told me to rise. I again tried, and succeeded in standing up, but upon stooping to get the tub with which I was feeding the fan, I again staggered and fell to the ground. I must have so fallen had I been sure that a hundred bullets would have pierced me through as the consequence. While down in this sad condition, and perfectly helpless, the merciless negro breaker took up the hickory slab with which Hughes had been striking off the wheat to a level with the sides of the half bushel measure, a very hard weapon, and with the edge of it he dealt me a heavy blow on my head which made a large gash and caused the blood to run freely, saying at the same time, If you've got the headache, I'll cure you. This done, he ordered me again to rise, but I made no effort to do so for I had now made up my mind that it was useless, and that the heartless villain might do his worst. He could but kill me, and that might put me out of my misery. Finding me unable to rise, or rather despairing of my doing so, Covey left me, with a view to getting on with the work without me. I was bleeding very freely, and my face was soon covered with my warm blood. Cruel and merciless as was the motive that dealt that blow, the wound was a fortunate one for me. Bleeding was never more efficacious. The pain in my head speedily abated, and I was soon able to rise. Covey had, as I have said, left me to my fate, and the question was, shall I return to my work, or shall I find my way to St. Michael's, and make Captain Old acquainted with the atrocious cruelty of his brother Covey, and beseech him to get me another master? Remembering the object he had in view in placing me under the management of Covey, and further, his cruel treatment of my poor crippled cousin Henny, and his meanness in the manner of feeding and clothing his slaves, there was little ground to hope for a favorable reception at the hands of Captain Thomas Old. Nevertheless, I resolved to go straight to him, thinking that, if not animated by motives of humanity, he might be induced to interfere on my behalf from selfish considerations. He cannot, I thought, allow his property to be thus bruised and battered, marred and defaced, and I will go to him about the matter. In order to get to St. Michael's by the most favorable and direct road, I must walk seven miles, and this, in my sad condition, was no easy performance. I had already lost much blood. I was exhausted by overexertion. My sides were sore from the heavy blows planted there by the stout boots of Mr. Covey and I was in every way in an unfavorable plight for the journey. I, however, watched my chance while the cruel and cunning Covey was looking in an opposite direction, and started off across the field for St. Michael's. This was a daring step, 
If it failed, it would only exasperate Covey and increase during the remainder of my term of service under him the rigors of my bondage. But the step was taken, and I must go forward. I succeeded in getting nearly halfway across the broad field toward the woods when Covey observed me. I was still bleeding, and the exertion of running had started the blood afresh. "'Come back! Come back!' he vociferated, with threats of what he would do if I did not instantly return. But disregarding his calls and threats, I pressed on toward the woods as fast as my feeble state would allow. Seeing no signs of my stopping, he caused his horse to be brought out and saddled, as if he intended to pursue me. The race was now to be an unequal one, and thinking I might be overhauled by him if I kept the main road, I walked nearly the whole distance in the woods, keeping far enough from the road to avoid detection and pursuit. But I had not gone far before my little strength again failed me, and I was obliged to lie down. The blood was still oozing from the wound in my head, and for a time I suffered more than I can describe. There I was in the deep woods, sick and emaciated, bleeding and almost bloodless, and pursued by a wretch whose character for revolting cruelty beggars all opprobrious speech. I was not without the fear of bleeding to death. The thought of dying all alone in the woods, and of being torn in pieces by the buzzards, had not yet been rendered tolerable by my many troubles and hardships and I was glad when the shade of the trees and the cool evening breeze combined with my matted hair to stop the flow of blood. After lying there about three-quarters of an hour, brooding over the singular and mournful lot to which I was doomed, my mind passing over the whole scale or circle of belief and unbelief, from faith in the overruling providence of God to the blackest atheism, I again took up my journey toward St. Michael's, more weary and sad than on the morning when I left Thomas Auld's for the home of Covey. I was barefooted, bareheaded, and in my shirt-sleeves. The way was through briars and bogs, and I tore my feet often during the journey. I was full five hours in going the seven or eight miles, partly because of the difficulties of the way, and partly because of the feebleness induced by my illness, bruises, and loss of blood. On gaining my master's store, I presented an appearance of wretchedness and woe calculated to move any but a heart of stone. From the crown of my head to the sole of my feet there were marks of blood. My hair was all clotted with dust and blood, and the back of my shirt was literally stiff with the same. Briars and thorns had scarred and torn my feet and legs. Had I escaped from a den of tigers, I could not have looked worse. In this plight I appeared before my professedly Christian master, humbly to invoke the interposition of his power and authority, to protect me from further abuse and violence. During the latter part of my tedious journey I had begun to hope that my master would now show himself in a nobler light than I had before seen him. But I was disappointed. I had jumped from a sinking ship into the sea. I had fled from a tiger to something worse. I told him, as well as I could, all the circumstances, how I was endeavoring to please Covey, how hard I was at work in the present instance, how unwillingly I sank down under the heat, toil, and pain, the brutal manner in which Covey had kicked me in the side, the gash cut in my head, my hesitation about troubling him, Captain Auld, with complaints, but that now I felt it would not be best longer to conceal from him the outrages committed from time to time upon me. At first Master Thomas seemed somewhat affected by the story of my wrongs, but he soon repressed whatever feelings he may have had, and became as cold and hard as iron. It was impossible at first, as I stood before him, to seem indifferent. I distinctly saw his human nature asserting its conviction against the slave system, which made cases like mine possible. But as I have said, humanity fell before the systematic tyranny of slavery. He first walked the floor, apparently much agitated by my story, and the spectacle I presented. But soon it was his turn to talk. He began moderately, by finding excuses for Covey, and ended with a full justification of him, and a passionate condemnation of me. He had no doubt I deserved the flogging. He did not believe I was sick. I was only endeavoring to get rid of work. My dizziness was laziness, and Covey did right to flog me as he had done. 
After thus fairly annihilating me, and arousing himself by his eloquence, he fiercely demanded what I wished him to do in the case. With such a knockdown to all my hopes, and feeling as I did my entire subjection to his power, I had very little heart to reply. I must not assert my innocence of the allegations he had piled up against me, for that would be impudence. The guilt of a slave was always and everywhere presumed, and the innocence of the slaveholder or employer was always asserted. The word of the slave against this presumption was generally treated as impudence, worthy of punishment. "'Do you dare to contradict me, you rascal?' was a final silencer of counter-statements from the lips of a slave. Calming down a little, in view of my silence and hesitation, and perhaps a little touched at my forlorn and miserable appearance, he inquired again what I wanted him to do. Thus invited a second time, I told him I wished him to allow me to get a new home, and to find a new master, that as sure as I went back to live again with Mr. Covey, I should be killed by him, that he would never forgive my coming home with complaints, that since I had lived with him he had almost crushed my spirit, and I believed he would ruin me for future service, and that my life was not safe in his hands. This Master Thomas, my brother in the church, regarded as nonsense. There was no danger that Mr. Covey would kill me. He was a good man, industrious and religious, and he would not think of removing me from that home. Besides, said he, and this I found was the most distressing thought of all to him, if you should leave Covey now that your year is but half expired, I should lose your wages for the entire year. You belong to Mr. Covey for one year, and you must go back to him, come what will. And you must not trouble me with any more stories, and if you don't go immediately home, I'll get hold of you myself. This was just what I expected when I found he had prejudiced the case against me. But, sir, I said, I am sick and tired, and I cannot get home tonight. At this he somewhat relented, and finally allowed me to stay the night, but said I must be off early in the morning, and concluded his directions by making me swallow a huge dose of Epsom salts, which was about the only medicine ever administered to slaves. It was quite natural for Master Thomas to presume I was feigning sickness to escape work, for he probably thought that were he in the place of a slave, with no wages for his work, no praise for well-doing, no motive for toil but the lash, he would try every possible scheme by which to escape labor. I say I have no doubt of this. The reason is that there were not, under the whole heavens, a set of men who cultivated such a dread of labor as did the slaveholders. The charge of laziness against the slaves was ever on their lips, and was the standing apology for every species of cruelty and brutality. These men did indeed literally bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and laid them upon men's shoulders, but they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers. End of chapter 16 Part 1, Chapter 17 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 17, The Last Flogging Sleep does not always come to the relief of the weary in body and broken in spirit. Especially is it so when past troubles only foreshadow coming disasters. My last hope had been extinguished. My master, who I did not venture to hope would protect me as a man, had now refused to protect me as his property, and had cast me back, covered with reproaches and bruises, into the hands of one who was a stranger to that mercy, which is the soul of the religion he professed. May the reader never know what it is to spend such a night as to me was that which heralded my return to the den of horrors from which I had made a temporary escape. I remained, sleep I did not, all night at St. Michael's, and in the morning, Saturday, I started off, obedient to the order of Master Thomas, feeling that I had no friend on earth, and doubting if I had one in heaven. I reached Covey's about nine o'clock, and just as I stepped into the field, before I had reached the house, true to his snakish habits, Covey darted out at me from a fence corner, in which he had secreted himself for the purpose of securing me. He was provided with a cowskin and a rope, and he evidently intended to tie me up, 
and wreak his vengeance on me to the fullest extent. I should have been an easy prey had he succeeded in getting his hands upon me, for I had taken no refreshment since noon on Friday, and this, with the other trying circumstances, had greatly reduced my strength. I, however, darted back into the woods before the ferocious hound could reach me, and buried myself in a thicket where he lost sight of me. The cornfield afforded me shelter in getting to the woods, but for the tall corn Covey would have overtaken me and made me his captive. He was much chagrined that he did not, and gave up the chase very reluctantly, as I could see by his angry movements as he returned to the house. For a little time I was clear of Covey and his lash. I was in the wood, buried in its somber gloom and hushed in its solemn silence. Hidden from all human eyes, shut in with nature and with nature's God, and absent from all human contrivances, here was a good place to pray, to pray for help, for deliverance, a prayer I had often before made. But how could I pray? Covey could pray. Captain Auld could pray. I would fain pray. But doubts arising, partly from my neglect of the means of grace, and partly from the sham religion which everywhere prevailed, there was awakened in my mind a distrust of all religion and the conviction that prayers were unavailing and delusive. Life in itself had almost become burdensome to me. All my outward relations were against me. I must stay here and starve, or go home to Covey's and have my flesh torn to pieces and my spirit humbled under his cruel lash. These were the alternatives before me. The day was long and irksome. I was weak from the toils of the previous day, and from want of food and sleep, and I had been so little concerned about my appearance that I had not yet washed the blood from my garments. I was an object of horror, even to myself. Life in Baltimore, when most oppressive, was a paradise to this. What had I done, what had my parents done, that such a life as this should be mine? That day in the woods I would have exchanged my manhood for the brutehood of an ox. Night came. I was still in the woods, and still unresolved what to do. Hunger had not yet pinched me to the point of going home, and I laid myself down in the leaves to rest, for I had been watching for hunters all day, but not being molested by them during the day, I expected no disturbance from them during the night. I had come to the conclusion that Covey relied upon hunger to drive me home, and in this I was quite correct, for he made no effort to catch me after the morning. During the night I heard the step of a man in the woods. He was coming toward the place where I lay. A person lying still in the woods in the daytime has the advantage over one walking, and this advantage is much greater at night. I was not able to engage in a physical struggle, and I had recourse to the common resort of the weak. I hid myself in the leaves to prevent discovery. But as the night rambler in the woods drew nearer, I found him to be a friend, not an enemy. A slave of Mr. William Grooms of Easton, a kind-hearted fellow named Sandy. Sandy lived that year with Mr. Kemp, about four miles from St. Michael's. He, like myself, had been hired out, but unlike myself, had not been hired out to be broken. He was the husband of a free woman who lived in the lower part of Poppy Neck, and he was now on his way through the woods to see her and to spend the Sabbath with her. As soon as I had ascertained that the disturber of my solitude was not an enemy, but the good-hearted Sandy, a man as famous among the slaves of the neighborhood for his good nature as for his good sense, I came out from my hiding place and made myself known to him. I explained the circumstances of the past two days which had driven me to the woods, and he deeply compassionated my distress. It was a bold thing for him to shelter me, and I could not ask him to do so, for had I been found in his hut he would have suffered the penalty of thirty-nine lashes on his bare back, if not something worse. But Sandy was too generous to permit the fear of punishment to prevent his relieving a brother bondman from hunger and exposure, and therefore, on his own motion, I accompanied him home to his wife, for the house and lot were hers, and she was a free woman. It was about midnight, but his wife was called up, a fire was made, some Indian meal was soon mixed with salt and water, and an ash cake was baked in a hurry to relieve my hunger. Sandy's wife was not behind him in kindness. Both seemed to esteem it a privilege to succor me, 
for although I was hated by Covey and by my master, I was loved by the colored people, because they thought I was hated for my knowledge, and persecuted because I was feared. I was the only slave in that region who could read or write. There had been one other man, belonging to Mr. Hugh Hamilton, who could read, but he, poor fellow, had, shortly after coming into the neighborhood, been sold off to the far south. I saw him in the cart, to be carried to Easton for sale, ironed and pinioned like a yearling for slaughter. My knowledge was now the pride of my brother's slaves, and no doubt Sandy felt on that account something of the general interest in me. The supper was soon ready, and though over the sea I have since feasted with honorables, lord mayors, and aldermen, my supper on ash cake and cold water with Sandy was the meal of all my life, most sweet to my taste, and now most vivid to my memory. Supper over, Sandy and I went into a discussion of what was possible for me under the perils and hardships which overshadowed my path. The question was, must I go back to Covey, or must I attempt to run away? Upon a careful survey, the latter was found to be impossible, for I was on a narrow neck of land, every avenue from which would bring me in sight of pursuers. There was Chesapeake Bay to the right, and Pot Pie River to the left, and St. Michael's and its neighborhood occupied the only space through which there was any retreat. I found Sandy an old advisor. He was not only a religious man, but he professed to believe in a system for which I have no name. He was a genuine African, and had inherited some of the so-called magical powers said to be possessed by the Eastern nations. He told me that he could help me, that in those very woods there was an herb which in the morning might be found, possessing all the powers required for my protection, I put his words in my own language, and that if I would take his advice he would procure me the root of the herb of which he spoke. He told me further that if I would take that root and wear it on my right side it would be impossible for Covey to strike me a blow, and that with this root about my person no white man could whip me. He said he had carried it for years, and that he had fully tested its virtues. He had never received a blow from a slaveholder since he carried it, and he never expected to receive one, for he meant always to carry that root for protection. He knew Covey well, for Mrs. Covey was the daughter of Mrs. Kemp, and he, Sandy, had heard of the barbarous treatment to which I had been subjected, and he wanted to do something for me. Now all this talk about the root was to me very absurd and ridiculous, if not positively sinful. I at first rejected the idea that the simple carrying a root on my right side, a root, by the way, over which I walked every time I went into the woods, could possess any such magic power as he ascribed to it, and I was, therefore, not disposed to cumber my pocket with it. I had a positive aversion to all pretenders to divination, it was beneath one of my intelligence to countenance such dealings with the devil as this power implied. But with all my learning, it was really precious little. Sandy was more than a match for me. My book learning, he said, had not kept Covey off me. A powerful argument just then. And he entreated me, with flashing eyes, to try this. If it did me no good, it could do me no harm. And it would cost me nothing anyway. Sandy was so earnest and so confident of the good qualities of this weed that, to please him, I was induced to take it. He had been to me the good Samaritan, and had, almost providentially, found me and helped me when I could not help myself. How did I know but that the hand of the Lord was in it? With thoughts of this sort, I took the roots from Sandy and put them in my right-hand pocket. This was, of course, Sunday morning. Sandy now urged me to go home with all speed, and to walk up bravely to the house as though nothing had happened. I saw in Sandy, with all his superstition, too deep an insight into human nature not to have some respect for his advice. And, perhaps, too, a slight gleam or shadow of his superstition had fallen on me. At any rate, I started off toward Covey's, as directed. Having the previous night poured my griefs into Sandy's ears and enlisted him in my behalf, having made his wife a sharer in my sorrows, and having also become well refreshed by sleep and food, I moved off quite courageously toward the dreaded coveys. Singularly enough, 
Just as I entered the yard gate, I met him and his wife on their way to church, dressed in their Sunday best, and looking as smiling as angels. His manner perfectly astonished me. There was something really benignant in his countenance. He spoke to me as never before, told me that the pigs had got into the lot, and he wished me to go to drive them out, inquired how I was, and seemed an altered man. This extraordinary conduct really made me begin to think that Sandy's herb had more virtue in it than I, in my pride, had been willing to allow, and, had the day been other than Sunday, I should have attributed Covey's altered manner solely to the power of the root. I suspected, however, that the Sabbath, not the root, was the real explanation of the change. His religion hindered him from breaking the Sabbath, but not from breaking my skin on any other day than Sunday. He had more respect for the day than for the man for whom the day was mercifully given. For while he would cut and slash my body during the week, he would on Sunday teach me the value of my soul and the way of life and salvation by Jesus Christ. All went well with me till Monday morning, and then, whether the root had lost its virtue, or whether my tormentor had gone deeper into the black art than I had, as was sometimes said of him, or whether he had obtained a special indulgence for his faithful Sunday's worship, it is not necessary for me to know or to inform the reader. But this much I may say, the pious and benignant smile which graced the face of Covey on Sunday wholly disappeared on Monday. Long before daylight I was called up to go feed, rub, and curry the horses. I obeyed the call, as I should have done had it been made at an earlier hour, for I had brought my mind to a firm resolve during that Sunday's reflection to obey every order, however unreasonable, if it were possible, and if Mr. Covey should then undertake to beat me to defend and protect myself to the best of my ability. My religious views on the subject of resisting my master had suffered a serious shock by the savage persecution to which I had been subjected, and my hands were no longer tied by my religion. Master Thomas's indifference had severed the last link. I had backslidden from this point in the slave's religious creed, and I soon had occasion to make my fallen state known to my Sunday pious brother, Covey. While I was obeying his order to feed and get the horses ready for the field, and when I was in the act of going up to the stable loft for the purpose of throwing down some blades, Covey sneaked into the stable in his peculiar way, and seizing me suddenly by the leg, he brought me to the stable floor, giving my newly mended body a terrible jar. I now forgot all about my roots, and remembered my pledge to stand up in my own defense. The brute was skillfully endeavoring to get a slipknot on my legs before I could draw up my feet. As soon as I found what he was up to, I gave a sudden spring. My two days' rest had been of much service to me, and by that means, no doubt, he was able to bring me to the floor so heavily. He was defeated in his plan of tying me. While down, he seemed to think that he had me very securely in his power. He little thought he was, as the rowdies say, in for a rough-and-tumble fight. But such was the fact. Whence came the daring spirit necessary to grapple with a man who, eight and forty hours before, could, with his slightest word, have made me tremble like a leaf in a storm, I do not know. At any rate, I was resolved to fight, and what was better still, I actually was hard at it. The fighting madness had come upon me, and I found my strong fingers firmly attached to the throat of the tyrant as heedless of consequences at the moment, as if we stood as equals before the law. The very color of the man was forgotten. I felt supple as a cat, and was ready for him at every turn. Every blow of his was parried, though I dealt no blows in return. I was strictly on the defensive, preventing him from injuring me, rather than trying to injure him. I flung him on the ground several times when he meant to have hurled me there. I held him so firmly by the throat that his blood followed my nails. He held me, and I held him. All was fair thus far, and the contest was about equal. My resistance was entirely unexpected, and Covey was taken all aback by it. He trembled in every limb. "'Are you going to resist, you scoundrel?' said he, to which I returned a polite, "'Yes, sir,' steadily gazing my interrogator in the eye to meet the first approach or dawning of the blow which I expected my answer would call forth. 
But the conflict did not long remain equal. Covey soon cried lustily for help, not that I was obtaining any marked advantage over him, or was injuring him, but because he was gaining none over me, and was not able, single-handed, to conquer me. He called for his cousin Hughes to come to his assistance, and now the scene was changed. I was compelled to give blows as well as to parry them, and since I was in any case to suffer for resistance, I felt, as the musty proverb goes, that I might as well be hanged for an old sheep as a lamb. I was still defensive toward Covey, but aggressive toward Hughes, on whom, at his first approach, I dealt a blow which fairly sickened him. He went off, bending over with pain, and manifesting no disposition to come again within my reach. The poor fellow was in the act of trying to catch and time my right hand, and while flattering himself with success, I gave him the kick which sent him staggering away in pain, at the same time that I held Covey with a firm hand. Taken completely by surprise, Covey seemed to have lost his usual strength and coolness. He was frightened, and stood puffing and blowing, seemingly unable to command words or blows. When he saw that Hughes was standing half-bent with pain, his courage quite gone, the cowardly tyrant asked if I meant to persist in my resistance. I told him I did mean to resist, come what might, that I had been treated like a brute during the last six months, and that I should stand it no longer. With that, he gave me a shake, and attempted to drag me toward a stick of wood that was lying just outside the stable door. He meant to knock me down with it, but just as he leaned over to get the stick, I seized him with both hands, by the collar, and with a vigorous and sudden snatch, brought my assailant harmlessly his full length on the not over-clean ground, for we were now in the cow-yard. He had selected the place for the fight, and it was but right that he should have all the advantages of his own selection. By this time Bill, the hired man, came home. He had been to Mr. Helmsley's to spend Sunday with his nominal wife. Covey and I had been skirmishing from before daybreak till now. The sun was shooting his beams almost over the eastern woods, and we were still at it. I could not see where the matter was to terminate. He evidently was afraid to let me go, lest I should again make off to the woods. Otherwise, he would probably have obtained arms from the house to frighten me. Holding me, he called upon Bill to assist him. The scene here had something comic about it. Bill, who knew precisely what Covey wished him to do, affected ignorance, and pretended he did not know what to do. "'What shall I do, Master Covey?' said Bill. "'Take a hold of him! Take a hold of him!' cried Covey. With a toss of his head, peculiar to Bill, he said, "'Indeed, Master Covey, I want to go to work.' "'This is your work,' said Covey. "'Take hold of him!' Bill replied with spirit, "'My master hired me here to work, and not to help you whip Frederick.' It was my turn to speak. "'Bill,' said I, "'don't put your hands on me,' to which he replied, "'My God, Frederick, I ain't going to touch ye.' And Bill walked off, leaving Covey and myself to settle our differences as best we might. But my present advantage was threatened when I saw Caroline, the slave woman of Covey, coming to the cow-yard to milk, for she was a powerful woman, and could have mastered me easily, exhausted as I was. As soon as she came near, Covey attempted to rally her to his aid. Strangely and fortunately, Caroline was in no humor to take a hand in any such sport. We were all in open rebellion that morning. Caroline answered the command of her master to take hold of me, precisely as Bill had done, but in her it was at far greater peril, for she was the slave of Covey, and he could do what he pleased with her. It was not so with Bill, and Bill knew it. Samuel Harris, to whom Bill belonged, did not allow his slaves to be beaten unless they were guilty of some crime which the law would punish. But poor Caroline, like myself, was at the mercy of the merciless Covey, nor did she escape the dire effects of her refusal. He gave her several sharp blows. At length, two hours had elapsed, the contest was given over. Letting go of me, puffing and blowing at a great rate, Covey said, now, you scoundrel, go to your work. I would not have whipped you half so hard if you had not resisted. The fact was, he had not whipped me at all. He had not, in all the scuffle, drawn a single drop of blood from me. 
I had drawn blood from him, and should even, without this satisfaction, have been victorious, because my aim had not been to injure him, but to prevent his injuring me. During the whole six months that I lived with Covey after this transaction, he never again laid the weight of his finger on me in anger. He would occasionally say he did not want to have to get hold of me again, a declaration which I had no difficulty in believing, and I had a secret feeling which answered, You had better not wish to get hold of me again, for you will be likely to come off worse in a second fight than you did in the first. This battle with Mr. Covey, undignified as it was, and as I fear my narration of it is, was the turning point in my life as a slave. It rekindled in my breast the smoldering embers of liberty. It brought up my Baltimore dreams and revived a sense of my own manhood. I was a changed being after that fight. I was nothing before. I was a man now. It recalled to life my crushed self-respect and my self-confidence, and inspired me with a renewed determination to be a free man. A man without force is without the essential dignity of humanity. Human nature is so constituted that it cannot honor a helpless man, though it can pity him, and even this it cannot do long if signs of power do not arise. He only can understand the effect of this combat on my spirit, who has himself incurred something, or hazarded something, in repelling the unjust and cruel aggressions of a tyrant. Covey was a tyrant and a cowardly one withal. After resisting him, I felt as I had never felt before. It was a resurrection from the dark and pestiferous tomb of slavery to the heaven of comparative freedom. I was no longer a servile coward, trembling under the frown of a brother worm of the dust, but my long cowed spirit was roused to an attitude of independence. I had reached the point at which I was not afraid to die. This spirit made me a free man in fact, though I still remained a slave in form. When a slave cannot be flogged, he is more than half free. He has a domain as broad as his own manly heart to defend, and he is really a power on earth. From this time until my escape from slavery, I was never fairly whipped. Several attempts were made, but they were always unsuccessful. Bruised I did get, but the instance I have described was the end of the brutifaction to which slavery had subjected me. The reader may like to know why, after I had so grievously offended Mr. Covey, he did not have me taken in hand by the authorities. Indeed, why the law of Maryland, which assigned hanging to the slave who resisted his master, was not put in force against me. At any rate, why I was not taken up, as was usual in such cases, and publicly whipped as an example to other slaves, and as a means of deterring me from again committing the same offense. I confess that the easy manner in which I got off was always a surprise to me, and even now I cannot fully explain the cause, though the probability is that Covey was ashamed to have it known that he had been mastered by a boy of sixteen. He enjoyed the unbounded and very valuable reputation of being a first-rate overseer and negro-breaker, and by means of this reputation he was able to procure his hands at very trifling compensation and with very great ease. His interest and his pride would mutually suggest the wisdom of passing the matter by in silence. The story that he had undertaken to whip a lad and had been resisted would have itself been damaging to him in the estimation of slaveholders. It is perhaps not altogether creditable to my natural temper that after this conflict with Mr. Covey I did at times purposely aim to provoke him to an attack by refusing to keep with the other hands in the field, but I could never bully him to another battle. I was determined on doing him serious damage if he ever again attempted to lay violent hands on me. Hereditary bondmen, know ye not, who would be free, themselves must strike the blow. End of chapter 17 Part 1, Chapter 18 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1, Chapter 18 New Relations and Duties My term of service with Edward Covey expired on Christmas Day, 1834. 
I gladly enough left him, although he was by this time as gentle as a lamb. My home for the year 1835 was already secured, my next master selected. There was always more or less excitement about the changing of hands, but determined to fight my way, I had become somewhat reckless, and cared little into whose hands I fell. The report got abroad that I was hard to whip, that I was guilty of kicking back, and that, though generally a good-natured negro, I sometimes got the devil in me. These sayings were rife in Talbot County, and distinguished me among my servile brethren. Slaves would sometimes fight with each other, and even die at each other's hands, but there were very few who were not held in awe by a white man. Trained from the cradle up to think and feel that their masters were superiors, and invested with a sort of sacredness, there were few who could rise above the control which that sentiment exercised. I had freed myself from it, and the thing was known. One bad sheep will spoil a whole flock. I was a bad sheep. I hated slavery, slaveholders, and all pertaining to them, and I did not fail to inspire others with the same feeling wherever and whenever opportunity was presented. This made me a marked lad among the slaves, and a suspected one among slaveholders. A knowledge also of my ability to read and write got pretty widely spread, which was very much against me. The days between Christmas Day and New Year's were allowed the slaves as holidays. During these days all regular work was suspended, and there was nothing to do but to keep fires and look after the stock. We regarded this time as our own by the grace of our masters, and we therefore used it or abused it as we pleased. Those who had families at a distance were expected to visit them and spend with them the entire week. The younger slaves or the unmarried ones were expected to see to the animals and attend to incidental duties at home. The holidays were variously spent. The sober, thinking, industrious ones would employ themselves in manufacturing corn brooms, mats, horse collars, and baskets, and some of these were very well made. Another class spent their time in hunting opossums, coons, rabbits, and other game. But the majority spent the holidays in sports, ball-playing, wrestling, boxing, running, foot races, dancing, and drinking whiskey. And this latter mode was generally most agreeable to their masters. A slave who would work during the holidays was thought by his master undeserving of holidays. There was in this simple act of continued work an accusation against slaves, and a slave could not help thinking that if he made three dollars during the holidays, he might make three hundred during the year. Not to be drunk during the holidays was disgraceful. The fiddling, dancing, and jubilee beating was carried on in all directions. This latter performance was strictly southern. It supplied the place of violin and other musical instruments, and was played so easily that almost every farm had its juba beater. The performer improvised as he beat the instrument, marking the words as he sang so as to have them fall pat with the movement of his hands. Once in a while, among a mass of nonsense and wild frolic, a sharp hit was given to the meanness of slaveholders. Take the following, for example. We raise de wheat, they give us de corn, we bake de bread, they give us de crust, we sift de meal, they give us de hus, we peel de meat, they give us de skin, and that's de way they take us in, we skim de pot, they give us de liquor, and say that's good enough for nigger. Walk over, walk over, your butter and de fat, poor nigger, you can't get over that. Walk over. This is not a bad summary of the palpable injustice and fraud of slavery, giving, as it does, to the lazy and idle the comforts which God designed should be given solely to the honest laborer, but to the holidays. Judging from my own observation and experience, I believe those holidays were among the most effective means in the hands of slaveholders of keeping down the spirit of insurrection among the slaves. To enslave men successfully and safely, it is necessary to keep their minds occupied with thoughts and aspirations short of the liberty of which they are deprived. A certain degree of attainable good must be kept before them. These holidays served the purpose of keeping the minds of the slaves occupied with prospective pleasure within the limits of slavery. 
the young man could go wooing, the married man to see his wife, the father and mother to see their children, the industrious and money-loving could make a few dollars, the great wrestler could win laurels, the young people meet and enjoy each other's society, the drinking man could get plenty of whiskey, and the religious man could hold prayer meetings, preach, pray, and exhort. Before the holidays there were pleasures in prospect. After the holidays they were pleasures of memory, and they served to keep out thoughts and wishes of a more dangerous character. These holidays were also used as conductors or safety valves to carry off the explosive elements inseparable from the human mind when reduced to the condition of slavery. But for these the rigors of bondage would have become too severe for endurance, and the slave would have been forced to a dangerous desperation. Thus they became a part and parcel of the gross wrongs and inhumanity of slavery. Ostensibly, they were institutions of benevolence designed to mitigate the rigors of slave life. But practically, they were a fraud instituted by human selfishness, the better to secure the ends of injustice and oppression. Not the slave's happiness, but the master's safety, was the end sought. It was not from a generous unconcern for the slave's labor, but from a prudent regard for the slave system. I am strengthened in this opinion from the fact that most slaveholders liked to have their slaves spend the holidays in such manner as to be of no real benefit to them. Everything like rational enjoyment was frowned upon, and only those wild and low sports peculiar to semi-civilized people were encouraged. The license allowed appeared to have no other object than to disgust the slaves with their temporary freedom, and to make them as glad to return to their work as they had been to leave it. I have known slaveholders resort to cunning tricks, with a view of getting their slaves deplorably drunk. The usual plan was to make bets on a slave that he could drink more whiskey than any other, and so induce a rivalry among them for the mastery in this degradation. The scenes brought about in this way were often scandalous and loathsome in the extreme. Whole multitudes might be found stretched out in brutal drunkenness, at once helpless and disgusting. Thus, when the slave asked for hours of virtuous liberty, his cunning master took advantage of his ignorance and cheered him with a dose of vicious and revolting dissipation, artfully labeled with the name of liberty. We were induced to drink, I among the rest, and when the holidays were over, we all staggered up from our filth and wallowing, took a long breath, and went away to our various fields of work, feeling, upon the whole, rather glad to go from that which our masters had artfully deceived us into the belief was freedom, back again to the arms of slavery. It was not what we had taken it to be, nor what it would have been, had it not been abused by us. It was about as well to be a slave to master as to be a slave to whiskey and rum. When the slave was drunk, the slaveholder had no fear that he would plan an insurrection, or that he would escape to the north. It was the sober, thoughtful slave who was dangerous and needed the vigilance of his master to keep him a slave. On the 1st of January, 1835, I proceeded from St. Michael's to Mr. William Freeland's, my new home. Mr. Freeland lived only three miles from St. Michael's on an old worn-out farm, which required much labor to render it anything like a self-supporting establishment. I found Mr. Freeland a different man from Covey. Though not rich, he was what might have been called a well-bred southern gentleman. Though a slaveholder, and sharing in common with them many of the vices of his class, he seemed alive to the sentiment of honor, and had also some sense of justice and some feelings of humanity. He was fretful, impulsive, and passionate, but free from the mean and selfish characteristics which distinguished the creature from which I had happily escaped. Mr. Freeland was open, frank, and imperative. He practiced no concealments and disdained to play the spy. He was, in all these qualities, the opposite of Covey. My poor weather-beaten bark now reached smoother water and gentler breezes. My stormy life at Covey's had been of service to me. The thing that would have seemed very hard had I gone directly to Mr. Freeland's from the home of Master Thomas were now trifles as light as air. 
I was still a field hand, and had come to prefer the severe labor of the field to the enervating duties of a house servant. I had become large and strong, and had begun to take pride in the fact that I could do as much hard work as some of the older men. There was much rivalry among slaves at times as to which could do the most work, and masters generally sought to promote such rivalry. But some of us were too wise to race with each other very long. Such racing, we had the sagacity to see, was not likely to pay. We had our times for measuring each other's strength, but we knew too much to keep up the competition so long as to produce an extraordinary day's work. We knew that if, by extraordinary exertion, a large quantity of work was done in one day, and it became known to the master, it might lead him to require the same amount every day. This thought was enough to bring us to a dead halt when ever so much excited for the race. At Mr. Freeland's, my condition was every way improved. I was no longer the scapegoat that I was when at Covey's, where every wrong thing done was saddled upon me and where other slaves were whipped over my shoulders. Bill Smith was protected by a positive prohibition made by his rich master, and the command of the rich slaveholder was law to the poor one. Hughes was favored by his relationship to Covey, and the hands hired temporarily escaped flogging. I was the general pack horse, but Mr. Freeland held every man individually responsible for his own conduct. Mr. Freeland, like Mr. Covey, gave his hands enough to eat, but, unlike Mr. Covey, he gave them time to take their meals. He worked us hard during the day, but gave us the night for rest. We were seldom in the field after dark in the evening, or before sunrise in the morning. Our implements of husbandry were of the most improved pattern, and much superior to those used at Covey's. Notwithstanding all the improvement in my relations, Notwithstanding the many advantages I had gained by my new home and my new master, I was still restless and discontented. I was about as difficult to be pleased by a master as a master is by a slave. The freedom from bodily torture and unceasing labor had given my mind an increased sensibility and imparted to it greater activity. I was not yet exactly in right relations. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. When entombed at Covey's, and shrouded in darkness and physical wretchedness, temporal well-being was the grand desideratum. But, temporal wants supplied, the spirit put in its claims. Beat and cuff the slave, keep him hungry and spiritless, and he will follow the chain of his master like a dog. But feed and clothe him well, work him moderately, and surround him with physical comfort, and dreams of freedom will intrude. Give him a bad master, and he aspires to a good master. Give him a good master, and he wishes to become his own master. Such is human nature. You may hurl a man so low beneath the level of his kind that he loses all just ideas of his natural position, but elevate him a little, and the clear conception of rights rises to life and power and leads him onward. Thus elevated a little at Freelands, the dreams called into being by that good man, Father Lawson, when in Baltimore, began to visit me again. Shoots from the tree of liberty began to put forth buds, and dim hopes of the future began to dawn. I found myself in congenial society. There were Henry Harris, John Harris, Handy Caldwell, and Sandy Jenkins, this last of the root preventive memory. Henry and John Harris were brothers, and belonged to Mr. Freeland. They were both remarkably bright and intelligent, though neither of them could read. Now for the mischief. I began to address my companions on the subject of education and the advantages of intelligence over ignorance, and as far as I dared, I tried to show the agency of ignorance in keeping men in slavery. Webster's spelling book and the Columbian orator were looked into again. As summer came on, and the long Sabbath days stretched themselves over our idleness, I became uneasy and wanted a Sabbath school in which to exercise my gifts and to impart to my brother slaves the little knowledge I possessed. A house was hardly necessary in the summertime. I could hold my school under the shade of an old oak tree as well as anywhere else. The thing was to get the scholars and to have them thoroughly imbued with the idea to learn. 
Two such boys were quickly found in Henry and John, and from them the contagion spread. I was not long in bringing around me twenty or thirty young men, who enrolled themselves gladly in my Sabbath school, and were willing to meet me regularly under the trees or elsewhere, for the purpose of learning to read. It was surprising with what ease they provided themselves with spelling books. These were mostly the cast-off books of their young masters or mistresses. I taught at first on our own farm. All were impressed with the necessity of keeping the matter as private as possible, for the fate of the St. Michael's attempt was still fresh in the minds of all. Our pious masters at St. Michael's must not know that a few of their dusky brothers were learning to read the word of God, lest they should come down upon us with the lash and chain. We might have met to drink whiskey, to wrestle, fight, and do other unseemly things, with no fear of interruption from the saints or the sinners of St. Michael's. But to meet for the purpose of improving the mind and heart by learning to read the sacred scriptures was a nuisance to be instantly stopped. The slaveholders there, like slaveholders elsewhere, preferred to see the slaves engaged in degrading sports rather than acting like moral and accountable beings. Had any one, at that time, asked a religious white man in St. Michael's the names of three men in that town whose lives were most after the pattern of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, the reply would have been Garrison West, class leader, White Fairbanks, and Thomas Auld, both also class leaders. And yet these men, armed with mob-like missiles, ferociously rushed in upon my Sabbath school and forbade our meeting again on pain of having our backs subjected to the bloody lash. This same Garrison West was my class leader, and I had thought him a Christian until he took part in breaking up my school. He led me no more after that. The plea for this outrage was then, as it is always, the tyrant's plea of necessity. If the slaves learned to read, they would learn something more and something worse. The peace of slavery would be disturbed. Slave rule would be endangered. I do not dispute the soundness of the reasoning. If slavery were right, Sabbath schools for teaching slaves to read were wrong and ought to have been put down. These Christian class leaders were, to this extent, consistent. They had settled the question that slavery was right, and by that standard they determined that Sabbath schools were wrong. To be sure, they were Protestants, and held to the great Protestant right of every man to search the Scriptures for himself. But then, to all general rules, there are exceptions. How convenient! What crimes may not be committed under such ruling? But my dear class-leading Methodist brethren did not condescend to give me a reason for breaking up the school at St. Michael's. They had determined its destruction, and that was enough. After getting the school nicely started a second time, holding it in the woods behind the barn and in the shade of trees, I succeeded in inducing a free colored man who lived several miles from our house to permit me to hold my school in a room at his house. He incurred much peril in doing so, for the assemblage was an unlawful one. I had at one time more than forty pupils, all of the right sort, and many of them succeeding in learning to read. I have had various employments during my life, but to none do I look back with more satisfaction than to this one. An attachment, deep and permanent, sprang up between me and my persecuted pupils, which made my parting from them intensely painful. Besides my Sunday school, I devoted three evenings a week to my other fellow slaves during the winter. Those dear souls who came to my Sabbath school came not because it was popular or reputable to do so for they came with a liability of having forty stripes laid on their naked backs. In this Christian country, men and women were obliged to hide in barns and woods and trees from professing Christians in order to learn to read the Holy Bible. Their minds had been cramped and starved by their cruel masters. The light of education had been completely excluded, and their hard earnings had been taken to educate their master's children. I felt a delight in circumventing the tyrants and in blessing the victims of their curses. To outward seeming, the year at Mr. Freeland's passed off very smoothly. Not a blow was given me during the whole year. To the credit of Mr. Freeland, irreligious though he was, it must be stated that he was the best master I ever had until I became my own master 
and assumed for myself, as I had a right to do, the responsibility of my own existence and the exercise of my own powers. For much of the happiness or absence of misery with which I passed this year, I am indebted to the genial temper and ardent friendship of my brother slaves. They were every one of them manly, generous, and brave. Yes, I say they were brave, and I will add fine-looking. It is seldom the lot of any one to have truer and better friends than were the slaves on this farm. It was not uncommon to charge slaves with great treachery toward each other, but I must say I never loved, esteemed, or confided in men more than I did in these. They were as true as steel, and no band of brothers could be more loving. There were no mean advantages taken of each other, no tattling, no giving each other bad names to Mr. Freeland, and no elevating one at the expense of the other. We never undertook anything of any importance which was likely to affect each other, without mutual consultation. We were generally a unit, and moved together. Thoughts and sentiments were exchanged between us which might well have been considered incendiary had they been known by our masters. The slaveholder, were he kind or cruel, was a slaveholder still, the every hour violator of the just and inalienable rights of man, and he was therefore every hour silently but surely wetting the knife of vengeance for his own throat. He never lisped a syllable in commendation of the fathers of this republic without inviting the sword and asserting the right of rebellion for his own slaves. End of chapter 18 
Part 2, Chapter 1 of Life and Times of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2, Chapter 1, Escape from Slavery, Part 2. In the first narrative of my experience in slavery, written nearly forty years ago, and in various writings since, I have given the public what I considered very good reasons for withholding the manner of my escape. In substance, these reasons were, first, that such publication at any time during the existence of slavery might be used by the master against the slave, and prevent the future escape of any who might adopt the same means that I did. The second reason was, if possible, still more binding to silence, for publication of details would certainly have put in peril the persons and property of those who assisted. Murder itself was not more sternly and certainly punished in the state of Maryland than was the aiding and abetting the escape of a slave. Many colored men, for no other crime than that of giving aid to a fugitive slave, have, like Charles T. Torrey, perished in prison. The abolition of slavery in my native state, and throughout the country, and the lapse of time, render the caution hitherto observed no longer necessary. But even since the abolition of slavery, I have sometimes thought it well enough to baffle curiosity by saying that while slavery existed, there were good reasons for not telling the manner of my escape, and since slavery had ceased to exist, there was no reason for telling it. I shall now, however, cease to avail myself of this formula, and, as far as I can, endeavor to satisfy this very natural curiosity. I should perhaps have yielded to that feeling sooner, had there been anything very heroic or thrilling in the incidents connected with my escape, for I am sorry to say I have nothing of that sort to tell. And yet the courage that could risk betrayal, and the bravery which was ready to encounter death if need be, in pursuit of freedom, were essential features in the undertaking. My success was due to address rather than to courage, to good luck rather than to bravery. My means of escape were provided for me by the very men who were making laws to hold and bind me more securely in slavery. It was the custom in the state of Maryland to require of the free colored people to have what were called free papers. This instrument they were required to renew very often, and by charging a fee for this writing, considerable sums from time to time were collected by the state. In these papers, the name, age, color, height, and form of the free man were described, together with any scars or other marks upon his person which could assist in his identification. This device of slaveholding ingenuity, like other devices of wickedness, in some measure defeated itself, since more than one man could be found to answer the same general description. Hence, many slaves could escape by personating the owner of one set of papers, and this was often done as follows. A slave nearly or sufficiently answering the description set forth in the papers would borrow or hire them till he could by their means escape to a free state, and then, by mail or otherwise, return them to the owner. The operation was a hazardous one, for the lender as well as for the borrower. A failure on the part of the fugitive to send back the papers would imperil his benefactor, and the discovery of the papers in possession of the wrong man would imperil both the fugitive and his friend. It was, therefore, an act of supreme trust on the part of a free man of color thus to put in jeopardy his own liberty that another might be free. It was, however, not unfrequently bravely done, and was seldom discovered. I was not so fortunate as to sufficiently resemble any of my free acquaintances as to answer the description of their papers, but I had one friend, a sailor, who owned a sailor's protection, which answered somewhat the purpose of free papers, describing his person and certifying to the fact that he was a free American sailor. The instrument had at its head the American Eagle, which at once gave it the appearance of an authorized document. This protection did not, when in my hands, describe its bearer very accurately. Indeed, it called for a man much darker than myself, and close examination of it would have caused my arrest at the start. In order to avoid this fatal scrutiny on the part of the railroad official, I had arranged with Isaac Rolls, a hackman, to bring my baggage to the train just on the moment of starting, and jumped upon the car myself when the train was already in motion. 
Had I gone into the station and offered to purchase a ticket, I should have been instantly and carefully examined, and undoubtedly arrested. In choosing this plan upon which to act, I considered the jostle of the train and the natural haste of the conductor in a train crowded with passengers, and relied upon my skill and address in playing the sailor, as described in my protection, to do the rest. One element in my favor was the kind feeling which prevailed in Baltimore and other seaports at the time towards those who go down to the sea in ships. Free trade and sailors' rights expressed the sentiment of the country just then. In my clothing I was rigged out in sailor style. I had on a red shirt and a tarpaulin hat and black cravat, tied in sailor fashion, carelessly and loosely about my neck. My knowledge of ships and sailor's talk came much to my assistance, for I knew a ship from stem to stern, and from keelson to cross trees, and could talk sailor like an old salt. On sped the train, and I was well on the way to Havre de Grace, before the conductor came into the negro car to collect tickets and examine the papers of his black passengers. This was a critical moment in the drama. My whole future depended upon the decision of this conductor. Agitated I was while the ceremony was proceeding, but still, externally at least, I was apparently calm and self-possessed. He went on with his duty, examining several colored passengers before reaching me. He was somewhat harsh in tone and peremptory in manner until he reached me, when, strangely enough, and to my surprise and relief, his whole manner changed. Seeing that I did not readily produce my free papers, as the other colored persons in the car had done, he said to me, in a friendly contrast with that observed towards the others, I suppose you have your free papers? To which I answered, No, sir, I never carry my free papers to sea with me. But you have something to show that you are a free man, have you not? Yes, sir, I answered. I have a paper with the American Eagle on it that will carry me round the world. With this I drew from my deep sailor's pocket my seaman's protection, as before described. The merest glance at the paper satisfied him, and he took my fare and went on about his business. This moment of time was one of the most anxious I ever experienced. Had the conductor looked closely at the paper, he could not have failed to discover that it called for a very different-looking person from myself and in that case it would have been his duty to arrest me on the instant and send me back to Baltimore from the first station. When he left me with the assurance that I was all right, though much relieved, I realized that I was still in great danger. I was still in Maryland, and subject to arrest at any moment. I saw on the train several persons who would have known me in any other clothes, and I feared they might recognize me, even in my sailor rig, and report me to the conductor, who would then subject me to a closer examination, which I knew well would be fatal to me. Though I was not a murderer fleeing from justice, I felt perhaps quite as miserable as such a criminal. The train was moving at a very high rate of speed for that time of railroad travel, but to my anxious mind it was moving far too slowly. Minutes were hours and hours were days during this part of my flight. After Maryland I was to pass through Delaware, another slave state, where slave catchers generally awaited their prey, for it was not in the interior of the state, but on its borders, that these human hounds were most vigilant and active. The border lines between slavery and freedom were the dangerous ones for the fugitives. The heart of no fox or deer, with hungry hounds on his trail, in full chase, could have beaten more anxiously or noisily than did mine from the time I left Baltimore till I reached Philadelphia. The passage of the Susquehanna River at Havre de Grace was at that time made by ferry boat, on board of which I met a young colored man by the name of Nichols, who came very near betraying me. He was a hand on the boat, but instead of minding his business, he insisted upon knowing me, and asking me dangerous questions as to where I was going, and when I was coming back, etc. I got away from my old and inconvenient acquaintance as soon as I could decently do so, and went to another part of the boat. Once across the river I encountered a new danger. Only a few days before I had been at work on a revenue cutter in Mr. Price's shipyard, under the care of Captain McGowan. On the meeting at this point of the two trains, the one going south stopped on the track just opposite to the one going north, 
and it so happened that this Captain McGowan sat at a window where he could see me very distinctly, and would certainly have recognized me had he looked at me but for a second. Fortunately, in the hurry of the moment, he did not see me, and the trains soon passed each other on their respective ways. But this was not the only hairbreadth escape. A German blacksmith, whom I knew well, was on the train with me, and looked at me very intently, as if he thought he had seen me somewhere before in his travels. I really believe he knew me, but had no heart to betray me. At any rate, he saw me escaping and held his peace. The last point of imminent danger and the one I dreaded most, was Wilmington. Here we left the train and took the steamboat for Philadelphia. In making the change I again apprehended arrest, but no one disturbed me, and I was soon on the broad and beautiful Delaware, speeding away to the Quaker City. On reaching Philadelphia in the afternoon, I inquired of a colored man how I could get on to New York. He directed me to the Willow Street Depot, and thither I went, taking the train that night. I reached New York Tuesday morning, having completed the journey in less than twenty-four hours. Such is briefly the manner of my escape from slavery, and the end of my experience as a slave. Other chapters will tell the story of my life as a free man. End of Part 2 Chapter 1